Belinda presents this unabridged recording of Black Mountain, written by Greg Beck and read by Sean Mangan. The dedication reads, to those wild, imaginative, and dedicated cryptozoologists. Just like you, I truly believe some legends are real. Prologue. Southern Appalachians, 11,000 BCE. The creature screamed as the arrow punched into its neck. Ripping it free, it turned to roar in frustration. The wound was deep and bled heavily, but the sticky blood quickly froze on its coarse, blunt fingers. The small ones were coming fast, sending more of their arrows flying through the air. The creature roared again, wanting to rush back and fight, to crush those small, loud man-things down to nothing. But that would mean its own death, and then the end of all of them. There were now barely forty members of the group remaining, and some with young, they would be slaughtered. The leader snorted and drew its clan higher, moving quickly now. When it looked back briefly, the man-things were a crawling multitude that whooped and ran and hurled their sharp sticks. The time for peaceful coexistence had long since passed. The creature looked to the sky, cold, iron-gray with heavy cloud down to the peak. Then it grunted, calling the group. There was one place they could go, where they could defend themselves and save their young. The deep, wintering cave that they used for hibernation when the season was unusually long and cold. Down there, deep inside the mountain, where the lichens glowed green and things slid and wormed their way in the darkness, there was safety. Deeper still there was a black river, with pale, sightless things swimming within it. Food. The leader urged the group to greater speed, forcing them on, higher up the mountain, along the old pathways, steep and narrow tracks on the cliff edge, that fell away to a depth so great its bottom was invisible in the heavy mist. Up, up, and into the cave, through the small and narrow opening, into the inner world of the mountain. There was no way out, but they could wait. If the man-things followed them in, then they would have to fight. They'd done it before. The small ones wanted their heads as trophies. If they came into the mountain, then their heads would be taken. Deep in the dark they waited, the large adult bodies pressed to the front, the young behind, all breathing heavily, fear sharp and acrid in the air around them. And then the man-things came, but just to the mouth of the cave, throwing fire inside. The great beasts waited still, but instead of an attack, there came a scraping, grinding, and pounding noise over and over. Then, to the creature's horror, the light from outside began to diminish. A mighty wall rose up before them, stone by stone. The adults screamed in rage and surged forward, but were answered with more fire and stinging arrows. They fell back, pounding the ground, their rage loud but impotent, as large interlocking blocks continued to be piled and fixed in place until the last square of light was blotted out. Still the sounds continued as many more layers were added. Finally there was silence, save for the heavy breaths of the creatures themselves. The leader shuffled forward and rested a large and bloody hand against the stone. It could sense the many thick layers and doubted they could break through. It also sensed the man-things on the other side, waiting for them to try. It turned back to its clan, a decision forming in its mind. There was food, and there would be weak light from the lichens in the deeper caves below. They could survive. 
they would wait, and eventually their world would be given back to them. They had walked its surface before the man-things had arrived, and they would walk it again. Chapter 1 Kowloon, Hong Kong, 1935 Charles Albert Schroeder paused at the bustling intersection. He knew the main streets were too easily picked over, and so it was down the secretive side alleys that he had navigated this day. Being a head taller than the milling crowd, he should be able to spot the type of shop he was searching for without too much trouble. There, the double Chinese symbols for medicine hung from a shingle out the front of a dark, cramped space that emanated the mixed odors of a thousand exotic herbs, fungi, and dried animal carcasses. Schroeder watched the doorway for a while. The clientele were a mix of older men, presumably seeking remedies for ailing potency, or young women looking for an elixir to turn a rich man's head. Each left with a small package wrapped in rice paper and stamped with the shop owner's symbol. Schroeder ducked his head as he stepped inside and blinked a few times to try to adjust his eyes to the gloom of the interior. An ancient Chinese man stood behind a counter, staring at him with a roomy gaze and resting a pair of reptilian hands on the countertop. Behind him the wall was completely covered in wooden slots, holding powder-filled jars or tiny drawers that were undoubtedly filled with exotic wares. Schroeder quickly looked left and right, making sure he was alone with the man. The only other gaze he detected belonged to the milky eyes of a monkey's head suspended in a jar of yellow fluid. Schroeder nodded. He didn't need to look around the shop any further. What he searched for was never on display. He cleared his throat. He didn't know much of the language, but had taken pains to memorize a few phrases. His greeting was delivered with a bow, and on receiving a small nod in return, he was encouraged to continue. Ni yo long de yachi? The man didn't move, perhaps pretending not to understand. Schroeder repeated the sentence, confident his words and pronunciation were correct. Still nothing more than the flat gaze in return. He lifted his billfold from his breast pocket and slowly removed a single note and placed it on the counter. He bowed and tried again. Ni you long de yachi? The man's eyes flicked down briefly to look at the purple and yellow bill. After a few seconds he nodded and disappeared behind a string curtain, emerging with a wooden tray covered in a soft cloth. He laid it down on the counter and pulled back two-thirds of the material. He waved his small wrinkled hand over the tray's contents and said in a surprisingly deep voice, Long de Yachi. Schroeder smiled flatly. His eyes quickly sorted through the tray's contents, mentally cataloging the species that the pieces had come from. Cave bear, giant deer, a boar the size of a rhinoceros. All excellent fossils, but nothing of real interest to him. He went to push back the cloth that still covered a portion of the tray, but the shopkeeper made a sharp noise in his throat and held his hand up. With the other hand, he pushed the single bill back across the table. His meaning was clear. The covered side of the tray was more expensive. Schroeder knew the real thing would be. What he sought was unique and rarely placed in the hands of unappreciative foreigners. He bowed again and pulled another two bills from his wallet and laid them on the pile. He made a flat gesture indicating that was all he was going to pay. The shopkeeper's eyes narrowed briefly. 
Then, with a flourish that would have impressed a stage conjurer, he lifted the cloth to reveal several more specimens. Schroeder felt his heart thump in his chest. It wouldn't have mattered if there were a hundred relics laid before him. His paleoanthropologist eyes were immediately drawn to just one. A canine tooth, broken at its base, but still easily four inches long from its root to curved tip. With a shaking hand, he held it up before him, the breath locked in his chest. Long de Yachi, Gao Pinti. The small man pointed one long fingernail at the specimen, obviously satisfied with Schroeder's response. Yes, yes, dragon's teeth. He used English without thinking as he brought the fossil close to his face, studying it, mentally calculating, estimating, extrapolating. In his mind, he turned the fragment of a long-dead creature into something living. He could see it in all its terrible glory. He held the relic above his head, standing on his toes to reach up above his six-foot-plus frame, adding another four feet to where the mouth would have been. He heard the shopkeeper's voice again. Long de Yachi! Guaiwu Long de Yachi! Schroeder exhaled and lowered his arm. Yes, best quality, but not a dragon. Something just as fantastic. He emptied his wallet onto the counter and leaned in toward the man. Zain Ali, he asked. Where? Present day. Alex was miles beneath the surface. He stared up at a shimmering mirage of blue light. He clamped his lips shut. Panic was a heartbeat away, and the more he tried to break free, the tighter he was trapped by the black coils of slimy rope that bound his arms and legs, wrapped around his chest and coated his face. He was aware his burning lungs would soon give out, but he dared not open his mouth even to scream, as he knew the mucus-covered strands would find their way inside. He was dragged deeper down, his feet sinking into the primordial ooze of the lightless depths. With his last fragments of energy, he sprang towards the surface. Last time, last chance. He needed to breathe. He wanted to live. Chapter 2 Southern Appalachians, North Carolina I'm cold. Amanda Jordan put her gloved fists under her arms and gave a little hop to cross yet another puddle of melting snow, trying to keep pace with the long legs of her new husband. The tiny pink metallic camera she had on a cord around her neck bounced against her parka as she skidded on some dark ice. Brad Jordan turned to walk backwards a few steps, the snow squeaking under the tough rubber soles of his new boots. He pulled a face and scoffed. Big baby. And it'll get colder further up. Then added quickly. But it'll be worth it, I promise. Amanda raised her eyebrows and tried to laugh, but just ended up coughing. She sucked in another stinging breath and exhaled, her breath steaming in the cold, dry air. She grimaced, even stretching her face hurt. When she dabbed her bottom lip with the back of one gloved hand, she saw a dot of red smeared on its waterproof coating. Damn, she thought, regretting not putting on some lip balm before they left. Some holiday, she thought grouchily. She felt terrible. Under her bulky clothing... Her armpits, back, and groin were sweating from the exertion of the climb, but the chilly thirty-degree air was stinging her nose, chin, and ears like they were being pricked by a hundred needles. She bet they were as red as beets. If that wasn't enough, she hadn't worn her ski cap. Brad liked her thick hair, and she'd wanted him to admire it in the sunlight. 
Now she didn't care what he thought. She just wanted a big hat she could pull down over her ears to keep them warm. Brad, can we at least stop for some coffee soon? He turned and stretched out his arms. Great idea. He looked around and spotted a flat rock just off the trail. Over there. Brad shrugged out of the large backpack and lowered it to the stone. He was a big man, six-two and broad across the back. Amanda often said he looked like a big, jug-eared Ben Affleck. He'd offered to carry everything on their way up and seemed to haul the weight with ease. He eased himself down and patted the rock beside him, then opened the backpack. Amanda sat down heavily and frowned. She pulled off one of her gloves and laid her bare hand on the stone. It's warm. Yep. Sun's directly overhead, and the stone only needs to catch a few rays to make it a degree or two warmer than the surroundings. Not much, but it feels kind of good, huh? He pulled the thermos free and pushed his hand back down into the depths of the backpack. Amanda pulled off her other glove, rolled over and hugged the stone, pressing her face to its warm surface. Bliss, she sighed. Brad lay down on his side next to her. How are the feet? We've already been trekking for half a day. Not bad for a city girl. Amanda rolled onto her back and put her hands behind her head. City slicker, huh? I'm from Greensboro, remember, not New York, and I've been hiking before. The feet are just fine. She sat up. Now where's that coffee I ordered, you big moose? He laughed as he handed her a cup of steaming liquid. I forgot. They breed them tough in the burrow. And you're a regular Calamity Jane, aren't you? She sipped the coffee and winced as the hot liquid touched her lip. Damn right I'm tough. So, Bill Bunyan, how much further? Brad pulled up his sleeve displaying a variety of dials strapped to his wrist. He consulted them, then nodded at the landscape. Notice the darker trees, the Fraser fir and red spruce crowns. We've been into them for quite a while. Altimeter says we're at 6120 feet. That's high. Peak's supposed to be 6327, but we're not going there. Way too easy. Amanda's lip curled in displeasure. Oh, really? Brad, I said I was tough, not stupid. I'm cold. How much further? Brad pulled a face back at her and leaned in close, as though worried about being overheard in the isolated wilderness. Did you read about the recent tremors and resulting landslips in the mountains? Well, I have it on good authority— that a slip's opened up a new path to the Black Dome, absolutely the highest point in the whole southern Appalachians. Think of it. We'll probably be the first people up there since the mid-1800s, and it's only a bit further than the lookout peak. Amanda groaned, refusing to be infected by his enthusiasm. So, how much further? He shrugged and turned away to pour himself some coffee, saying something Amanda couldn't make out. What? I didn't hear you. Come on, Brad, how much higher do we need to go? He turned back to her, his cheeks slightly red. Eight hundred feet. He lifted his mug in a salute. Maybe one more hour, Max, I promise. Amanda lay back down on the rock. God, where's the ski lift? You are so rubbing my feet tonight, Bradley Henry Jordan. He tipped out the dregs of his coffee and lay down next to her. I'd have done that anyway. I'll rub everything. Promise. Besides, on the way back, it's all downhill. Easy. She laughed. Putty in his hands.
she thought, and sighed, knowing she'd just agreed to the extra trek. So how do we get to this black dome? And more importantly, is it safe? Brad rummaged around in his back pocket and pulled out a folded piece of paper. He opened it on the rock next to her and traced some lines with his finger. Here's where I reckon we are, and this is where we'd normally be able to get access to. The paper showed a rough sketch of the mountain peaks, with a trail winding up the east face. It then changed to a dotted line marked with zigzags for rockfalls, and an underlined notation that said New Pathway. Amanda noticed some groupings of small red crosses near the mountain's crest. What do these mean? Nothing important. Well, what? Soda machines? Phone booths? Brad cleared his throat. Probably points of interest? Lookouts, maybe? He shrugged. Not sure. It's not my map. Amanda sat up straight and stared at him for several seconds. He kept his gaze on the map, refusing to look at her even though he must have felt the intensity of her gaze. Eventually he turned to her with his usual infectious grin. His thumb and forefinger held up less than an inch apart. This far. That's all. She nodded slowly, still not convinced he was telling her everything. Still, one more hour can't hurt, she thought, and tossed him her empty cup. Brad watched Amanda smack a low branch out of the way as she set off. Even in the bulky cold weather gear, her tight little figure was visible beneath all the layers. He smiled as he watched for a moment longer, then rolled up his sleeve to check his altimeter and compass again. The dials were illuminated due to the poor light. He looked up and frowned. The sun hadn't reappeared, and the low cloud was darker than he would have liked. If it snowed or got any colder, Amanda would kill him. The trek was turning out to be miles longer than he'd expected, and now he was thinking that they'd be trekking back in the dark for sure. He chewed his lip. If the advice he'd been given was right... It should be less than an hour now to the landslip that had created a shortcut to the top of the Black Dome. Maybe he should lift the pace a bit. He hoisted the pack a little higher on his back and adjusted his belt. As he did, the gun he was carrying dug into his gut. The red crosses on the map indicated bear sightings. Seemed the large animals were on the move early this season. On the move away from where we're going, he thought, which is good. He'd heard that even the wolves had been coming down off the mountain. Even better. Still, it was better to have a gun and not need it, than to need it and not have it. They looked at the landslip. Tons of rock and soil that had been shaken free from the side of the mountain and had settled to create an uneven path up the once inaccessible rock face. Normally this was the spot where hikers gave up and professional climbers took over, but now, even to Amanda, it looked, well, possible. Brad had picked up a stick about four feet long and was pointing it at a few places along the slip. We just need to ease across that small gap at the start, then drop down onto the path and stay close to the cliff face. It'll be a piece of cake. He leaned in against the stone and hopped across the gap, then turned to her and held out the stick for her to grab onto and follow. As Amanda leaped across, she noticed that the newly exposed rock was clean, the stark browns and grey of the nice and schist, probably only laid open to the elements within the last few weeks. A fanciful thought crossed her mind. It looked painful, like a wound cut through to the bone. Amanda kept hold of the stick and used it as a walking staff. 
As she moved along the dry wall of stone, she observed crevices and holes in the rock face, exposed by the loss of surface soil and debris. Some of them looked deep, and she bent down to peer into one. Even though she put her hands on either side of her face and squinted, it didn't do any good. There was nothing to see but inky blackness. She wrinkled her nose. Phew! Smells like something died or pooped in there. Brad looked back at her. Maybe a falcon. They like to nest in rock faces. Come on, keep up. Amanda turned to look out from the mountainside. At over 6,000 feet, and without the trees to block the view, it was spectacular. True to the name, the mountain looked almost black in the fading light. Low cloud vapor was snaking through the hollows and around the treetops, giving the whole place a primordial atmosphere. She lifted the camera from around her neck and opened the zoom. It buzzed and clicked as it took the snap, then tidied itself away. It was almost magical to be able to look down on the other mountains from this height. She leaned out towards the edge of the slip. It was a long way down, at least a thousand foot drop, before the slope became a little gentler and tree-covered again. Hello! she called. The word stretched out and she waited, but no echo came back to her. She sucked in a huge breath, preparing for an even bigger shout, when Brad swung around, pulling a pained face. As he put his finger to his lips, a rock the size of a mailbox thumped into the dirt between them. They looked at each other with wide eyes and waited. Amanda drew her shoulders up and gritted her teeth. She'd forgotten they were in a slip zone. Brad came back to her. It's pretty stable, he whispered, but there could be loose debris that may fall. Best not to bust out with any more karaoke right now, okay? She nodded and went to step over the stone that had fallen. She frowned, tapped it with her stick, then squatted. Odd. It doesn't look like a raw boulder. The stone seemed to have been shaped, squared, like a large cinder block, she thought. She brushed it with her hand, and noticed the symbols carved into it. Hey, look at this, she called. Brad kneeled beside her and pulled the stone out of its slush and dirt crater. He turned it over. The symbols were on all four sides. Old. Looks Native American. A figure behind two arrows, one pointing left, the other right. Makes sense. The Black Dome was actually called Atacula, after a Cherokee Indian chief, long before we pale faces renamed it. Amanda brushed more soil out of the carving. Is that a man? Nah, I don't think so. Arms are too long. Looks sort of deformed, though. See all those other little marks carved into it? Might be symbols or just where the stone was cut. Amanda sat back on her haunches. Well, it's very cool. We should take it back with us. Brad looked at her with half-lidded eyes. My little angel, I know who you mean when you say we... This piece of stone probably weighs about forty pounds. I'll end up a hunchback if I try lugging it down over six thousand feet of mountain. But it's all downhill on the way back, remember? Like you said, it'll be easy. Besides, I have the perfect place for it beside the fireplace. Brad groaned. Let's leave it for now and have another look on the way back, okay? Good idea. I'm sure it'll be lighter then. She patted his shoulder, then used it to get to her feet. She looked up at the sheer rock wall above them. Wonder where it came from. 
It looks like a giant house brick. Brad scanned the rock wall where it had been scoured by the slippage. There. He pointed to an area half hidden by a small ledge and a tangle of fallen bushes. He squinted. Looks like more of them up there. Amanda followed his directions about thirty feet straight up and saw the other stones, dozens of them, stacked one on top of the other, bricking in a natural cavity in the rock wall that had been exposed by the earth sliding away. It was roughly triangular-shaped and about nine feet in height. She could see a small dark hole near the top where the fallen stone had come from. She stepped back, closer to the edge of the path, to get a better look. The cave's been sealed off. Did the Native Americans build walls like that? I thought they only made stone burial mounds. Sure they did. Different tribes built walls for everything from agriculture to defense. In fact, I read archaeologists just found an ancient Indian wall submerged beneath the Hudson River, running nine hundred feet end to end. Brad stepped back as well. Maybe this was a grain store they needed to hide. Around here, the Catawba and Cherokee were always at war with someone. Pretty secure grain store, if you ask me. Maybe it was a prison. You know how the legends go. Mess with the chief's daughter, get entombed, problem solved. She had another thought. Hey, could be hidden treasure, maybe. You think? Brad rolled his eyes. They were Indians, not pirates, Amanda. The ancient tribes never valued gold or jewels. Land, good hunting, and honor. These were the things they treasured. Can't seal them up, can you? Guess not. Amanda stepped back again, craning her neck to see the stones better. The ground shifted under her feet as the lip of the ledge started to move, she felt herself sliding towards the abyss and pinwheeled her arms, trying to regain her balance. Brad grabbed her by the front of her parka and pulled her roughly forward. Stop playing around, will you? Anyway, we've seen all we can from here. Let's go on up to the dome, and we can report the wall to the ranger when we get back. Amanda looked back at the edge of the path and shook her head, trying to clear the image of that long fall to the forest below. She started walking, her legs feeling wobbly, then turned back briefly. Okay, we report it. But only after we've got that stone safely in the trunk of my car. Just one second. Buzz, click. Buzz, click. Two more photos for her album. By the time Brad had hauled Amanda up onto an outcrop of rock and declared they were as high as they could go, the occasional speck of sleet had turned to real snow. There was a wind chill that cut through their clothing and made their lips so numb it was hard to talk. We might be the first people to have stood here for nearly 150 years, Brad said through gritted teeth. Amanda tried to give him her best appreciative smile. She was standing as close as possible to his huge frame, so he acted as a windbreak. As far as she was concerned, and kept telling him, the view had been just as good from the side of the mountain where the slip had been. She noticed his lips were turning blue, and he'd developed the hunched look of someone whose body temperature is rapidly falling. The snow either drifted down or whipped past them, depending on the gusts of wind, and she had to speak loudly to be heard. Let's go, baby. We've seen enough now. Brad stared into the wind for a few more seconds, then nodded and took her hand to help her down from the rocks. You're right. Time to go. I don't like the way the weather's closing in on us. There was no sightseeing on the way down. Away from the exposed black dome, there was more shelter 
so the needle-sharp cold wind with its haunted moaning was left behind. The falling snow suppressed any sounds around them, except for the squeal of crushed flakes under Brad's large feet as he moved them quickly along. Amanda had her hands firmly tucked up under her arms and only pulled them out to maintain her balance when they had to hop across logs, boulders, or particularly slippery-looking drifts. You hear that? Brad said, stopping and half-turning to her with a frown on his face. She almost bumped into him. On seeing his expression, she stopped to listen to the snow-dampened silence. She didn't hear anything. No. Wait. There. It was a thumping sound, like a fist striking a giant pillow. There was no rhythm or pattern to it. She slowly turned her head, trying to determine where the sound was coming from. What is it? she asked. Shit. Better not be another rockfall. Come on, let's hurry. We're nearly at the slip. I'll feel better once we're back across it. God damn it, Brad, I am not staying on this mountain tonight. I warn you, you'll be in big trouble if you've gone and gotten us stuck. Brad just frowned before setting off again. He looks worried, she thought. She didn't know why she was blaming him. After all, she liked to hike, and it wasn't as if he'd made it snow or caused the slip to drop more debris. She just felt like venting, and probably would again before they got back down. It didn't take them long to get to the slip, now white with fresh snow. Its surface looked like a powdery moonscape, complete with meteor-strike craters. Brad hung onto a tree, not yet ready to step out. He leaned out and craned his neck to look upwards. Amanda grabbed a handful of his parka and tried to lean out, too. What is it? she whispered. Has there been another landslide? Brad kept his eyes on the track. I think yes and no. That old Indian wall up on the rock face, it looks like it's finally crumbled. I think that's what's causing the pits in the snow. Is it safe to cross? Brad hesitated. I guess so. Doesn't look as though there are many stones left to fall. Besides, there's no choice if you want to sleep in a bed tonight. He still hadn't moved, just kept looking from the path to the cliff face and back again. Finally, he turned to her. Just a little over a hundred feet. Stay close to the wall and to me. But he still didn't move. What's wrong? You're scaring me, Brad. Nothing. Just a funny smell. Reminds me of when we were kids and Scotty found a dead bird and rolled in it. Sort of a rotten, wet animal hair, shitty smell. Took us two baths before we got the smell out of his fur. Hey, that's what I smelled in that little hole before. Maybe it's that dead falcon again. Remember you said that? Yeah, yeah, I do. Stay close. Brad stepped out, his foot sinking into the snow to his ankles. He kept one arm up towards the rock face, not touching it, just monitoring where he was in relation to the wall and the sheer drop to the slopes below. Amanda could understand his tentativeness. The late afternoon, combined with a heavy cloud, was creating an early twilight on the mountain. Snow was starting to fall again, making the edge of the cliff path hard to see. The whitening air around them, white sky and a white pathway. All definition was disappearing, making it too easy to step off into limbo. She hung on to the back of Brad's jacket and tried to test the path with her small staff, but nearly tripped several times as she was pulled along at a speed that better suited his long legs 
than her shorter ones. Out on the slip path, the lack of trees meant the wind chill was severe again, and the earlier silence was broken by the wind's shriek and moans. She flinched when Brad stopped dead. He spun around and stood like a statue, his eyes wide and his face frozen as he stared along the bleak pathway. She put her hand on his arm and felt his large bicep shivering under his parka. She hoped it was just from the cold, but deep in the pit of her stomach she knew it was something more. As he gently pushed her behind him, she realized her legs were shaking so hard she could actually feel her knees knocking together. It hurt. Please, Brad, let's go. Her stomach was fluttering in a tingly, upsetting way. She craned her neck and looked up at his face, hoping to see that big, dumb grin splitting his handsome, square jaw in an I gotcha sort of way. She'd be real angry for a while, sure, but then real relieved. But he wasn't smiling. Instead, he looked pale and scared. Amanda saw his hand go to his waist and lift his parka. There was a gun tucked in behind his belt. Anger flared inside her then, at his secrecy, at bringing a dangerous weapon. And then, just as quickly, the emotion disappeared. Thank God he did. He pulled the revolver free, shiny black metal against the white surroundings. As she stared at it, she saw snowflakes melting on the short barrel. The heat from his body was still radiating from within the steel. She was about to speak when he raised the gun slowly to aim down the path. She followed its grim pointer and made out a shape in the swirling snow, roughly man-shaped, but impossibly huge. Is it a bear? Her voice sounded ridiculously small. Back up, Brad said. She was pressed up behind him, looking at the shape from under his arm. She lifted her camera on the cord around her neck. Buzz, click. Brad stepped back just as she took the photo and tripped over her crouched body, falling backwards on top of her. The gun went off and she screamed. In a flash, Brad was on his feet, the gun pointed back at the shape. But the slip path was empty. Shit! Did I hit it? Was it a bear? she asked. It looked like a big, deformed bear. I don't know. Must have been. I've heard black bears can get pretty big. Eight hundred pounds and seven feet tall on their hind legs. It was a lot bigger than that. But it had to be a bear. Had to be. It seemed to be waiting for us. But I can't see it anymore. Do you think it's gone? Amanda had both hands on her stick, holding it out in front of herself, like Gandalf at Helm's Deep. I think the gunfire scared it off. I might have even winged it. We're just lucky we didn't set off any more landslides. Come on, we better get off the path. Brad looked over his shoulder briefly, then down at Amanda. Take my hand and hang on tight. We need to move quickly. Brad leaped off the path back into the forest, literally dragging Amanda through the air with him. Being out of the landslide zone should have made him feel more secure, but the thick tree cover did the exact opposite. The wind was muffled, and light snow swirled gently around the tree trunks. The thick cloud, combined with fast-approaching twilight, made the dense stands of spruce and fir trees even darker. Brad rushed them headlong down the mountain. Several times he stumbled on logs or loose rocks hidden beneath the snow, and knew that come tomorrow his ankles would be painful and swollen. A cheap price to pay, he thought, if it gets us off the mountain safely. 
Amanda fell and reached out to a slim tree trunk to save herself. She pulled her gloved hand away quickly when it stuck to something sticky and red. Brad saw it. Hey, I did hit it. Good, he thought, and cast his mind back to the shape on the slip path. He'd seen black bears around the Appalachians before, but what had stood in the center of that trail was no bear. He knew that even with the low visibility. It wasn't like anything he recognized. He could hear Amanda gasping and slowed his pace. He didn't want to stop, but he knew what she was experiencing. Even in an environment of frozen water, dehydration was a danger to both experienced and amateur hikers alike. He slid the pack off his shoulder so he could pull a water bottle free. Come on, sip slowly. You're doing great. Twigs snapped behind him. Both of them froze, paralyzed by the sound of movement behind the tree line. Their breath created small plumes around their faces before dissipating into the white landscape. A creaking beside them made Brad whirl with the gun. He found himself aiming it shakily at a tree that had become overburdened with snow. A huge mound slipped from a branch to fall harmlessly to the ground. He laughed nervously. I knew that was probably all it was. He looked down at Amanda, but her face was half hidden by the hand she held over her nose and lips. Brad had been breathing through his mouth to avoid taking the stinging air into his nostrils. But now he tested the air, and it wasn't the cold that assaulted his senses. It was back, that shitty, rank animal stench. God, no! Amanda buried her face into the side of his parka. What Brad had taken to be a tree trunk shifted on the darkening slope. The enormous hulking shape swayed slightly, a snow-covered colossus. Though it was partially obscured by the trees and falling snow, Brad could see that his first thought had been correct. The limbs were too long and the head too small for it to be a bear. It also looked to be well over ten feet tall. Even a full-grown male grizzly topped out at about seven or eight max. I love you, he said to Amanda. She nodded and said something back, but it was muffled by his parka. Brad didn't feel afraid anymore. His wife's frightened shivering brought forth in him a growing anger and a determination to protect her with his life. He leveled the gun at the creature's enormous barrel chest. This is going to hurt you more than it is me, buddy, I hope he thought. Without taking his eyes off the figure, he leaned down close to Amanda's ear. No matter what happens, if I say run, you run. Don't look back. I'll be right behind you, but don't stop until you get to the first trekking station, the one with the emergency call box. Tell the ranger. He stopped as a booming whoop caused the snow to fall from the tree branches around them. Brad flinched, then tried to swallow. His throat and mouth were bone dry. The thing thumped the ground with both arms, and Brad actually felt the enormous power of the movement through the soles of his feet. The whoop came again. Then the thing charged ten feet towards them and stopped. Brad took an involuntary step backwards, dragging Amanda with him. With one hand, he pulled her away from his body and shook her until she looked up at him. Her face was wet and her mouth was turned down in fear. He saw that her nose was running. You gotta go now, he said. Remember what I told you. Run and don't look back. He kissed her quickly and she tried to cling onto him. Don't look back, baby. I'll catch up. He pushed her hard. She seemed about to turn back towards him when the whoop came again, followed by deep grunting. She ran. 
the creature made to follow the small running figure, until Brad stepped towards it and fired three shots. Things happened quickly then. It charged at him faster than he'd expected. He fired again, but it was moving so fast he didn't know if he'd hit it. At twenty feet, it leaped. He didn't feel the impact. Everything just went black. As consciousness returned, he felt the pain in his body and knew things inside were broken and torn. The shitty, rank stench was all over him, in his nostrils and mouth, on his skin. He tried to open his eyes, but only one worked. He had the sensation of being carried and looked at the ground. He saw the corner of one of those stones Amanda had wanted, the opposite pointing arrows clear on its exposed surface. I need to bring that back for her, he thought crazily. The smell was overpowering and the pain exquisite as the creature adjusted its grip on him. It was climbing now, up towards the cave in the rock face. He watched with his one good eye as the light at the opening faded. The thing was dragging him into the mountain's depths. He hoped Amanda had made it. Chapter 3 Asheville, North Carolina And what's wrong with you today, mister? The trainer scratched his head as he watched the West African lion circle in its cage. Its golden hide covered five hundred pounds of rippling muscle, and the long fur on its head and at its neck framed a fearsome visage. Its ribs moved in and out as it panted heavily. It stopped its pacing to place its large snout against the bars and inhaled, snorting out a sneeze as though wanting to dislodge something unpleasant from its nostrils. It swung away, making a disagreeable growling sound deep in its chest. The trainer noticed it kept staring at a spot just over his shoulder. He turned. There was nothing there but mountain darkening in the fading sunlight. Settle down, Odin. It's just a big-ass old mountain. Come on, we've done this a hundred times. The trainer stood at the cage door with broom, mop, and bucket, and a shortened cattle prod under his arm. He knew the lion, and it knew him. Usually it ignored him, or at worst acted like a misbehaving teenager and swiped at the mop or knocked over his bucket. But today something was upsetting the creature, and no one wanted to get close to a giant lion when it was acting weird. Should I call the vet? You got an upset, boy? The lion lay down and fixed its golden eyes, sphinx-like, on the spot in the distance. It remained like that for many minutes, and the trainer finally shrugged. That's more like it. He put his cleaning tools down and reached for the slide lock on the door with one hand, while keeping hold of the cattle prod in the other, a foot-long batten with two exposed electrodes at the business end. He'd never used it. He and Odin were old friends, but still. The lock slid back, and he pulled the heavy metal gate open with a slight squeal, as he had done weekly over many years. He waited at the door for another few seconds, but the lion could have been stuffed and mounted for all the attention it gave him. Okay. He reached down for his bucket, just for a second. A maelstrom of fur and teeth flashed in his vision, and a roar exploded from mighty jaws. He fell backwards and threw his hands up over his head. Odin leaped over him and was gone. The lion shot through the circus like an express train, its golden mane rippling in the chilly afternoon's fading light. The trainer lay shivering on the ground, his hands up and crossed over his face. A warm, wet patch spread across his groin. 
Chief, it's Jason Van Hortensen again. Asheville's police chief, Bill Logan, groaned and rubbed his balding pate. He thought briefly about telling Shelley, his septuagenarian receptionist, to tell the man he wasn't in. Then he shook his head and held both hands open in surrender. It wouldn't do any good to ignore the call. The annoying man would call back on the hour every freaking hour. I'll take it, Shell. A light on his phone started to blink, and he picked up the handset in one large hand, depressing the lit button with his little finger on the way to his ear. Mr. Van Hortensen, how are you to... He pulled the phone away from his ear slightly as the man's voice blared over him. Van Hortensen was one of the new breed that had moved into the community in the last few years. Young, moneyed sorts, they'd been buying up the smaller farms in the area, spending a fortune on them, then stocking them with some of the best-looking, best-groomed animals in the region. Hobby farmers, the locals called them. They worked Monday to Friday in high-paying jobs on the coast, then spent their vacations on the farm. Presumably it gave them some sort of back-to-nature bragging rights. Chief Logan grimaced and breathed in evenly through his nose as he looked up at the Asheville Police Department shield on his wall. Integrity, fairness, respect. The guiding principles of the APD. He tried hard to remember what they meant every time Van Hortensen rang to blast him for the most minor of perceived infringements. This time he had some sympathy for the man. Seemed someone was stealing his expensive Lackenvelder milking cows. Pretty stupid, as the brilliantly black-and-white beasts were pretty rare in these parts. Also, given the man only had two dozen cows, a single animal going missing would be immediately noticed. I'm sorry to hear that, sir, Logan managed to cut in. Just to be clear, just the one animal taken again? I'll send a car around, but you might want to consider an aerial search, sir. No, I'm afraid you need to organize that. We just don't have the resources available right now. But, sir, my gut feel is these animals are wandering off. He pulled the phone away from his ear again and grinned. Shelley turned to mouth the word ouch to him. After another few seconds, he put the phone carefully back to his ear and hmm-hmmed a few times. Might be a good idea to house the cattle closer to town for a few days, Mr. Van Hortensen. Be cheaper than losing more head. Logan finished by promising to send a man up for another look-see, then hung up. He sat staring at the phone for a few minutes as his mind worked over the details. Three full-grown cattle gone over three nights. They weighed about a thousand pounds each. You couldn't exactly strap one to the hood of your car and speed through the town square. That's a hell of a lot of free steak, he said out loud. He turned to stare out the window. The weather was getting colder. He couldn't see the cattle wandering up into the Black Mountain, not when the snow was starting in earnest. Besides, the tree cover up there was too dense for grazing. So where are those big brutes going? he wondered. Hire, Daddy! The grin on five-year-old Emma Wilson's face threatened to split her cheeks as she kicked her skinny legs forward on the upswing and then tucked them back under the seat on the backswing. Last few times, Emma, honey, Clark Wilson said. It's getting cold and dark, and I need to rustle up some dinner for the both of us. Eggs? she called on the upswing. Nope, Clark replied as she came towards him on the backswing. Dogs and ketchup? No, last guess, he smiled. Um, eggs? Clark laughed. Mommy left us a nice big pie, but I'll do the extras. Yay, 
But no peas, Daddy. They're little balls of yuck. Okay, no peas. Last big swing. Just a bit longer, please. I can almost see the top of the mountain when I swing up really high, and I'm not cold at all. Clark turned to where his daughter was looking and half smiled. Sunsets on the mountain were magnificent this time of year. The summer heat was long gone. Autumn was just beginning to bite with a few light snows on the higher slopes, and the air at the foot of the mountain was as clean and clear as you could get anywhere on the continent. And she was right. It wasn't that cold. The evening was calm and quiet. It would have been perfect except for a damned funny smell. Must be another squirrel gone and died under the house. Why they kept doing that, he never knew. He looked back at his daughter. She looked so happy on the swing, in her favorite red sweater, pink rubber boots, and some big clip-on earrings she'd pestered Helen to buy her from the market. Blue glass beads finishing in tiny silver bells that tinkled like music. Emma said they reminded her of Christmas time. Clark shrugged. A few more minutes in this wonderful air wouldn't hurt, he reckoned. Okay, Emma Boo, but when I call, you come in, and no daredevil swings, all right? Never. But she kicked out hard, her little body almost going horizontal on the swing, the earrings jingling. Count up to ten five times. By then you'll be hungry, Clark told her. He jumped up onto the small porch and pulled open the swing door. He appeared at the kitchen window and opened the glass pane so Emma could hear him when he called. Then he started pulling utensils and pans from cupboards and lifted the pre-baked pie from the refrigerator. Mm-mm, he thought, and broke off some of the crust and popped it in his mouth, raising his eyebrows in delight. He checked the window. Emma swung back and forth in the repetition the very young enjoyed. He went back to his tasks, humming. The metronomic whine of the swing and the sound of Emma counting drifted in through the window. Life was good. Moving to Asheville was the best decision he and Helen had ever made. No traffic, no smog, no street aggro. And access to the Internet gave them the same size shop window as the big city boys at a hundredth of the cost. A no-brainer, really. He grabbed a handful of carrots and potatoes from the pantry and looked briefly at the bag of fresh peas. Little balls of yuck. He chuckled. He'd take them over Brussels sprouts any day. There was a small squeak and metallic pop from outside the window, and the sound of the swing stopped dead. Clark picked up the kitchen cloth to wipe his hands and stepped backwards to peer through the open window, expecting to see Emma skipping up towards the porch. A cold shock jolted through his body as he saw that the swing was gone. The seat, the chains, everything— and Emma was nowhere to be seen. He called her, still half expecting to hear her respond, or the slam of the screen door as she came into the house, but there was nothing. Clark threw the cloth down and leaned right out of the window. There was no sign of his child, just that smell, stronger than ever. He pulled his head in and raced to the back door, calling Emma's name, louder each time, Oh, no, 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 please, no! He raced into the yard. No trace. He sprinted around the outside of the house, then the inside, tears filling his eyes. He called her name again. Nothing. Outside, he yelled her name up at the Black Mountain. It remained mute. Chapter 4 Fort Detrick, Frederick, Maryland Medical Command Installation Alpha Soldier Research Unit Fuck it all to hell! 
Captain Robert Graham threw the clipboard across the room, making Marshall and several of the scientific assistants duck for cover. And clean that stinking mess out of there before the general decides to pay us a surprise visit. Graham turned back to the screen and hit a button that caused the glass cell's window to become opaque, so he could no longer see the screaming man raking the flesh from his blinded skull. Lieutenant Alan Marshall turned to the assistants who were still taking notes. Batch ARC-044, gross psychosis, physical manifestations of self-harm, significant display of strength and resistance to pain, Unfortunately, both turned against subjects' own selves. Captain Graham rested on his knuckles at a long bench, grinding his teeth. More than sixty dead, comatose, insane, or exploded test subjects, he said over his shoulder. At this churn rate, we'll end up with more soldiers in body bags than at fucking Pearl Harbor. He shook his head and pinched the bridge of his nose for a second, before staring down at his hands. They shook slightly. He slowly lifted his head to look along the remaining row of cell windows. Years, he thought darkly, his frustration at the constant failure festering inside him. Only one success, one enhanced soldier, after countless millions spent— and we weren't ready for him. It was an accident, an aberration, a one-in-a-million shot that was never expected to succeed. He snorted sourly. Blinded by the hubris of success, he had released the man back to duty, fully expecting that the results would be easily replicated, that the primary subject would be the first of thousands. But reality had kicked him in the teeth. Human biology is the same, and different. Identical twins brought up in different environments were subjected to a thousand differing variables that could significantly alter the direction of their physiology and psychology. Whatever Hammerson's soldier had had inside him to begin with had enabled the full absorption, fusion, and utilization of the Arcadian treatment. But what the fuck had it been? Years, he thought again, grinding his molars. He heard the sound of the pressurized dart gun in the shuttered room as the latest mutilated soul was brought down like a maddened rhino. The man's last days would be spent in an induced coma until a euthanasia order was approved. Then his brain would be dissected and whatever clues remained would be teased from the corrupted tissue. Even hours after the subjects had been terminated, their flesh was still hot to the touch. It was as if their bodies acted like overheating reactors, causing a total physiological meltdown. Their skin was covered in blistering sores, and their internal organs were little more than soup by the time he got to open them up. It was always the same, except for that one success. He cursed again, as he recalled how fucking Jack Hammerson had sent the man out into the mission meat grinder. He crushed his eyes shut, his knuckles turning white where they pressed onto the bench top. Graham knew that impatience was his enemy now. He leaned back and drew in a deep breath. It had taken Jonas Salk seven years to perfect his first polio vaccine, and the man had worked with 220,000 volunteers and 20,000 physicians. Opening his eyes, he looked again along the rows of test rooms. There were just three more cubicles to examine. He spoke with a deep feeling of lassitude. Is Batch 40 ready? the one where you introduce significant levels of cortisol directly into the brain prior to introduction of the Arcadian treatment. Marshall came and stood next to his superior officer, holding a clipboard in front of his chest like a shield. That's correct, sir. 
cortisol introduced into the cerebellum in the hypothalamus and thalamus junction. We figured that even though we'd already tried physically traumatizing the brain, maybe the actual destruction wasn't the key. Maybe it was only the chemical effects of the destruction. And as cortisol floods the brain following significant trauma... Graham nodded and sucked in a deep breath. He knew that his superiors wouldn't be patient forever, and without the original Arcadian subject to hand, they had to resort to a more heuristic approach, trial and error. Or rather, trial and fail, and fail, and fail again. Fuck that, Hammerson, for burning the only successful subject's body, he thought. Then he stood straighter, and pressed a button beside the next large window. The darkened glass immediately cleared. Graham's mouth dropped open. Oh, thank you, God! The young man in the cubicle sat on the edge of the bed, talking to one of the huge male nurses. Graham rushed to the next window and then the next. He smiled and lowered his head to shut his eyes for a moment, before glancing up again quickly, as if to make sure his tired brain wasn't playing tricks on him. A small blush of a rash on the men's cheeks. But they were fine, sane-looking, normal. He turned to Lieutenant Marshall, a glow of gratification on his face. Ready them for the next round of testing. Nez Tziona, Israel, the IIBR, Israel Institute for Biological Research, Deep Core Biohazard Containment Facility 2. General Meir Shavit wrinkled his nose at the sight before him. Dr. Moshe Weiss chuckled softly at the look on his face and turned back to the man on the bed. His body was coated head to foot in an oyster-colored, jelly-like substance that had also stained the pillow and sheets he lay upon. It was a ghastly sight. He is physically intact, but lapsing in and out of consciousness, Weiss told the general. Don't be too concerned by the way he looks. His body is still expelling the bacterial residue. Stinks like gasoline and old fish, doesn't it? We also found this when we did a full body scan. He held up a test tube with a small flesh-colored pellet inside. It's quite sophisticated miniaturized electronics. Tracking device, I'd say. Shavit's eyes narrowed. Weiss nodded. Seems someone wanted to keep an eye on him. We disabled it, of course. Shavit turned his attention back to the man on the bed. Turn it back on and have it dropped out into the center of the Negev. Weiss had no intention of heading out into the Negev desert himself. He opened his mouth to tell the general he needed to delegate the task to someone more appropriate, but the general's cold stare spoke of authority and a ruthlessness beyond anything Weiss could summon. Weiss swallowed the words he'd been about to say and simply nodded. He cleared his throat and read from his clipboard. This is the most interesting case I've ever worked on. The microorganism that infected him has a pathogenesis like nothing I've ever seen in my life. He motioned towards the form on the bed. This man should be dead a hundred times over but his extraordinary physiology and the compounds he was being treated with have made him a unique specimen. A unique and valuable specimen. Shavit lit a cigarette and blew smoke into the air, making Weiss wince at the breach of the laboratory's sterile conditions. Will he live? Weiss paused for a few seconds to consider the question. Yes. Shavit grunted. Good. Send me the file. General Shavit sat alone in his office. He drew deeply on his cigarette, let the smoke escape through tight lips, 
and tried hard to stifle the wet cough that squeezed up from lungs congested from decades of smoking. He lifted the folder on his desk and smiled grimly at the Hebrew characters on the cover. Project Golem. His little joke, or perhaps his wish. All Jews knew the legend of the Golem, an ancient mythological figure molded from the clay of the Voltava River by the holiest of rabbis, Judah Lo Ben Bezalel. The powerful man-like creature had defended the Jews in their time of need. Unfortunately, the story didn't have a happy ending. The creature that had at first been their savior had become increasingly violent, until the rabbi returned it to an inert state. A golem berserker. Maybe that is what we now have in our possession, Shavit thought, and his laugh deteriorated into a wheezy cough. He opened the folder to the report's latest pages and read silently for a few seconds, his brows knitted. Every report produced by the scientific team charged with investigating the American Special Forces soldier both astonished and frustrated him. Every time they learned a little more about Alex Hunter, known as the Arcadian subject, it turned out that they actually understood less. Colonel Jack Hammerson, commander of the secretive Hawks Division within the U.S. Special Forces, had worked with Mossad, Israel's intelligence and covert operations organization, to get Hunter out of the country before his own medical teams could claim the soldier's near lifeless body for experimentation and dissection. Hammerson had taken a huge gamble by handing Hunter over to a foreign power, both in terms of the man's life and his own career. Hammerson's own agency believed the Arcadian subject was now nothing more than powdered ash in the bottom of one of their powerful military furnaces. Yes, Hammerson had gambled, but so had Shavit. He had authorized his niece, a Mossad operative, to retrieve the man, even though his body was riddled with a disease that everyone thought would turn it to mush, and which could have devastated Shavit's entire country. But Shavit knew he had no choice. The possible rewards were too great to ignore. Hunter had been brought to the Israeli military's secure laboratory beneath the Negev desert, where Weiss's team had succeeded not only in eradicating the lethal microorganism, but also in reviving the man. Shavit felt he had won that round, but knew he was still in a race, to unlock the Arcadian secrets before the man self-destructed. And it was one he fully intended to win. The future of Israel depended on it. The Americans would eventually succeed in reproducing their experimental soldier, but although they were magnificent at creating outstanding advancements, they were terrible at hanging on to them. Within a few years, the Russians and Chinese would have stolen everything they needed to create their own Arcadian soldiers, and then their proxies across the Middle East would soon follow. The general flipped to the report's next page and started reading the section headed Cellular Repair and Revivification. Analysis of Captain Alex Hunter's DNA showed that the ends of his chromosomes, his telomeres, had stopped fraying. A side note from Weiss explained the significance of this to the layman. A telomere was a biological capstone, like the plastic tip on a shoelace, and its role was to stop the chromosome deteriorating or fraying. Most cells had an ability to divide about 50 times before they started to deteriorate and shorten, and therefore begin aging. Scientists could read the length of a cell's telomeres and provide an accurate picture of the cell's age and how many more times it would replicate. But Alex Hunter's DNA strands had ceased fraying. In fact, the telomere tips were almost totally intact. Weiss hypothesized that this could be why the man had such enormous potential for rapid cellular repair. 
It also meant that Alex Hunter might stop aging, or at the other extreme, his entire system could turn malignant, as the only other cells known to have no finite chronological barrier were cancer cells. Like most of the analysis in these reports, it ended with a brief notation stating that more time and work was needed. Shavit shook his head. Always more work needed, never anything we can use now. He lit another cigarette and screwed an eye shut as the smoke curled up one side of his face. He turned to the section on neuroarchitectural analysis, skipping paragraphs of dense jargon and stopping when he came to several topographical images of Alex Hunter's brain, side by side with a normal brain. The normal brain looked like an average-sized pink and gray cauliflower, with its folds, bulges, and coils. By comparison, Hunter's brain had hundreds more folds. The known sulcus folds were labeled, but other arrows indicated numerous newly identified folds. As with the cellular repair data, however, the notations below the images stated, Uses unknown, time and time again. Shavit swore. Useless, he said to the empty room. He frowned as he noticed a paragraph at the bottom of the page, stating that the latest neuromapping had found no trace of the metallic object that had been embedded deep in Hunter's cortical mass when he came to them. This was puzzling, as all reports on the Arcadian subject had clearly shown that the bullet, lodged deep within his cerebellum, had been the initial genesis of his condition. How could it suddenly be gone? Shavit had read of cases where sharp objects had worked their way through people's bodies, there was an old woman in Tel Aviv in 1985 who'd fallen on one of her knitting needles. The tip had broken off in her heart. At the time, surgery was determined to be too high-risk an option, and so they'd kept the woman in hospital for a number of weeks. While there, she had developed a cough, a cough that had eventually brought up the broken tip of the knitting needle. Maybe, he thought. He read on. More notes and diagrams and arrows. Strangely, there was something still remaining in Hunter's brain, or perhaps something totally new. A whitish trauma zone, with a solid central mass that showed up in the CAT and MRI scans and X-rays. At first, the scientists had thought it was a blood clot, but then found indications that it had a dense biological core. Further scanning has suggested that there was some form of electrical activity taking place within what the report now described as a synaptic bundle. It was as though the small mass was firing off its own electrical impulses. Shavit raised his eyebrows and glanced at the section on further data collection options. Neurosurgical needle biopsy. Hmm. He took another deep drag on his cigarette. Maybe, but not yet. His niece would not react well if the man she had risked everything to retrieve was sent back to her with holes drilled into his skull. Vice might end up needing surgery of his own. Shavit laughed dryly and flipped to the last page to review the progress of the recent test subjects. He sighed and scratched his forehead. As with the previous week, the week before that, and every week since Hunter's recovery, they had been trying to replicate the process that had led to his condition. But every time they had failed. Shavit ground out his cigarette in disgust as he read through the new list of names, treatment variations, and the familiar, dismal results. Patient comatose. Patient psychologically disordered. Patient Emergency Termination He would love to know how the Americans were approaching the problems his team kept encountering. After several months, they still had nothing. He sat back and placed one gnarled hand behind his head, staring at the ceiling. 
almost nothing. They still had control of the original Arcadian. Alex Hunter himself was the key. Locked away in his memory, if it were still intact, were the events that had led to his superior physical and mental condition. If the information could be extracted, or better yet, if he could be encouraged to tell them, perhaps the man needed something to jog his memory, such as being with something he remembered or someone he trusted, a friend. General Chavit lit another cigarette, then lifted his pen and made some notes. When his niece finished her current mission, he'd organize for her to pay Captain Alex Hunter a visit, maybe even spend some prolonged time with him. As he signed the order, a sound came from deep in his chest that could have been the beginning of a cough or a rumbling laugh. He liked to gamble, and he liked to win. Chapter 5 Beirut, Lebanon The woman walked slowly with the stiff-ankled rocking motion of the old and arthritic. Her traditional black abaya attracted the heat and must have made the 90-degree early summer temperature significantly warmer. To anyone watching her pass, she appeared to be a devout Muslim, also wearing a niqab, or face veil, and black gloves. Around her neck, reading glasses with thick black frames hung from a short length of string and banged against her ample bosom as she walked. She paused and looked back down the steep cobbled street. Beirut was a mix of ancient and modern, home now to major industry and corporations, and even considered as a candidate for the 2024 Summer Olympic Games. A smart black AMG Mercedes shot past, no doubt headed for one of the fine restaurants on the waterfront that did a roaring trade with the tanned and well-heeled locals. The woman inhaled deeply. The city's leafy avenues, rich with the smell of coffee and cinnamon, made it seem a world away from the troubles of the South. Beirut reflected all the magnificence of modern Lebanon, with Christians, Druze, Shias, Sunnis, and many more seeming to live together in cultural and political harmony. The modern mixed with the ancient, the religious with the carefree. In Beirut, it seemed the Middle East was one of the happiest places on earth. The woman walked on, towards Gemaiza Street in the Ashrafia district. The streets narrowed to thin, winding lanes here, and it was easier to get lost. She checked her bearings and hoisted her string bag a little higher. The loaves of fresh bread, cheese, and onions would be a welcome breakfast for the men. She paused to rest on an old wooden chair in the shade of a young olive tree. Beirut was a small pool of calm water in a turbulent sea. Unlike the south, where the poor begged in the streets, resentment fomented, Vengeance was plotted, and hatred often boiled over into bloody violence. The South had been the front line for the Israel-Lebanon conflict for many years. It was where Hezar Jihadi ruled, the party of a thousand martyrs, they called themselves. They were political, religious, and paramilitary. Their leaders called for the destruction of Israel, war with the West, and a true Islamic state in Lebanon. Violence was their first negotiating tool of choice. The woman lifted the glasses from her chest and placed them on her face, then sat as immobile as the streets surrounding bricks and mortar as she watched a young man walk quickly up the street towards a solid wooden door recessed into an old-fashioned apartment block. He looked around furtively, then knocked three times. The woman waited for another minute after he'd disappeared inside. Then she got to her feet and hobbled towards the same door. Abu ibn Jabail opened the door a crack and peered out. 
He looked the old woman up and down. She lifted her bag a little higher and groaned softly under its weight. The eyes behind the thick glasses were like blurred pools of oil, unreadable. She moaned again, her arms shaking from the weight of the bag. Abu ibn Jabail could not care less about her suffering, but she was expected and her food would be welcome. He opened the door a little wider, but as she entered he stopped her with his hand and roughly felt her sides, back and front, searching for guns, knives, or explosives. She coughed wetly, and he held his breath, hurrying through his examination. How he detested being so close to the old hag, touching her body. It was probably a waste of time, but it was best to take no chances, considering how close they were to their goal. Finished, he stood back and waved her impatiently towards the kitchen, resisting the strong urge to kick her large behind as she hobbled past him. The woman shuffled slowly towards the five men sitting around the table in the darkened room. All had stopped talking at her arrival, and now sat smoking their thick, pungent shisha tobacco and sipping syrupy sweet coffee. Though her limbs were slow, her eyes darted from one man to another. She recognized Hazar Jihadi faces and also some senior Iranian revolutionary guards. Unfurled on the table, the corners held in place by a bottle of whiskey and several ashtrays, were the schematics for the new Iranian missile, the Shihab II, the Meteor. She stopped at the table and turned to the black-eyed young man who had let her in. May I use the washroom, Idami? The young man looked to one of the older men at the table, who shook his head without even looking up. No, the young man said. Leave the bag and go. Hala, hala. She nodded her understanding and turned towards the kitchen. On the way, she pulled off her gloves and pushed them into a fold of her robe. If the men had been watching, they would have been surprised to see such strong and youthful hands on one so bent and infirm. She lifted the string bag onto the kitchen bench and in the same motion drew up the front of her long abaya. Strapped high between her smooth, muscular thighs, was a squat black pistol. She pulled it free of the tape and secreted it in one of her long, loose sleeves. She whispered one word. Installed. From one arm of her glasses came the reply. Proceed. She drew in a deep breath and turned to hobble back out to the men. The young man who'd let her in was looking at her with ill-concealed disgust and contempt. He felt in his pocket, pulled out some crumpled Lebanese pounds, rolled them into a small ball, and dropped it at his feet. The woman slowly bent to retrieve it. However, when she came back up, it was not the wrinkled money she had in her hand, but an unwavering black barrack pistol. There were no words needed. The gun barked once in the young man's face, and before his body had even begun to fall, she turned and fired at the men at the table. Two went down with precision headshots. The third was taken high in the sternum, throwing a plume of blood and shattered spinal column over the wall behind him. Of the remaining two, one took up a vantage point behind some furniture, and the other launched himself at her across the table. Perhaps his mind was fooling him into believing it was an old woman under the dark robes, and she would easily buckle under his two-hundred-pound frame. Maybe he realized his error when he was in the air, but by then it was too late. The woman took up a combat stance, and with perfect balance launched a flat-soled kick to his face. Even though the man easily outweighed her by over fifty pounds, the muscles in her thighs uncoiled with enough force to smash his nasal septum up into his brain. He was dead before his large body had hit the ground. She dropped and rolled to the left, slamming her back to the wall. She needed to reacquire the final target. 
A voice sounded in the quiet from amongst the toppled furniture. But, Zion, you have stopped nothing. There are hundreds like us, and we will eventually bulldoze your bodies into the sea. The woman remained silent at the threat. Seconds passed as she quickly looked around the room, now heavy with the smell of cordite and coppery blood. But, Zion, if you let me leave, I will give you Nazra Nasha. I know you have been searching for him. He is here, you know, right now, in Beirut. Nazra Nasha was the leader of Hezar Jihadi and the mastermind behind every assassination, bombing, and cross-border raid for a decade. He was the first prize for every Israeli soldier and agent. Tempting, but not for today, the woman thought. She began to slide forward in the shadowy room towards where the voice was coming from. Israeli, I surrender to you, here. A new Glock handgun clattered on the floor in the center of the room. A lesser agent would have been momentarily distracted and perhaps have missed the almost imperceptible sound of the flattened steel pin of a stun grenade being removed. The man stood to throw the explosive. At the same time, the woman also stood and fired twice in quick succession. The man took two shots to the forehead and hit the ground at roughly the same time as the grenade. The woman dived behind a couch, crushed her eyes shut, and held her hands over her ears. Stun grenades were designed for maximum disorientation and had little shrapnel. However, they could destroy eardrums or maim if they landed close by. The small black cylinder exploded with an ear-shattering whoomp and a flash that would have seared the woman's retinas for days. The impact wave blew out all the windows, and the pyrotechnic metal oxidant set fire to the rug and most of the furniture. The woman stood, her ears still ringing even though they'd been covered. She crossed to the table where the missile schematics lay, stuffed them under her robes, then ran to the kitchen and retrieved her bag. She looked down at the black gun she still gripped. The hand that held it was as steady as a rock. In the meat between her thumb and forefinger was a small tattoo, a blue Star of David. She quickly wiped the weapon and threw it onto the burning rug, then spoke to the dead man. And there will always be thousands more like us waiting for you. She pulled on her gloves and slid the glasses back onto her nose. She pressed a small stud at the side of one lens and spoke softly. Blue Star requesting immediate extraction. The emotionless voice spoke into her ear again. Extraction authorized. And then, be advised, Blue Star. Arcadian conscious. She almost stumbled as her body, already awash with adrenaline, kicked up another gear. Awake, she thought. At last. She drew in a long breath, calming her urge to rush. She bent slightly at the knees and waist before she pulled open the door. Once again, an old woman suffering from the heat shuffled down a winding street in the city of Beirut. Adira Sinesh couldn't take her eyes from the figure on the bed. She found it hard to associate the mucus-covered thing staining the sheets with the strong, handsome hawk soldier she had known. Alex Hunter had been, was, like no human being she had ever seen or probably ever would again. Adira's jaw clenched, and she felt her anger rise at fate's cruel joke. She had told Alex she would take him horse-riding along the shore of the Sea of Galilee to stand on the purple cliffs of the Golan Heights. She had wanted to show him her Israel. Now he was here, and yet he wasn't. It wasn't fair. Together they had faced horror and death, 
and he had saved her life. In turn, she had stopped the Americans from cutting him into a thousand pieces for study. She drew in a deep breath. The man she knew was buried in there somewhere. She was sure of it. She became aware of the scientist next to her talking. Although we'd kept this specimen at extremely low temperatures, the bacterium was still active in his system, just slowed to a point of near inactivity. The specimen, she echoed, feeling her rage increasing further. Weiss nodded, unaware of her reaction, and continued. And then a week ago, it inexplicably resumed its vigorous progress. We don't know what triggered it, but it didn't leave us with many options. Nothing has worked against its aggressive progress to date. In my opinion, this thing is straight from hell. You've seen what it can do to flesh? We extracted and cultivated some of the bacteria immediately on the specimen's arrival at the facility, then injected it directly into several chimpanzees. In twenty-four hours, they were liquid. Muscle, hair, even bone. We had to incinerate the remains in an industrial furnace, as the residue was still active and aggressively infectious. Weiss nodded towards the bed. With the bacterium active again, it would have been the same with this specimen. Within twenty-four to forty-eight hours, we would have had nothing left to work with. So we immediately brought the body temperature back up to sixty degrees, just below room temperature, and increased the dosage for the Arcadian treatment that was brought in with him. We have no idea how his body metabolizes the chemical compounds, as they've proved fatal to every other subject they've been administered to. But ever since, his body has been squeezing out the denatured Hades bacterium. Weiss looked like he was about to touch the man's face, but instead let his gloved fingers hover just above the slimy flesh. The microorganism is now fully degraded, the tertiary and secondary structures, the bonding interactions, are all fully disrupted. Seems the treatment and the specimen's unique metabolism are the only systems that can mount a defense to overwhelm the invaders. He shrugged. If only we knew how they do it. He straightened. Every now and then he wakes, yells a few garbled sentences, then lapses back into unconsciousness. Adira pushed past the scientist and leaned slightly towards the figure on the bed. When she saw the leather and canvas cuff restraints on his hands and feet, she felt her heart rate start to lift. Anger bloomed in her belly and her lips compressed in displeasure. Vice chortled, probably interpreting her expression as disgust at the smell or the man's physical appearance. Go ahead, it's safe to be close. Just won't be very pleasant until the body's finished excreting the microorganism's protein shell. The suit I'm wearing is regulation for this level, not specifically for protection from this oily, oversized goyim. He smiled and used his pen to prod Alex's body through a clean section of the sheet. I personally have taken several slices from the subject, and I can guarantee there is no viable infectious agent remaining. Adira felt a charge go through her body. It was the same feeling she had before she killed an enemy agent. She steeled herself, closing her eyes momentarily. When she opened them, she turned to face the scientist, using all her will to keep her voice even. She failed, her voice increasing in intensity on each word. You are anatomizing? Who authorized this? The force of her voice and gaze seemed to make Vice suddenly unsure of himself. Uh, the general, General Shavit? He authorized the increase in temperature on the basis that the subject was useless to us in a nexus between life and death— too alive to dissect, 
too dead to consciously assist us in our testing. We hoped the raised temperature and dosage would retrieve him to a state we could work with. And it worked. Adira felt her mouth go dry. You are not working with him. You are working on him. The scientist stepped back as her glare turned volcanic. He must have realized she was no simple functionary sent by the ministry. Adira moved closer to the scientist, not sure what she was intending to do to him. Before she could act, the figure on the bed reached out and grabbed her around the wrist. The thick straps of the heavy leather restraints hung from his wrist like tattered streamers. Adira grunted, first from shock, then from pain. Alex still hadn't opened his eyes, but he hadn't reached out blindly. He'd seemed to know where she was. She gritted her teeth at the excruciating pain as his grip compressed the bones in her forearm. Vice dropped his clipboard and moved to a panel of buttons on the wall, obviously intending to call in security. Stay where you are! Adira's voice froze his hand in midair. Vice stood rigid for a few seconds before edging towards the door. Adira groaned as Alex dragged her towards the bed. Alex, do you know me? Do you know who I am? She brought her other hand around to try to dislodge his fingers, but she might as well have been working on steel. Alex, please! His eyes opened, and she saw spidery red and black veins ringing the once gray-green pupils. It's coming! he shouted, and his grip tightened even more. She's scared! She needs me! I need to go! He released her wrist and sat up, the restraint on his other arm parting like paper. Blobs of dark jelly slid from his face and torso. He coughed, spraying more black mucus onto the bed. He slowly brought a hand up to the side of his head and groaned deeply. It hurts. He looked at her and his eyes seemed to register recognition for the first time. You! The first dart took him in the shoulder, the second directly over the heart. The following four went in anywhere the security detail could hit. His hands dropped, and he looked down at the darts piercing his body in confusion before he slumped back on the bed. Adira screamed in horror and leaped at Alex to pull one of the hypodermic darts from his chest. Before she could grab another, she was seized from behind, one hand on her arm, one on her hair, and pulled roughly backwards. In her volatile frame of mind, it was a mistake. She reacted violently, spinning quickly to strike the first man under the chin with the flat of her hand. His head shot back on his bull-like neck, and he fell backwards like a plank of wood. She brought the other hand around to use the back of her fist on the next man. He dropped the handcuffs he was carrying and staggered backwards, but not before her other hand had shot out to chop into his windpipe, crushing it. He went down on his knees, his tongue protruding, and clawed at his neck, making a gagging sound as his remaining air ran out. She turned to the other two men, her legs planted in a fighter's stance, hands up and ready. They held their position, looked from Adira to Alex, then back to her. Her furious gaze burned into them, its meaning clear. Back off. They shrugged and edged out of the room, dragging their incapacitated colleagues with them. Adira heard the door lock, and her shoulders slumped. Now what? She walked to a metal sink in the corner of the room and wet a cloth she found there. She returned to sit on the edge of the bed and gently bathed more of the dark, oily substance from Alex's face, smiling as the clear skin shone through. Welcome back, my Arcadian. Chapter 6 
Young lady's name is Amanda Jordan, Big Brad Jordan's wife. I know him. He's a good fella. Officer Markinson nodded towards the woman on the hospital bed. She's busted up pretty bad, but the real problem seems to be more inside her head. The doc says she's catatonic, won't say a word, and I don't think she's even blinked once since we pulled her off the slope. Markinson waved his hand in front of the woman's face, then made a throwing motion at her staring eyes. She didn't flinch. Stop that. Chief Logan frowned at his officer, then looked at the cuts, abrasions, and plaster cast on the young woman's arm before turning back to Markinson. What do we know? Where's her husband now? Markinson shrugged. Still up there. Looks like they decided to trek to the top of the mountain. We think the weather gave them an early taste of winter, and I guess they either got caught in an avalanche or had a fall. Or maybe they had an argument that turned ugly. There was blood on one of her gloves. Chief Logan grunted. Can't rule anything out until we find him or she speaks. What about her effects? Anything? The blood traces on her glove are being analyzed now. We know from Brad Jordan's driver's license that he is type A. Medical examiner's office is going to give me a call when they're done. There was also a camera around her neck. Case was busted, but we think the memory chip inside can still be read. Johnson was going to try and download it back at base. Markinson shrugged again. That's about it, Chief. Logan stepped back from the bed. Okay, give Harley a heads up. We might need his dogs for a ground search. Logan frowned. Not even winter yet. Way too early for people to start falling off the mountain. Call me if something interesting turns up on the camera or with the blood trace. You got it, Chief. And Chief? Logan paused. Markinson waved his hand in front of the woman's blank face again. It's goddamn freaky, though, ain't it? Logan rolled his eyes. Just have the M.E. and Johnson send me the information ASAP. Arriving at the station, Chief Logan eased in behind his desk, making room for a stomach that had seen way too much fast food and cold beer. He pulled the bagel from its bag and laid it gently on the brown paper, then took the lid from his coffee and savored the aroma for a few seconds. He sighed contentedly. His morning ritual, bagel, coffee, and the newspaper, a small pool of calm in a sea of chaos. He was in early this morning, even with his stop-off at the hospital, planning to coordinate several searches and investigative cases that ranged from the trivial to the bizarre. That was in addition to slogging through his usual mountain of paperwork. He lifted the bagel and took a bite, then unfolded the stiff newspaper and stopped chewing. Oh, fuck, no. He closed his eyes briefly and swallowed the dry lump of dough. He opened them and looked at the headline again. He'd read it right the first time. Lion on the loose, two missing. The story from an unnamed source mentioned the Wilson girl and Brad Jordan in the first paragraph. Then it had some wonderfully sarcastic quotes from Jason Van Hortensen about his damned missing Lockenvelder cows, and if that wasn't enough, the type was all crowded around a grainy photograph of Amanda Jordan sitting up zombie-like in bed. The picture caption? Big Cat Got Her Tongue? Logan's first thought was to track down whoever had breached the hospital security to take the photograph, but then he realized that it didn't matter. The information was in the open and already traveling like a shockwave out from the town. You read a headline that says Joe Citizen Missing on the Mountain. You shrug and move to the sports page. But you see Lion on the Loose and Joe Citizen Missing, and you're damn well going to read the whole story, and then tell all your friends, 
who'll tell all their friends. Logan looked at his bagel, but his appetite had deserted him. As if on cue, the phone rang. He sucked in a long breath and said to the phone without lifting the receiver, Good morning, Mayor. What kept you? This was going to get ugly. He lifted the handset. Good morning, Mayor. Logan threw the report onto his already overcrowded desk and sat down heavily, swiveling his chair to face his computer. He flipped the folder open with one hand and used the other to open his email. Immediately, his inbox filled with messages. His eyes moved from the report to the messages and then back again as he tried to manage the two things at once. He felt a sense of pressure and urgency, and the morning was still young. After the call from the mayor, he'd been straight on to Markinson, taking a big bite out of him for not keeping him in the loop about the lion's escape. Now he was in a race to read the facts report, knowing full well he'd already promised the mayor he'd have things under control in twenty-four hours. And pigs might fly. He snorted and shook his head. The damned mayor had been better briefed than he was. He made a note on his pad. Never talk to the mayor. He'd make sure that was on his list of items for the next departmental briefing. He read the email messages with quick, darting eyes, deleting most as he went, until he came to the last two. One was from the Asheville Medical Examiner, and the other was from Johnson, with attachments. The man had managed to extract the Jordan woman's photographs from the busted camera. Good man. Logan said over his cold coffee. There were fifty-five shots. Logan pasted them up on his screen in rows and moved quickly through the timeline of Brad and Amanda's last hours together. There was the smiling couple loading the car, stopping for a sandwich and soda on the way to the mountain, with several shots of the side of Brad's huge, jug-eared head as he was driving. Logan flipped through them quickly. There was no sign of any tension. Both the young man and woman looked happy and relaxed with each other. He slowed his review. They had arrived. A shot of Brad pointing up at the Black Dome Peak. If nothing else, it gave Logan a place to start, and he should at least be able to identify the path they took. He stopped at a surprising view out over the other mountains. It was a good shot, and they were high up. White specks told him that the snow had been falling quite heavily. He played around with the image for a while, enlarging, removing shading and brightness, focusing in on certain quadrants. It didn't do any good. He couldn't determine where they were. He'd spent plenty of time up on the mountain, and he didn't know anywhere at that height that was so opened up from the trees. Basically, there just shouldn't have been a view like the one in the photograph. Must have found a new spot, he said to the screen. He tagged the image, moved it to the side of his screen, and stopped again at the next shot, a block of carved stone. The next image was the same, just at a slightly different angle. He shook his head. The symbols meant nothing to him. He tagged the shots and continued. The next shot made the chief frown and leaned forward. There was something on a pathway at the edge of the cliff. He didn't recognize the path or what he was seeing. Was it a figure? Didn't look right. He couldn't work out the scale as there were no trees, and it was hard to make out the content as the snow looked heavier in this shot. It also didn't help that Brad's parka was obscuring half the shot. Looked like Amanda had been standing behind him. Logan finished his coffee while staring at the image and grimaced at the cold, metallic taste. He shrugged and dropped the cup into his wastebasket, moved the photo to the side, and went on. The first shot reappeared, so that was it. He took down some notes. Climb towards Dome? New lookout and new path opened up on mountainside? High, 
6,000 plus feet. Possible slip? Stone artifact. Valuable? Fight because it was valuable? Figure on pathway. Man? Bear? Tree? Unknown? He looked at his notes. Not much to go on. Better than nothing, he thought, and reached back to the keyboard to open the message from the M.E. His brow furrowed as he read the clinical diagnostic results of the blood analysis from Amanda Jordan's glove. First level serological analysis. Blood antigen type, O. Blood biology, non-human. Metazoa, mammalian. First level match, no match. Type unknown. That's a big fucking help, he thought, as he continued scrolling down the page. Second level genetic analysis. 98% base-for-base -base genetic match to human. Excessive alpha hemoglobin genes to human. Lower ALU repeats to human. Chromosomal tips contain DNA not present in human chromosomes, and then 10% more DNA than human. Second-level match, International Zoological Database. No match, type unknown. There was another line in a different font, telling Logan that the medical examiner had added the note. Sample is either a fake or primitive form of blood type more closely resembling that of the great apes. Check the zoos and circuses. It finished with a smiley face. Well, that's an even bigger pile of no help, you smartass, Logan said, sitting back in his chair. He thought for a moment, then leaned forward to flick through Markinson's report. After a few seconds, he folded his arms, smiling. More closely resembling that of the great apes. And what do you know the circus is in town? Priority one, find that fucking lion. He pushed back his chair, then paused to look at one of the pictures he'd pasted at the side of his screen, that of the figure standing in falling snow. He frowned. He hoped the disappearances weren't the result of a lion on the loose, but at the same time, a small part of him hoped they were. Chapter 7 Alex groaned and sat up, holding his head. The pain was like a blast furnace in his skull. Within the agonized fire, a whirlwind of images flashed across his consciousness. People, places, things monstrous and alien. There was a giant bearded man pointing a gun at his face. With a shaking hand, Alex touched a small scar above his eye. He rocked back and forth for a few minutes until the pain became bearable, a vice instead of a hot spike. The images faded, and he rubbed his face. After another moment, he felt able to open his eyes. He remembered being in a laboratory and feeling like he was drowning, a foul liquid in his nose, mouth, and lungs. A dream, perhaps. He flexed his hands and turned them over. There were scars on his forearms and running up his biceps. It looked like skin had been removed or carved out. What happened? His voice sounded strange to his ears. He blinked a few times and waited for the dizziness to settle. He looked around. The room was small and sparsely furnished. The bed he was sitting on, a chair, a chest of drawers with a bowl of fruit on top. No windows. There was a small bathroom containing a few toiletries. Again, no window. Alex went to the chest and pulled open the top drawer. There was clothing inside, all new. He lifted a pair of slacks and let them unfold at his side to gauge their length. Satisfied, he pulled them on and followed with a T-shirt. The smell of the fruit made him hungry. He couldn't remember when he'd last eaten anything. Grabbing a green apple, he lifted it to his mouth, then paused and closed his eyes for a second. 
The smell reminded him of something. He tried to concentrate, but as soon as he pressed for the answer, the furnace swung open again. He groaned as the pain intensified and staggered back to the bed, sitting down heavily. Once again, the faces swirled around him, like silent ghosts demanding to be acknowledged. There came a young woman, attractive and dark-haired, with blue eyes that changed color as he watched. Next was an older man, square-headed and brutal-looking, then a woman, older, her face comforting somehow. There was a large dog beside her, and she called to it, said its name. He strained to hear, but the words were muted. The pain intensified, and he felt a warm wetness on his top lip that ran quickly down to his chin, blood running from his nose. He let the images go and tried to relax his mind. The pain immediately eased. Alex took off his T-shirt and held it to his face, waiting for the flow to subside. He pulled it away and noticed the dark blood was thick with black, oily streaks. Nice. He flung the shirt into the bathroom and got to his feet. After showering and finishing off most of the fruit, he decided to check out his surroundings in more detail. He reached for the door handle. The round metal knob was cool to the touch and only turned a fraction before stopping. Locked. He frowned. There was no key or locking mechanism on his side. Jammed? He squeezed the knob and tried again. The handle squealed in protest, then came off in his hand. Huh? He held up the steel ball. It was dented and compressed from where he'd gripped it. The part that had attached to the door was twisted as though it had been wrung in an industrial press. He dropped the handle to the floor and pushed at the door, still locked. Now he was trapped and there was no door handle. What the hell? His neck prickled. He whipped around, feeling a presence behind him. The room remained silent and empty, but as he was about to turn back, he noticed a tiny black dot on the ceiling. No bigger than a match head. It could have been a housefly or a spot missed by the painters. But he focused on it and saw it clearly for what it was a small glass lens. He gritted his teeth, anger starting to build. Fuck you, I'm leaving. He took a step back, preparing to kick the center of the door, when the lock rattled and the door opened. Alex took a step back. You! Adira walked into the room, leaving the door open. Alex looked from her to the open door. She smiled. You're not a prisoner, Alex. You never were. It was locked to ensure you didn't stumble around in a strange place while you were recovering. You've been very sick. Alex. He tested the name. It sounded familiar. I can't remember. Adira ignored his question. Instead, she walked around him, nodding. Physically, he looked as if he'd never been sick, let alone spent six months in an induced low-temperature suspended animation to halt the progress of a killer necrotizing bacteria that was trying to ingest his body. She smiled at him. You were injured, but now you're fine. I know you, don't I? I think... He grimaced. It's... Hurts when I try to remember things. She nodded, fixing a concerned look on her face. It seemed any memory of his ordeal, his early life, even of his time in the special forces, had been erased. Might not be a bad thing, she thought. She spoke as if reciting a prepared script. I'm with the hospital. You were injured and you've been in a coma. Be patient. The memories will come back slowly. Your name is Alex Horowitz, and for now all you need to know is you're back amongst friends. She reached out and placed a hand on his shoulder. 
very good friends. She held his eyes. You've come back to me, to us, and no one and nothing else matters for now. Okay, Alex? He stared back at her, then seemed to give up. Nothing else matters, he repeated. Adira sat motionless, waiting for the general to get to the point. Her uncle had summoned her, undoubtedly, to discuss Alex Hunter. She could see the Project Golem folder on his desk, open at the surgical biopsy section. He had obviously meant it to be seen. She drew in a deep breath through her nose. The smell of cigarettes, aftershave, and old leather was familiar and comforting. Still, today she was nervous. Captain Adira Senesh, member of Mossad's elite Metsada unit, had crawled through claustrophobic terrorist tunnels, fought hand-to-hand -hand with some of the most dangerous killers in the world, and seen things of abject brutality and horror. But at this moment in General Shavit's office, her tension was acute, as she waited to hear whether she would be allowed to continue with the project. She loved her uncle dearly, but if he tried to remove her, there'd be trouble, and she'd make it. The general's voice came from his lips like the warm smoke of his cigarette. Everything has a price, Addy. Stealing Captain Hunter from the Americans, secreting him here in these facilities. There is more than a financial cost. There are political costs. The cost of putting the entire population of Israel at risk of contamination. The cost of embarrassing our remaining American supporters. And the cost to both our careers. She heard a slow, wheezing intake of breath, and then an exhalation like a sigh. Adi, did you really think we went through all this just because you felt you needed to repay some sort of personal debt? Or liked the color of the captain's eyes? He shook his head slowly. The Arcadian Genesis is a puzzle, and we need our puzzles solved, Adi. Adira's burning anger at Vice for taking samples from Alex had dissipated. Now she just felt confused and disappointed. Vice said he was cutting him up. You know that was never the deal. You promised he would be looked after. We agreed that we'd seek answers from the man if that was possible, not just from his biology. She sat forward. No one is going to be cutting the answers out of him. I swear this to you. The next person who touches him... She left the threat hanging. The general sighed and shifted in his deep leather chair. Adira felt her foot begin to tap the floor, still at the mercy of her nerves. She saw her uncle's eyes slide from her jumping foot to her face. My child... Does he even know you? he asked gently. The real you? We know the infection reached his brain. Believe it or not, I worry about your safety. You know what the Arcadian records said about his mental stability. He could tear you in half before he even realized he had done it. No, never. He saw me, and he knew me. She looked at her wrist, circled by a band of bruises. More slow wheezing as the general watched her face for a few seconds. Maybe, Adi, and maybe not. But we need the secrets he holds. You've always known that. The Hades bacterium forced our hand, but it also brought him back to us. We must make use of the opportunity while we have it. How long until the American military discovers he is here? For now they think he is dead, but we know Colonel Hammerson wasn't authorized to deliver Hunter's body to you or to let you take him from the country. This is the age of technology, Adi. Nothing and no one can stay hidden for long. Yes, I promised only to question Hunter. But how could that happen while he was frozen? 
If he will not talk to us, his cells will. I must have my answers. The general leaned further back into the chair, and his eyes closed. I'm sorry, Addy, but the bill is coming in, and it must be paid. Adira got to her feet and paced to one side of the room, spun and returned. She stood beside his chair, not facing him, talking just as much to herself as to him. I'll get your answers. I can get him to talk. I'm the only one he would trust, and I know what he is capable of. The real secrets are in his head, not just in his flesh. She paused and waited. There was silence. She heard her uncle's heavy body shift against leather, but didn't wait for his reply. Besides, no one is touching him until I say, or you know what I will do to them. A coughing sound morphed into a dry laugh. Only you would dare to challenge me in my own office, General Shavit said. You are truly your mother's daughter, Captain Sinesh. And if I agree and let you run the debrief, how will that benefit me? She finally turned to face him, going down on one knee beside his chair. You know what he can do. If he chooses to resist you, there is no one who can stand up to him. You'd have to kill him, and then the secrets in his mind are gone forever. But he will talk to me. He trusts me. I can get your answers and get them quickly. She gripped his forearm. Give me six months. Shavit patted her hand, and after a few more seconds nodded his assent. I want a daily report on his progress, and he must report weekly to the Moach Center for Medical Testing. You have sixty days only. This is not negotiable. She started to protest, but he held one hand up in front of her face. In sixty days we begin our own testing. If you cannot solve the puzzle in two months, you never will. He got to his feet, still holding her hand. You will own this responsibility. Do you understand what I am saying, Captain? Yes, yes, agreed. Thank you, Uncle. He nodded again and led her back to her chair. Now finish your tea and tell me all about Beirut. That was too easy, Adira thought as she pushed out through the doors of the nondescript building and inhaled the scents of the street. There was a hint of citrus on the air. She liked it. Tel Aviv was small but modern and centralized, a pool of high-rises, expensive shops, and perfect streetscapes surrounded by parkland, gentrified neighborhoods, and beautiful beaches. She was part of the only real democracy in the entire Middle East, and it made her proud. It is a jewel worth protecting, she thought, as she went lightly down the steps. She knew her uncle was just as determined to understand Alex Hunter as she was. They just had differing ideas on how to go about it. In addition, she cared only about Alex. Her uncle wanted a thousand like him. Adira chewed her lip as she walked quickly. She hoped her uncle had agreed so readily to her request because he had confidence in her. But her time was limited, and Alex's memory loss presented her with a dilemma. There were some things she wanted and needed him to remember, but there were other memories she didn't want him to recover at all. She had no idea whether his full memory would seep back in time, or whether he would be forever a clean slate. The latter presented an opportunity to implant a whole new mosaic of memories, to create an entire matrix of suggestions, ones she wanted him to have. The trick was for her to get enough information from him to satisfy the general and her objectives, but not to open him up so much that she could lose him back to the Americans. She hurried down the street, feeling the bite of the afternoon heat on her neck. 
She would take him out of the city, she decided, somewhere comfortable and relaxing. She knew the perfect place. She smiled. In a week or two, she bet she could coax the answers from him. Her smile broadened. She hadn't felt like this in years. Chapter 8 Hickory, North Carolina Will? Will! Big Will Jordan jerked upright as he heard his mother scream his name. All the Jordan brothers made it their duty to help their folks on weekends with the heavy chores. Now the pair were getting on. This Saturday it had been his turn. The old folks were as mellow as they came, but his mother's tone now worried him. It spoke of shock, anxiety, and not a little fear. Last time he'd heard her like that was when Hank got busted up in a car crash. He dropped the axe he was using, but hung on to a good-sized lump of splintered wood and sprinted for the back door. His father stood at the sunroom window, his back turned and a whiskey in his hand. It was way too early for the old man to be drinking. Will's mother paced back and forth. On seeing him, she wiped her hands on her dress, gripped his shoulders and looked up into his broad face. That was the Asheville police. It's Brad. He's missing. What? But he's... His mother didn't let him finish. They found Amanda. She's hurt. Her lips trembled and the word hurt came out long and filled with anguish. Have they... His father turned. Nope, not even started looking yet. His father could do that, read his sons like an open book. His mother wrung her hands some more. He's up on the mountain by himself. I read about a lion escaping. I thought it was funny at the time. She crossed herself as though asking forgiveness for a sin and turned back to Will. Leave it to them, they said. They'll keep us informed. She shook her head. Brad's not as strong as you boys. He's... She put her hand over her mouth. Will felt a flash of anger at the police inactivity. He knew that Brad was their mother's favorite. They used to rib him about it when they were young. Where he, Jackson, and Hank were big, blocky men of average intelligence, Brad was still big but finer-featured, more of a thinker, his mother used to say. Will put his arm around his mother's tiny shoulders and felt her trembling. He asked as gently as he could, Can't Amanda tell them what happened? She shook her head jerkily. She's in Asheville Hospital in a sort of coma. Not unconscious, but she can't talk. She was hurt, and I get the feeling they think Brad was somehow involved. She looked up at him. They asked me, has he ever hit her? That's bullshit! Will's roar made his mother put her hands to her head. His father put his drink down. Listen, boy, the weather's turning bad, and there's a big animal on the loose up there. Young Brad, he's not a mountain man, and the police are doing jack shit. The old man held Will's eyes for a number of seconds. Will got the unspoken communication. You find him. Bring him home. He nodded once to his father, then said over his shoulder as he stepped towards the back door, Call Jackson and Hank. Tell him I'm on my way to pick him up. Will Jordan stood by the open back door of the dark blue SUV and loaded the supplies his brothers had bought at the local store. Hank sat behind the wheel, eating cereal straight from the box, and Jackson was still inside settling the bill. Will paused and folded his huge arms as an Asheville police cruiser drove by, its single occupant slowing to eyeball him. He eyeballed the officer right back, daring the smaller man to stop and say something. 
His feelings about the Asheville PD were at about basement level right now, and after driving most of the night to get to the mountain, his mood was as dark and dirty as a coal miner's crusties. The cruiser rolled on, disappearing around the corner, and Will turned to yell at the shop's closed door. He jammed his hands in his pockets to keep them warm. He knew he should check in on Amanda, but decided she could wait. The weather was getting colder, and she had a roof over her head. His youngest brother didn't. Unfortunately, the Asheville police either couldn't or wouldn't tell Will where they were up to with their search for Brad. And Amanda was still in such a state of shock that she hadn't said a word. The shop door swung open, and Jackson emerged. Will jerked a thumb to the back of the SUV. Throw that in and let's go. Will Jordan climbed out of the SUV and walked a few paces towards the start of the Black Mountains Trail. He stared up at the mist-shrouded peaks. The low cloud obscured the dome, but he knew it lay many thousands of feet above where he and his brothers stood. A freezing wind stung his exposed jug ears. Will ignored its bite, as did his little brothers. If you could call men over six two and weighing over two hundred and thirty pounds each little. Jackson and Hank were silent too, their heads turned towards the distant peak. They knew Amanda had been found on the eastern slope and pretty high up. The youngest, Hank, spoke first. Gonna be cold up there. Yup, damn cold, Will answered without turning. And maybe wet, too, I reckon. Hank hitched his pants a little higher and made a tsking noise within his cheek. A man exposed to those elements for a few days is going to be in a world of hurt. Uh-huh. Will exhaled and watched a small ghost of warm vapor drift away from his mouth. He knew his brothers weren't looking forward to the trek. All three had been hiking and camping in the woods before, but never for longer than a day at these temperatures. But if any of them were lost, Will knew that Brad wouldn't hesitate to hike into hell to look for his brother. And neither would he. Jackson gave his eldest brother a flat smile. It's okay for you, Frosty. You like being alone in the cold. Will just winked in reply. As far as he was concerned, the cold and the discomfort meant nothing. And Jackson was right. He didn't mind being alone at all. He liked it. Fact was, he found people annoying, his family accepted. One day, he'd buy a place in some remote part of the country and live there all by himself. He zipped up his heavyweight insulated jacket and lifted his pack. It clanked as the bear canisters inside knocked together then crackled as the covering weather shield molded to the shape of his broad back. He checked the matte black Browning Maxis shotgun. Then, satisfied with the lethal-looking 12-gauge autoloader, he lifted it over his shoulder and slid it down into a side slot in the pack. Once his brothers had their own packs in place, they checked their firearms. Both were carrying large-frame Smith & Wesson revolvers, just like their missing brother. Will turned to his brothers, his face grim. As long as it takes. Jackson and Hank nodded solemnly and repeated the vow. As long as it takes. The three big men started off towards the ominous Black Peak. Black Mountain, with its dense tree cover, was normally a quiet place at the best of times. But now, with winter coming on, even the wildlife seemed to have disappeared. Any sounds that did intrude on the graveyard-like silence were magnified, alerting potential hunters to an approaching or retreating quarry. Will was first to detect the faint sounds of heavy movement from further up the slope, Something or someone was ghosting them, staying close but just out of sight. They were about 5,000 feet up, 
and he reckoned they still had a way to go to get to where Brad had likely hiked. As Will had expected, once off the formal path, the going had been slow and arduous. The morning's clear sky had changed as the day had worn on. Now, in the evening twilight, the low cloud moved quickly overhead, and the temperature had dropped from cold to bone-chilling. Still, everything had been quiet and uneventful. Until now. Will put one gloved hand to his mouth and used his teeth to slowly pull on the fingers to remove the glove and let it fall to the cold ground. He held up his hand. His brothers instantly got the message and pulled their own gloves off and lifted their handguns from their holsters. Will lowered his hand to the shotgun, his fingers now sliding easily in against the cold trigger. He widened his stance and grounded his feet. The slope was rocky and steep, and the soil hard and unyielding underneath the layer of pine needles and frozen leaves. One loose step and a man could find himself a couple of hundred yards down the side of the mountain before he knew it. And now was not the time for those sorts of mistakes. He quickly organized his brothers into a loose skirmish line, with Hank closest at twenty feet out to his right, and Jackson another twenty feet further along than Hank. Each strained to watch the upper slopes, while also trying to keep one eye on Will. Jackson walked ahead a couple of steps, so he could see around the bulky shape of Hank's enormous red-and-yellow checked parka. Hank looked from the slope to Will and then back. He breathed out a question loud enough for Will to hear. Could it be Brad? Will didn't take his eyes off the hill, but his mouth turned down and he shook his head slowly. He took a step forward, cocked his head slightly, and strained to hear. There was a faint sound, like a giant bellows working, just over the small ridge. He was conscious of his fingers starting to numb from the cold. He'd need to replace his glove soon, or when the time came to pull the trigger, he wouldn't be able to. There was a grinding, snapping sound from over the ridge, as if something was being ripped, bent, or broken, followed by a thumping sound Will both heard and felt beneath his boots. From the end of the skirmish line, Jackson whispered loudly, What the hell is that? and leaned forward to look at his brothers. Will turned briefly to motion for Jackson to stay quiet. The snapping and grinding turned to a deeper, bouncing thump. As Will's eyes focused on Jackson at the far end of the line, Hank in the middle just disappeared. The man-sized boulder that had taken him out hurtled and bounced down the steep mountainside, Hank with it, breaking small trees and ricocheting off larger trunks and outcrops of exposed stone. It struck an enormous spruce a hundred yards further down, leaving Hank's body a flattened riot of color and fluids against the scarred bark. The echoes of the collision with the boulder died away. Hank! Will screamed. Jesus Christ! Jackson moaned, holding both hands to his head, what, what just happened? Will whipped his head back and forth. Confusion swirled in his mind like a fog. Hank! Jackson started to walk stiffly down the slope, calling to his younger brother as though trying to rouse him from sleep. Are you okay, Hank? Will gestured towards the mess against the tree trunk. He's not fucking okay. He's... Another sound. Stealthy but heavy. Will reacted quickly, spinning with his gun up. He flicked the weapon one way and then the next, trying to pinpoint the sound with the long barrel. Show yourself, he shouted. And then, a little quieter, he said, Where are you? His breathing came in rapid pants, and his heart raced in his chest. He could still hear Jackson bleating Hank's name over and over, and he turned to yell at him to shut up. 
just in time to see something collide with his brother, something colossal, covered in greasy, matted red fur. In the time it took Will to raise and aim his shotgun, Jackson was lifted and smashed into a tree trunk. There was a brittle snapping sound, which could have been the breaking of branches or the splintering of his brother's bones beneath his thick jacket. Will groaned, feeling his soul shrink. His whole body was suddenly as cold as the snow. He screamed Jackson's name, then swore and fired his gun. But the distance was too far, and the pellets lost much of their penetrative force. The enormous figure bent over Jackson simply turned its head to him in response. Will froze at the sight of its face, a mask of pink, boiled flesh, with features that were almost human, but grossly large and deformed. Its eyes pinned him to the spot, definitely not human, but intelligent and cunning. Jackson moaned and raised one feeble hand. The creature turned its attention back to him, lifted his broken body in both its hands, and spun to whip it against the trunk with such force that something flew off the top of Jackson's body. Will hoped it was his brother's cap, even though he couldn't fail to see the spray of red across the white ground. Will charged with the shotgun raised. He fired, pumped, and fired again. The creature made an unnerving whooping sound that was almost as loud as the blast of the gun. Will couldn't tell if he'd hit the thing or not. I should have, he thought. I'm a fair shot and the distance isn't so great. But the creature showed no sign of being injured or even discouraged by the tungsten iron shot pellets that must have struck its huge frame. In a flash it was up the steep hill, much faster than Will could hope to follow. It disappeared over the ridge. Will could hear it moving at speed, presumably towards some form of cover. He raced to Jackson, but all that remained was blood, a few fragments of ripped clothing, and something that could have been hair-covered skull fragments. The body was gone. Will screamed his brother's name to the sky, then said it again, softly. He looked down the slope to the crumpled mess that was Hank. He felt freezing tears on his cheeks and opened his mouth, but couldn't find the energy to scream again. He sank to his knees amid the ruination that was the last of his brothers. He was alone. Four had become one, and he felt the loss as keenly as if he had forfeited his limbs. Snow started to float down, bringing a deeper silence with it. People said Big Will Jordan always wanted to be alone. He'd finally got his wish. Will regretted pursuing the creature further up the mountain. Though his desire for vengeance was strong, his body was exhausted, as was his ammunition, and he wasn't sure it even hit the thing. He could hear the crush of its heavy footsteps as it circled him in the twilight shadows. It was as if it wanted him to hear, was playing with him, always staying just out of sight, just out of range. Will drew his handgun and tried to sight along its shaking barrel. His fatigue pulled heavily at him as he tried to hold it steady. He knew he needed the creature to come a hell of a lot closer to have any chance of hitting it. Things have gone to shit, he thought, and I goddamn walked them into all that shit. He looked down the slope. He needed to get away from here. Even though his anger still burned hotly, reason told him that out here by himself he'd soon die. He needed to come back with a bigger gun, a lot more shooters, maybe some dynamite. He took a step back and then another. The wind had come up. It wailed softly through the tops of the trees, sounding sad. That was appropriate. Will's cheeks stung where the tears for his lost brothers had dried. The ice crystals left there burned his skin raw. 
He took another step back and looked slowly from the upper slope down the steep incline, judging where to place his feet when he broke into a run. Time was against him. In another hour it would be pitch dark, and then... He didn't want to think about being on this mountain in the dark. The crunch of heavy footsteps came again, and the coarse sound of a giant pair of bellows being worked, in front of him, then beside him, then to the left, then right. Perhaps it's just the wind in the trees, he thought without conviction. He looked down the slope again, fear creating an urgency in him. Will slid the backpack off his shoulders. He wouldn't need its contents, wouldn't need any of the survival gear he'd packed. There was no way he'd survive a night here, now. He sucked in a huge lungful of breath and tensed his muscles, ready to leap. He stole one last look up the slope and exhaled as if he'd been punched in the gut. It was Hank, about fifty feet up, leaning against a tree. His body was slumped against it, and he looked hurt, but it was him for sure. His red and yellow checked parka was unmistakable. Maybe it had been his brother moving around all this time, hurt and confused. Inside, Will knew it wasn't possible. He'd seen Hank's body smashed against the trunk of the tree. There was no way he could have survived that, but still... Hank! Will slogged ten feet up the slope towards him. He wasn't moving, just sort of leaning, propped against the side of the tree. Will looked around. Silence. Even the wind seemed to be holding its breath, waiting. He climbed another twenty feet. Damn this darkness! Damn the cold and damn dropping my pack! He couldn't see properly, and wished he'd at least kept his flashlight. He climbed another ten feet. Oh, God, no! Hank! He made a gagging sound in the back of his throat, and his teeth bared in a disgusted grimace. He didn't need to go any further. The placement of the body and the bulky material had been deceiving. Closer and from a different angle, he could see Hank's crushed and flattened frame, the broken skull that had been roughly stuffed back inside the jacket's hood. Will knew what this was, a decoy, the same strategy duck hunters and deer stalkers used to draw lone animals in. He felt fresh tears burning his cheeks as a soft, crunching footstep sounded behind him. Bastard! He spun, raising his weapon at the same time, but he never got to fire. The booming whoop froze his fingers on the trigger, and he was lifted roughly into the air. Will Jordan joined his brothers. Chapter 9 Matt Kearns pulled into the Asheville University car park, and let the pickup's engine rumble to silence. He sat in the cabin and inhaled deeply, enjoying the sylvan charm of the green campus and the bright blue mid-morning. Now this is stress relief. He pushed open the door, which gave a protesting squeal of hinges crying out for oil, and stepped down from the cabin just as two girls in tight, light, blue university T-shirts went past. He afforded them a wide smile and ran his hand up through his shoulder-length hair. "'Go the bulldogs,' he said, and made a bat-swinging motion in the air. One of the girls giggled and flashed a set of the whitest teeth he'd ever seen outside of a toothpaste commercial. He continued watching them as they disappeared around the corner, Yep, still got it, he thought, as he put both hands on the center of his back and stretched, breathing in the clear air. Matt looked around at the campus, some new buildings in amongst the old, but still recognizable. Given its focus on liberal arts, it was hard to call the university traditional. It was more progressive, more fun. 
Not academically as rigorous as Harvard, of course, but a different, freer atmosphere. Did anyone not look back on their university days fondly, he wondered. He smiled. Standing here in the sunshine, he felt an almost physical lightness, as though the warmth and clean air were scouring the dark corners of his soul. It had been several years now since he'd assisted in a joint scientific-military mission below the Antarctic ice. He'd survived, but many hadn't. His comfortable life had been devastated by the revelation of another world, an ancient place where monsters slithered in the dark, and people, people he'd loved, had died horribly. He hadn't coped well. His relationships fell away, his work suffered. Though Harvard had extended his time off on compassionate grounds, he knew he'd never be able to remain there, trapped by wretched memories. He'd been looking for a fresh start, and when his old linguistics professor had sent him a message telling him he had retired, Matt had asked for his job. Asheville had jumped at the opportunity, and why not? Matt was a big fish, internationally respected, many papers published, Harvard pedigree, and references from leading public and private officials. Even from senior military figures, though these he'd kept in his top drawer. If he never saw a military uniform again, he'd die happy. The job had been formally offered, and now he was down here to meet the faculty. Fact was, he needed this job, not for the money, but for his sanity. He suddenly felt like he had a future again. Ah. He tilted his head skyward and let the sunshine bathe his face. It had been nearly a dozen years since he'd left Asheville, but the place that held the best memories for him was the center of the campus universe, the library. Matt sauntered across the quadrangle, his longish hair and boyish looks allowing him to blend smoothly amongst the milling students. The Ramsey Library loomed before him, still able to evoke in him feelings of excitement and anticipation. It was an impressive structure, with square columns giving it an aloof presidential appearance. Inside it was a different, warmer place, rich with information. He walked through the front doors and resisted the urge to turn into Café Ramsey, still tucked just inside the doorway. As in his day, students sat there sipping coffee, heads down over the books open on their tables. What had changed, though, was that most of them took notes on tablets or computers. Matt tutted his disappointment when he noticed another change— the automated donut maker had been replaced by an enormous pay coffee machine. That's progress, he thought. He continued through to the library, taking a well-remembered path to his favorite hangout, the research center. It was there that his languages professor, Henry Van Leven, had imbued in him a sense of wonder at how ancient civilizations could still speak to scholars today, through languages that were, in some cases, more works of art than written words. Together they had pored over pencil rubbings of the Rosetta Stone, from ancient Egyptian to classical Greek. He had got to know the Persians via 5,000-year-old Proto-Elamite scripts, and read fragments of the first Hebrew Bible in the Dead Sea Scrolls. It had ignited a passion in him that had turned into his career. He hoped old Van Leven was in today. There was so much he wanted to discuss with him. As Matt made his way towards the front desk, he saw the familiar dark blue uniform of the police force. Two officers, one large, one small with a bristling mustache, were engaged in a muted but animated conversation with a middle-aged woman, possibly the head librarian. Matt approached with his hands jammed in the back pockets of his jeans, acting casual. He suspected he was invisible amongst the milling students. He leaned on the desk beside them, 
and glanced at several glossy prints the officers had spread on the countertop. Each showed a piece of stone covered in symbols. His interest piqued. He edged closer. The woman had folded her arms and was shaking her head. I'm sorry, Chief Logan, but our language anthropology department these days covers how languages interact rather than their linguistic roots. We haven't looked at ancient languages for a while, not since Professor Van Leven retired. That answers the question of whether he's in today, Matt thought. The taller officer, Logan, nodded glumly at the woman. Thanks, Miss Steinberger. It was a long shot anyway. Thought we'd try locally before sending it outside for assistance. He made to gather up the photos, then stopped. Just one more thing. Any ideas on where we could get some answers? Matt craned his neck to see over the smaller officer's shoulder. The officer turned and made a face at Matt. Matt pulled back slightly and made a face back. The policeman muttered something and turned back to the desk, squaring his shoulders to make it difficult for Matt to see. But Matt was at least six inches taller than the officer, and by standing on his toes he was able to look over the man's head. The officer swung round. "'Why do you think you're—' "'Cherokee, possibly Catawba, Matt said. The policeman just stared at him, so he went on. Strange. Looks like a mix of the two. Definitely a Native American proto-language, though. Where'd you get them? The two policemen and the librarian stood with their eyebrows raised, still staring. Matt pushed past the smaller officer and went to pick up one of the prints. Chief Logan put a large, blunt finger on it to stop him. And who might you be, son? Matt stuck a hand out. Matt Kearns, professor of archaeological studies at Harvard University. Well, ex-Harvard. I'll be taking up a position at Asheville University. I specialize in ancient civilizations and proto-linguistics. And that, sir, looks like a museum-quality artifact. May I? He stuck out his other hand, palm up. Chief Logan ignored his outstretched hands and looked into Matt's eyes, probably trying to check if he was about to spring a student joke on the local police, Matt thought. The chief shrugged. Okay, I'll bite. He indicated himself and then the man next to him. I'm Logan and that's Markinson. What can you tell me about these? He briefly shook Matt's hand then swiveled the pictures around for him to see. Matt lifted the prints carefully, squinting at each, and finally going back to the clear image of the stone with the rough figure behind two arrows. I think this predates most of the tribes from around here. The arrow fletch is too simple for it to be Catawba, but maybe very early Cherokee. Ancient. Very ancient, even bordering on Paleo-Indian. I've only ever seen this type of imagery in cave art, and that was dated to the first people to arrive after the Ice Age, nearly 10,000 years ago. Matt squinted again and brought the picture so close to his nose it almost touched the print. The stone itself doesn't look that old, though. My guess is that it's a reproduction. Markinson crowded in. So it's just a copy? Matt kept staring at the photograph. Uh-huh. Produced maybe in the 12th or 13th century from an earlier design. You'd need to carbon date the stone for accuracy. You could say it's a bit like touching up an old painting or sculpture. Someone went to a lot of trouble to keep this warning in place and legible for a very long time. Perhaps thousands of years. It's a warning? Officer Markinson tilted the photo in Matt's hand so he could look at the image again. Matt leaned one arm on the officer's shoulder and pointed to the carvings. There are two things here, 
a warning and a protective talisman. See the arrows? One's pointing left and the other's pointing right? The one facing right means protection, and the left one is meant to ward off evil. Not sure what the figure behind the arrows is supposed to represent. Never come across that form before. Some sort of megafauna? Cave bear, maybe, or a spirit totem? Markinson shrugged Matt's arm from his shoulder. Matt flicked the photograph with his finger. Any more stones? I'm betting this warning is part of a longer narrative. Images like this rarely exist as standalone glyphs. They're nearly always part of a detailed chronicle. That's how the first people handed down their stories through the generations. Chief Logan pulled another print from the folder he carried. We've got no more pictures of the stones, but what about this? He handed the picture to Matt. Matt looked at the snow-shrouded image and frowned. He picked up the photo of the carved stone and held it close to the new print. The figure's hulking shape, the long, powerful limbs. It was hard not to see the immediate similarities between the carving and the figure in the other photograph. He looked at Chief Logan, who raised an eyebrow in question. Matt shrugged and handed back the prints. Curiouser and curiouser. You got that right. Anything else you can tell us, Professor Kearns, about the stone or the figure? Matt slowly shook his head. No, but I'm around for a while, probably permanently, actually. I'd like to see the stone in person and where it came from. I could probably tell you more about its provenance then and what his creator was trying to tell us, or warn us about. He thought for a second or two. It might have come from some sort of ruins, I suppose, which means there could be other valuable artifacts in the area. But the figure? He shrugged again. Don't know, not really my area. Could be a cave bear, as I said, or maybe an ape. But there's nothing like that in the megafauna record at least not round here. Logan nodded and grunted. The M.E. had thought the blood trace on the Jordan woman's glove had come from some kind of great ape. He turned to his partner. Markinson, you checked on the Kringle Brothers' circus, didn't you? The smaller officer shrugged. Sure, nothing really relevant. All they got is some mangy chimpanzee that's older than Methuselah, and has to have his bananas mashed because he's got no teeth. Logan nodded, then looked back at Matt as though considering something. He sucked in one cheek and made a clicking sound with his tongue. He turned to the doorway. Chief Logan! Logan turned back to Matt and raised an eyebrow. That strange figure in the photographs... It looks familiar to me, but it's not my field. I deal in languages and ancient civilizations. But I do know someone who could help us out. I could make a call, maybe get him up here to identify it. Might give you a lead. Chief Logan stared at him, but Matt could tell his focus was elsewhere. He shook his head slowly. Don't really have any budget for that, Professor Kearns. We'll do it for a round of beers, Matt said, surprising himself with his determination to help. Markinson took a step towards Matt and waved his hand back and forth in front of his face. Not a chance. Logan grasped his officer's shoulder and pulled him back. There was a weariness in his voice when he spoke. Professor Kearns... I've got a man lost on the mountain, a woman zoned out in hospital, a lion on the loose, and a small child missing. Not to mention weird shit going on all over town. Right about now, we'll take all the expert help we can get. We don't need civvies in on this, Chief, Markinson protested. They'll just... You got it, Chief Logan, Matt cut in. 
and reached over the top of Markinson's shoulder to shake Logan's hand. They swapped contact details, then the large police chief guided his still remonstrating officer out of the building. Matt thought of the chief's words, weird shit going on. He stopped dead. What am I doing? He felt a chill of fear go through him. Memories threatened to overwhelm him. He shook his head. No, he thought. It is time to live my life again. He headed out of the library. He knew exactly what he was doing. He loved mysteries, especially those from ancient times. This would be an exciting professional challenge. And he knew someone else who would dig this job just as much as he did. Matt grinned. Is that the best brown butter pecan you've ever tasted? In response, Charles picked up his empty plate and made a show of licking it. His tongue made a squeaking sound as it ringed the plate. An old woman at the next table clicked her tongue in disgust. Matt turned to her and whispered, Just out of prison. So this is where you're running away to, Charles said. Not bad. Anything interesting going in anthro for me? Charles Schroeder was professor of physical anthropology at Harvard and one of the few friends Matt had managed to hang on to after the Antarctic experience. Short, with a round face and thinning blonde hair, Charles had been nicknamed Charlie Brown in school, not helped by the fact that his surname, Schroeder, was also the name of one of the comic book character's friends. He looked at the folder Matt had brought with him, and became more serious. So, what have you got for me, Cook? Why all the excitement? Charlie, this is such a cool town. As well as looking like something out of a postcard and having the best pie in the state, it's given us this. He flipped open the folder and spread out the pictures Logan had emailed him like playing cards in front of his friend. Then he removed a sheet of typed paper and placed it face down on the table. Charles studied the pictures individually, then came back to the hulking figure in the snow. Matt leaned forward. It's not a bear, is it? He was trying hard not to preempt anything or put ideas in his colleague's mind. Duh. Maybe a man in a bear suit? Come on, Matt, this is a hoax. Where'd you get these, from some teenager? Or maybe a middle-aged farmer who reported he'd been abducted by aliens and probed, and I bet you know where. Charles laughed. Matt raised his eyebrows. From a woman who's now in hospital in, so I'm told, a terror-induced catatonic state. Her husband is missing up on the mountain. He turned the sheet of paper over. She had blood on her glove. Not hers. Not anyone's, really. The lab only managed to come up with an approximate match. He waved his hand over the page, indicating that his friend should read it for himself. Charles read the Emmy's report, then frowned. He retrieved the photograph of the snow-shrouded figure, and this time drew a magnifying glass from his pocket and studied every inch of the print. He pursed his lips and put down the magnifying glass to sip some coffee, then picked it up again and returned to his examination, this time reciting soft observations. Hominid. Long arm-to-leg ratio, broad chest, short lower back, flat face, Large, domed cranium with bony ridge above forward-facing eye sockets, providing stereoscopic vision. He drew back a bit from the print and squinted. Hmm. Prominent pectoral girdle and dorsal scapula. Powerful ribcage that looks flatter front to back. He lowered the print, but held onto it and a medical examiner's report that indicates a genetic match to some type of unknown primate. Okay, what is this? 
Matt brought his fist down on the table. That's exactly the right question. What the hell is it? But I think you know. Maybe. Charles frowned at the print again. Matt leaned across the table. Come on, buddy, say it. No. Charles dropped the print and put his head in his hands. No, I won't. I can't. They'll burn me. Matt grabbed his friend's arms and chanted, Say it, say it. Come on, you can do it. The woman at the next table clicked her tongue at them again. Matt turned to her. It's for his therapy? The doctor says it's good for him? Charles groaned and said something too softly to hear. Matt stopped shaking his arms, but held on. Louder, Charlie Brown. Say it out loud. Momo, Nukluk, Mogolon, Skunk Ape, Fook Creature, Old Great One. He looked up as his speech slowed. Sasquatch. Bigfoot. Matt let his arms go. And bingo. Charles sighed and sat back. Matt, I think you need someone a little more like my uncle, someone who likes to dabble in the exotic. Oh, right, your uncle who went missing in southern China around 1935? That's a big help. Listen, Charles, I think there's something weird going on up in those mountains. I've been doing some research on the history of the area. There's a Native American legend about a place called the Jocassi Gorge, dates back to 1539, when the Spanish explorer Hernando de Soto documented some southern Cherokee picture script. Jocassi was supposed to be the daughter of a great chief. On hearing that the young warrior she was in love with had been killed in battle, she paddled out into the center of the Whitewater River. The legend goes that she didn't drown, just disappeared and the gorge became known as the Place of the Lost Ones. An old man sitting at a nearby table moved his head slightly. His face was turned away, but one large rubbery ear was pointed at Matt and Charles. Matt pulled a pen from his pocket and grabbed a napkin. He drew two sets of symbols on it and turned the napkin around for Charles to see. But... Look at this. Charles stared at them for a moment, then looked up and shrugged. Same. Almost the same, Charlie Brown, except for these small wavy lines and some extra shading. The first is the Cherokee symbol for lost, but the other symbol's much older. It translates as great in the sense of size. I've seen the De Soto transcripts, and I think he got it wrong. I believe the legend was referring to something a lot older than the missing chief's daughter. I don't think the script referred to the lost ones, but the great ones. As in a race that was great in size. Matt threw the pen onto the table and sat back, folding his arms. Charles, we have got to check this out. Charles mimicked Matt's actions, an I'm-not-convinced-yet half-smile on his face. Matt, I'm delighted to see that something has finally fired you up again, but what I see here is a partially obscured simian or proto-simian shape. It could be a dozen things, and all you've got to support your theory is a carving and a photograph, and a bad one at that of a man-shaped thing that could have come straight from the file of Sasquatch sightings that gets a run once a year on the Discovery Channel. If we're not careful, we'll end up driving into a wall that has ridicule and bye-bye career written all over it. Matt knew he had his friend hooked the moment Charles started using the word we. He laughed and shook his head. Not a chance. I'm way too good a driver. Hey, we're just doing a little consulting for the local police force. Where's the harm in that? And you're probably right. It's probably nothing more than some overdressed camper lost in the snow. Matt paused for dramatic effect. 
But then again, it might not be. After all, the Native Americans have numerous legends that refer to the big man, the hairy man, or the big brother of the forest. The Cherokee, Dakota, Sioux, Algonquin, and dozens of others had stories about the Chiatanka, long before white men showed up. Even the word Sasquatch is from a near-extinct First Nation language called Halkomelem. It means hairy giant. The old man turned to look at Matt and Charles, then turned back to his empty plate. Matt noticed his rising voice was attracting attention, so he sat forward to speak more conspiratorially. You know, Charles... Little people were just legends or make-believe until they discovered the Hobbit in Indonesia. Charles was staring down at the tabletop, seemingly lost in thought. Homo floresiensis, he said softly, found in the Liangbua cave on the Indonesian island of Flores in 2003. A magnificent find and one that proves some legends are real. He looked up at Matt and narrowed his eyes. You said consulting. They'd pay us as well? Matt just jiggled his eyebrows. Charles's mouth split open in a broad grin. Okay, buddy, I'm in. The old man rose from his seat as soon as the two younger men left the café. His thick, slicked-down white hair and faded light-blue chambray shirt seemed to glow under the neon lights as he stepped lightly to their table. The perfectly pressed shirt, fastened up to the neck, hung on a frame reduced to sinew and brown leather over the man's nearly ninety years. He placed one brown, wrinkled hand on the napkin, turning it slightly to study the symbols the long-haired young man had drawn. He mouthed the Lakota word he had heard the man use, Chietanka, then crushed the napkin and pushed it into his pocket. He left the café and followed the two men along the dark street. Chapter 10 Kathleen Hunter stared into the fire, the flickering orange tongues reflecting in her eyes. The flames were warm and comforting, and as she watched, they opened familiar windows into her past, into her memories. Beside her on the rug lay Jess, fully stretched out like an enormous bearskin rug, one hundred pounds of German shepherd, and her last living family member. Settling further into the old chair, Kathleen let her eyes wander over the angled line of photographs in their wood, silver, or plastic frames on the mantelpiece. The first was of Jim Hunter, her husband, in his youth, all whipcord muscle. Beside him, looking even younger, was his best friend, Jack Hammerson. Soldiers, both of them. The next frame held another young man, the face eerily similar to Jim's, but the photo was sharper and more modern. It was her son, Alex Hunter. An older version of Jack Hammerson was standing beside him, a hand on his shoulder. Another soldier sent out to serve and defend the nation, Another soldier who never came home, she thought morosely. Except for you, Jack, you could survive anything. She looked down at the dog. Never love a soldier, Jess. They break your heart even if they don't mean to. The dog huffed in her sleep, her feet slowly circling as she chased something in a doggy dream. Kathleen wiped her eyes, cursing softly at the way the pictures could raise her with feelings of love and pride, then cast her down into melancholy and even a little anger. 
She sighed and lifted the newspaper resting on her lap to fan her face. Phew! Someone needs a bath. She sniffed again. Odd smell. Did you roll in something? she asked Jess. The dog came awake and rolled over to a sphinx-like crouch, eyes round and alert, ears up and pointed towards the window. Kathleen tucked her feet under the dog's large, warm body and looked at the photograph on the front page. A little girl with a gap-toothed smile beamed back at her. Kathleen recognized the face before she read the name, Emma Wilson. She was missing, and the police were offering a reward. Poor little angel. That's not far from here, Jess. We can help look for her tomorrow. Jess hadn't moved, remaining fixated on something outside that only she could sense. The fire popped, then settled, making the dog jump. Kathleen looked at the woodpile. It was getting low. There wouldn't be enough to keep the fire burning through the night. Though the big dog was warming her feet now, she knew that by morning the house would be colder than Grandpa's crypt. She sighed. She knew she wouldn't feel like going outside to get more wood just after dawn. Her old bones complained the most from the cold in the mornings. She set the newspaper down and pulled her feet from under Jess. Should have done it before, old girl. As she got to her feet, there came the almost imperceptible sound of branches snapping in the trees near the house. The noise carried easily to the dog's ears on the still, cold air, and Jess was immediately on her feet, hackles up from her neck to her tail, making her seem twice as large as her usual huge self. Her bark was deep and booming in the small room, and her lips had pulled back to show all her teeth. Kathleen put her hand on the dog's head, then ran it down over one ear and along her back. Stop that, you silly thing. You're scaring me. She felt the huge chest working like a set of bellows, the muscles bunched and tight. Jess hadn't taken her eyes off the front of the house and skittered on the rug now as she rushed to the front door. Kathleen went to the window and looked out into the clear, moonlit yard. The front of the house was clear, and there was nothing visible amongst the large fir and birch trees she had allowed to grow to within fifty feet of the house. Weird old dog, she thought, as she looked over to where the firewood had been stacked neatly by that nice Jim Miller boy who had cut it for her. Kathleen pulled on her cardigan, picked up the firewood bucket, and headed for the front door. On her way, she stepped out of her slippers and into a pair of rubber half-boots. As she approached the door, Jess moved to stand sideways across the frame. The dog looked up at her briefly before swinging her head back to stare at the door, as though seeing straight through the wood and out into the dark night. "'You're not going out if you're going to carry on like that,' Kathleen said. I'm not planning on chasing you up the side of the mountain, so move, please. Jess took no notice. Kathleen scowled at the dog, then pointed down beside herself. Heel, Jess! The dog reluctantly came and sat beside her. She tried to lick Kathleen's hand, whining and obviously highly agitated. Stay! Kathleen walked to the door and looked back. The dog was licking her lips nervously and started to get to her feet. Stay! Jess sat down again, but Kathleen could tell she was struggling to obey the command. She frowned again and shook her head. Jess had never disobeyed her before, ever. I'll just be a couple of minutes. Jess got to her feet again, but Kathleen opened the door and went out before the dog could try to stop her.
Alex and Adira allowed their horses to amble along the Ashkelon shoreline. Both in T-shirts, jeans, and bare feet, they were enjoying the late afternoon sunshine on the coast of the ancient city. Alex inhaled deeply, taking in the smell of salt, warm sand, and drying seaweed. He felt Adira watching him and turned to smile at her. It's magnificent here, thank you. Smelling the sea, hearing the sound of the waves, I find it peaceful. He looked out at the ocean and breathed in deeply again. It's strange. I know how to ride a horse, but don't remember ever actually riding. We've been here before. It's one of our favorite spots. Don't worry, it'll come back soon, Adira said, smiling, and pointed to a small, horseshoe-shaped cove where the sand was flat and golden. Let's give the horses a rest she said. She slid from her horse and Alex followed suit. This far south, the beaches were unoccupied, too close to the Gaza Strip to be considered safe, but perfect if you wanted solitude. A few trees stood at the edge of the dunes, and tough grass dared to creep down towards the water. Alex tied his horse up in the shade and walked a few paces to lie down on the sand. He closed his eyes. The gentle sound of the small waves breaking just a few feet away should have made him relax completely. But there was a nagging prickle behind his eyes, as if there was something he needed to do or remember, and his overactive brain wouldn't let go until he did. He opened his eyes and lifted one of his arms, examining the skin on both sides. The fresh scars that had been visible a few days ago were gone, not just healed, but vanished entirely. There was something else, too. He'd started to sense things, things beyond sight, smell, and hearing. Adira had told him his name was Horowitz, and that he was a soldier in the Israeli army. He'd been injured in battle, concussed, and he'd lost his memory. It sounded right, but it didn't feel right. Even as they got closer, he couldn't tell whether she wanted to be his bodyguard or his keeper or something more. Back in Israel, he'd seen her talking daily to the man she called his doctor, but he'd known she was lying. She was good at it, but he could tell. He mentally shrugged. Did it really matter? Alex didn't feel in any hurry to remember what it was that the doctors or Adira's superiors desperately wanted him to remember. After all, he had everything he needed here, as Adira kept telling him. She sat down beside him, and Alex opened one eye and watched her for a minute. She never relaxed, never once closed her eyes and surrendered to the warm sunshine. She was always on guard, on duty. Her eyes never stopped moving, from the line of dunes to the crystal-clear water to the small stand of trees. He tapped her leg to get her attention. Do you miss them? She looked at him quizzically. Miss who? Whoever it is you keep looking for. He grinned at her, still keeping one eye shut against the glare of the sun. She laughed and lay down, propping herself on one elbow. I just keep a lookout for you. I'm right here, he said, brushing some sand from her jeans and letting his hand remain on her thigh. It's hot. Bring a swimsuit? Very. And no. She leaned forward, her dark eyes containing amusement and desire. Alex recognized the gaze, but in a flash Adira's face had morphed into that of another woman, with finer features and soft blue eyes. He tried to put a name to the face, but the prickling he'd felt behind his eyes turned to white-hot pain. He winced and sat up. 
Something was happening, or about to. He could sense it. He knew it. Adira pulled back from him and stood quickly. Come on, let's get out of the sun. You need to rest. She sounded disappointed. Adira woke to the sound of crashing and Alex yelling. She switched on the whole light and stood in his doorway, just able to make out his shape, sitting on the bed, holding his head. The migraines again, she thought. He seemed to suffer the most when he tried to reach back into his memory and recover who he was. His past was still locked away from him, behind a red-hot door of pain. Are you okay, Alex? She waited a few seconds for him to respond. When he didn't, she walked into the room and sat on the bed beside him. She poured him a small cup of water and lifted it towards his lips. Here. He held her hand and the cup, draining it. I see faces in my dreams. His voice was slow, as though he wasn't fully awake. I see a soldier, gray-haired and mean-looking, and an old woman on a porch. There's a mountain in the background. I know her. I know her. Alex looked at Adira, but she wasn't sure he actually saw her or whether his mind was still somewhere else. It was hot in the room, hotter than usual, and his body was an unnatural temperature. She had been told to expect it, as his metabolism worked well above the normal average range. She used the cuff of her long-sleeved T-shirt to wipe his brow. There are other things. His tone was becoming insistent. Things that hide in the dark or crawl on insect legs. Monsters, maybe, from my imagination. But they seem so real. Adira had seen one of those monsters on a mission with Alex in the Iranian desert. They'd been attacked by something that should never have existed outside of a nightmare, and it wasn't only his sleep it haunted. He grabbed her wrist. Something's reaching out to me, calling me. It won't stop. He pulled her closer and stared into her face. She brushed the damp hair from his forehead. Shh. You're safe here, Alex. You're all I've got left. He drew her even closer, and she let him. You don't know how much I... He found her mouth, and the kiss that started softly became hungrier and more urgent. She clung to him, feeling a warm bloom spread in her belly. Deep down, she knew this was what she had wanted almost since she'd first met him. Alex, Alex. She kissed him again and again, on the mouth and neck, tasting the salt of his perspiration. It excited her even more. She wasn't supposed to let anything complicate her mission objectives. She never had before, and it had been easy. She was always a soldier of Israel first. She was her duty. His mouth found hers again. This is different, she thought. This is something I want, something that's just mine. She lifted her T-shirt up over her head, and he pulled her down on top of him. The warmth in her belly spread lower. The night was at its darkest. It would be morning soon. Sleep was impossible. She lay on top of the sheets, feeling the perspiration trickle from her temples into her hair. There was a fluttering sensation in her stomach that made her feel euphoric and apprehensive at the same time. The values she held dear and the things she'd thought she wanted suddenly seemed far less important compared to the selfish desires she now harbored. Throughout the night, silly half-dreams of going away together, somewhere far from either of their countries, somewhere no one would find them, had played over in her mind. 
Adira could hear Alex's soft breathing beside her, rhythmic like a machine. The feelings of apprehension rose again. She couldn't count on his memory never returning. What would he think when he found out that he was someone completely different from the person she'd told him he was? He'd hate her. She'd lose him. Her objective was to get Alex Hunter to reveal the elusive element that made the Arcadian treatment work. Science alone was unable to deliver it. Her success would give Israel access to a source of security for the future. Her country was a mere eight million souls, surrounded by an Arab world numbering nearly three hundred million, most of whom wanted Israel erased from the map. But once that door in Alex's mind was opened, other corridors back to his past would be available to him. She groaned and rolled towards him, but couldn't make out his profile in the blackness of the room. When she was a little girl, her uncle, now the general, had told her of a famous Israeli saying, Alone we are weak, but together we are iron. She would not abandon Israel. But how could she do that and not lose Alex? She reached out and touched his shoulder, feeling the heat. She had been faithful to Israel her entire life. Didn't that count for something? This will not end well, she thought, and closed her eyes. Chapter 11 Chief Logan stood in the afternoon chill and watched forensic services finish up their examination of the Wilson place. He'd managed to persuade Helen and Clark Wilson to stay in a motel in town for the evening so they wouldn't be following the officers around during their investigation. His men needed the freedom to probe everything from under the beds to the surrounding woods. It would be stressful for the parents if nothing was found, even worse if something was. An hour earlier, one of his officers had returned from the far tree line at the foot of the mountain, carrying a small red sweater in a plastic bag. It matched the description of the clothing Emma was wearing when she disappeared. It was intact, and there was no blood or other signs that could be associated with an animal attack. At least that's something, Logan had thought, as he watched the head of forensics, Ted Brandon, open the bag. Brandon had sniffed the contents, then recoiled slightly. Logan had frowned. What? Brandon shook his head, shrugged, and resealed the bag. He'd thrown it to one of his team and wandered over to Logan. What was it? Logan had asked again. Funny smell is all. Brandon had looked distracted. Got something, Chief? The shout from the woods startled Logan back to the present. He should have felt elated at the discovery of a clue, but for some reason he was dreading any news at all. What do you got, Ollie? He yelled back. Officer Markinson pointed at several spots among the grass and dirt in a clearing. Tracks, plenty of them. Logan and Ted Brandon moved quickly to where the men had formed a ring, around where Markinson was pointing with a flashlight. Brandon crouched down and rested his forearms on his knees. After a moment, he nodded. Yep. Logan went down beside him, squinting at the disturbed soil and twigs. Brandon reached out with one hand and spread his fingers over a group of scuffs and indentations. Big pug marks, ten inches at least. Here's your escaped lion, chief. Logan drew in a breath and let it out slowly. Markinson raised his flashlight and pointed back into the trees. Came in from there. He moved the torch towards the mountains and goes out there. This is as close as it got, I think. Logan nodded. Good man. 
He felt a glimmer of hope that the tracks didn't come within a hundred feet of the house. Brandon moved some twigs. It was here a while. What was it doing, just watching? Markinson shook his head. Lying in wait, probably. They do that, you know. Logan shook his head. Unlikely. The Kringle brothers had told him the lion had never attacked anyone in its life. Markinson crouched down with him and pointed the light at Logan's face. I was doing some reading before I came up, Chief. Adult lion eats up to 20 pounds of meat a day. That little Wilson girl was just over 40, ringing wet. If it did take her, in a couple of days there ain't going to be much left. That's enough of that talk. We don't know the lion took her. It's true, Chief, Officer Parsons said from behind them. And they don't eat their prey right away. They usually take it somewhere quiet and secluded. They like to eat where they... Logan shot to his feet. Shut the fuck up, both of you. Brandon rose slowly, wiping his hands on his thighs. Bill, they're right. Big cat, hungry, probably confused and scared. Used to people or not, all bets are off, I reckon. Logan looked up at the sky. It was getting dark. He walked a few paces away from the small group and stood with his hands on his hips, looking up into the thick forest cover of the Black Mountain. For the first time in his life, he thought the beautiful peaks seemed secretive, even a little threatening. They probably were right about the lion. Decisions mattered, and even minutes probably counted now. He spun back to the group. Markinson, Parsons, you two just pulled extra duty. We're going up. We should have done this days ago, Logan thought miserably, as he and his three men moved up the side of the mountain, breathing hard, leaving plumes of hot air behind them. Logan was only just managing to keep pace with Harry Erskine, who was being dragged up the steep incline by the twenty feet of leather lead attached to his tracking hound. The large animal was picking up speed in spite of the increasing slope. Logan tried to remain upbeat. She's going to be okay. She has to be. No one gets attacked by a lion in North Carolina, for Christ's sakes. Might as well put up signs at the Fontana Dam warning of sharks. Nevertheless, he felt himself sagging, fatigue and concern weighing him down. Get your running shoes on, Chief, Erskine called. Buzz must be getting close. Erskine leaped over a log and nearly slipped on the frozen ground. The leash went taut and jerked him forward once again. Logan looked back and frowned. His two officers had fallen nearly fifty feet behind and looked ready to sit down first chance they got. He swore softly before yelling back down the hill, Markinson, Parsons, you get your asses up here pronto. We got contact. Markinson looked up briefly, gave his senior officer a thumbs up, and started taking larger, though not faster, steps. Pete Parsons nodded, but struggled to get his thick thighs moving at any increased speed. He resorted to using the barrel of his shotgun as a hiking stick, which elicited a torrent of foul language from Logan. Parsons lifted the gun and wiped the stock on his jacket sleeve, then put his head down and plowed forward, breathing hard in the icy air. Logan followed Erskine into a thicker stand of trees, and nearly crashed into the man's back. Erskine had reeled the dog in and strapped its snout. It whined softly and danced at his feet, eager to continue the chase and confront whatever it had been tracking for the last few hours. What? Logan began, but stopped as Erskine held the back of one hand up in front of his face. It's just through them bushes, he whispered without turning. Moving in and out of the rocks, 
Must be a cave or shelter or something there. Logan followed Erskine's gaze. After a second or two, he saw movement, something large, fur-covered, moving in and out of the shadows. The dog whined again and pulled on its lead. What's up? Markinson's voice made Logan jump. He turned to scowl at the man, put his finger first to his lips. Logan pointed up the slope, then to his men. They hunched down and pushed through the branches of the dark fir trees, which were so tightly packed it was as if their stems were woven together. Logan watched them go, then turned back to Erskine. You and Buzz stay here. If anything goes wrong for me and the boys, God forbid, head straight back down to the truck and call Chief Winston in Charlotte. He paused, trying to think of something heroic to say, but all that came to mind were General Douglas MacArthur's wartime quotes, none of which seemed appropriate. He crept forward, ducked below a branch, and stepped out into a small clearing. Some ancient landslip had brought down a jumble of enormous boulders, and the shadowy spaces between them created a series of shelters. Logan paused to look up the slope. As instructed, Markinson and Parsons were standing in an opening between some trees. They waved, and as he lifted his chin in return, he was pleased to see they both had their guns ready but pointed to the ground. Just as well. If he went back to the station full of double aught, he'd never hear the end of it. He breathed in slowly through his nose, the clearing smelled rank. Something large had been living here, and by the look of the large bones strewn about, had been feeding up here as well. He took another few steps and motioned with one hand for his men to move forward. The forest was cemetery quiet, and he was sure he could hear breathing, a deep-chested panting, coming from just up ahead. He lifted his gun. He felt good. His hands were steady as a rock. He remembered two things from his training. Don't shoot unless you absolutely have to. And more importantly, make the first one count. The panting was getting louder, coming from just behind a large kidney-shaped rock. He gritted his teeth. This is where training and guts meet reality, he thought solemnly. Then, damn! Wish I'd thought of that in front of Erskine. He gripped his gun a little tighter. The panting stopped. There was silence. Logan held his breath. He waited a few seconds, then slowly brought his gun up, aiming the barrel at the tumble of boulders where he assumed the beast's lair to be. He planted his legs wide apart, a hunter's stance. The sudden roar was like a monstrous shock wave. He felt it from his scalp all the way down to his clenched sphincter. The creature appeared on the rocks, a colossus of teeth, claw, and stinking fur, like something out of a bourbon-soaked nightmare. Its open jaws could have accommodated Logan's entire head and shoulders. It roared again, but Logan swallowed a dry ball of fear and kept his gun up, level, unwavering. He could see the massive beast coiling its muscles, its face furious or fear-maddened, or both. It leaped. He fired. Other explosive roars quickly followed, then a crushing, hot weight landed on top of him. Chief Logan took the canteen, sipped, then allowed Markinson to drag him to his feet. He held on to his deputy's arm for a few seconds, waiting for the wooziness to leave his gut. He guessed he might be suffering delayed shock. Parsons slapped his shoulder. Right between the eyes, Chief. Logan looked down at the massive lion. Its skin was torn by numerous bullet and buckshot holes, Someone had used a stick to prop open its jaws, displaying yellowed teeth as long as his fingers. 
Markinson kneeled beside the huge head to investigate the cavernous mouth. He turned slowly to look up at the chief. You think the Wilson girl is in there? Logan went to rub his brow, but noticed there was blood on his hands and wiped them on his pants. He pictured the tiny girl standing alone in front of the 500-pound monster and shuddered. You know, Ollie, I sure hope she isn't. But let's call in the M.E. and find out. Come here. Charles Schroeder waved Matt over to where he was crouched beside a tree. Matt could see his friend's attention was riveted on an area where the dry grasses had been unable to take hold. All that was visible from a distance was bare dirt and a few struggling asters. Matt looked quickly over his shoulder before heading over. He knew they were probably trespassing. When he'd phoned Chief Logan earlier, he'd been told that he was out at the Wilson place looking for a missing girl. While he was still on the line, he'd heard the chief and some of his men rush in to get kitted out with weapons. Something was up, and Matt's radar had gone off the scale. They'd arrived at the Wilson place at dusk, and Charles had been straight on the scent like a bloodhound. Matt kneeled next to him, adding his own flashlight beam to Charles's, and frowned at the ground. Up close, he still couldn't see anything beyond a few bumps and waves in the dry soil. Charles looked at him, his face excited, eyes wide. We got something, he said clearing pine needles and twigs away from the soil. Matt moved his flashlight slowly over the area while Charles fumbled in his pockets. I don't see it. What have you got, a track or spore? Charles pulled a small tape measure from his pocket and sat back on his haunches. He lifted his flashlight to shoulder level and shone it at a spot in the dirt. Okay, squint and make your eyes go a little out of focus. That'll allow your central vision to include peripheral input. He raised his other arm, his hand extended flat to the ground. Now look where I'm pointing. Matt could just make out a rough shape in the dry soil. The small depressions resolved into a pattern, something more than an accident. Holy shit, I see it. It's... Fucking enormous. A footprint or part of one. Keep your foghorn down, Charles said. You're damned right. We got a clear big toe and part of the metatarsus pad. He expertly extended the tape one way, then the other, then set it down carefully beside the print and pulled a small battered notebook from his pocket. He removed the rubber band binding it, and started to scribble with the pencil stub that rolled free of its pages. He chuckled softly as he looked again at the print. Whoa, you're a big un, aren't you? He held the notebook out so Matt could see his calculations. I've used standard anthropoidal biometric ratios. As an example, an average human of about six feet in height has a foot length approximately 15% of its total height. The big toe is roughly 18% of that ratio. He looked at Matt, who nodded, so he went on. The big toe we have here is around three and a half inches in length, giving us a total stature of... He circled a number and tapped it. 125 inches over ten fucking feet tall. He sat back in the dirt, almost panting with excitement. Matt laughed. Hey, take it easy, buddy. Do you need a cigarette after that? They both laughed. Charles shook his head. I should have brought a camera. Sorry to doubt you, but I thought this was going to be hoax number one million, and so I didn't bother. I'll come back later and take some casts. Matt gave his friend a half smile. I'm glad you came anyway. And hey, all I had to go on was a rock carving and a grainy photo. 
I kind of doubted it myself. Charles's face turned serious. You do know, we've got to find this thing before anyone else does. This could make the coelacanth and the wallamai pine look like sardines and dried flowers. We can't let something this rare be filled with a lot of shotgun pellets. I think Chief Logan took all that firepower after the escaped lion, Matt said. It was probably here, too. For all we know, it could have been tracking this creature as well. Charles shook his head. If this creature is what I think it is, the lion wasn't tracking it. More like it was tracking the lion. Matt looked up at the black mountain. It was night now, and a huge moon had lifted up behind the peak, making it look almost prehistoric. He shuddered and felt his fears re-emerging. Being out in the dark with a giant creature on the loose brought back memories of another monster that had stalked him and others beneath miles of rock and ice. He took a deep breath. A lot of people had died that time. He hoped history wasn't about to repeat itself. The old man moved through the trees close to the house. He stood looking up at the mountain for several minutes, as still and quiet as the hushed night around him. He took a small leather pouch from his pocket, loosened the loop string around the top, and pinched out something that he threw in the air towards the mountain. Some of the substance blew back in his face, and he sneezed. He sliced the air with one arm, his fingers opening and closing, making symbols and shapes in the air. He spoke in a strong voice, a chant that lasted for several minutes. Then he stopped and stood staring once again at the mountain. As he turned to leave, he kicked dirt over the print that Matt and Charles had been investigating. Chapter 12 Kathleen Hunter shivered on the porch and blew a plume of misty breath from her lips. Going to be a cold winter this year, she thought, as she stepped down onto the frosty grass. As she walked around to the side of the house, she could see Jess at the window, up on her back legs, staring down at her. The dog's big black nose was pressed to the glass leaving a smear. Kathleen laughed softly. On her back legs and back lit like that, the enormous German shepherd looked like a werewolf. She shook her head as she approached the woodpile. Been acting peculiar for days now, she muttered, more like a mother hen. Could dogs get menopausal, she wondered. Might be time to take her to the vet for a checkup. Kathleen shivered again. She was always a bit spooked by the trees at night. The clouds crossing the moon made them seem to move and sway, even without any wind. They alternated between seeming further away than they were, or closer, as they did tonight. Just a trick of the silvery light, but still a little unsettling. She reached the woodpile and stopped to sniff and look around. Phew! What is that smell? Something must be dead. No wonder Jess was all stirred up. In that instant, a booming whoop smashed out of the trees beside her. She dropped the bucket and swung around to the noise to see one of the largest tree trunks moving towards her. Except it wasn't a tree, after all. Kathleen Hunter screamed. Jess ran from the door to the window and back again. Her hackles were a line of spikes down her back, and flecks of saliva had appeared at the corners of her mouth. The sense of danger was overpowering. A stench leaked in under the door that made her flanks shiver and dredged up a frightful genetic memory from ancestors a million generations back. As she reached the front of the house again, a booming whooping sound made her freeze. 
She leaped at the door and grabbed the handle in her jaws and pulled. Nothing happened. She scratched at the doorframe with her claws, dragging long splinters from the heavy wood, then bounded back to the window. As she neared it, she heard a sound that made her heart erupt with fury, the scream of her master. Jess exploded through the glass without a second thought. The creature loomed above Kathleen Hunter like a deformed giant, its long crested head blotting out the moon, its stink filling her nostrils. She scrabbled backwards along the dry ground and screamed again, the first name that came to mind, Alex! The face of her lost son flashed into her mind, and she could almost feel him close by. There was a sound of smashing glass, and Jess came out of the darkness like a hundred-pound tan-and-gold missile. The dog leaped over Kathleen to strike the giant form. She hung on, sinking her teeth in deep and hard. The whooping changed to a roar that seemed to blast the leaves from the nearby tree branches. Kathleen knew Jess could never be a match for the massive brute. As she watched, the creature wrapped one hand around the dog's neck, dragged her free of its putrid-smelling flesh, and flung her at the nearest tree as if she weighed nothing. Jess hit hard, bones and cartilage exploding from the impact, before her body shuddered into a heap at its base. Kathleen could see Jess's eyes were still open, staring at her, but probably sightless. She screamed out in agony, her last friend gone. The creature shuffled towards her again, its teeth bared, each one longer than her fingers. Its giant hands flexed, as if in anticipation of tearing her small, frail body apart. Kathleen fell silent, her mind turning inwards. Nothing mattered any more. Alex's horse thundered along the green tunnel of branches that arched over the narrow track. They burst into a broad clearing, and he pulled back on the reins. The powerful animal immediately slowed to a trot, and he felt it breathing heavily underneath him. He looked back to see Adira emerge from the tunnel, smiling broadly, obviously enjoying the competition. He grinned back his mouth forming a quip about her riding prowess. But the breath froze in his chest. A thunderbolt of pain, color, and light crashed down on him, like a physical blow, and he fell backwards from his horse. A face swirled into perspective. The old woman again, the one he'd seen in his dream. Then she'd been on a sunny porch, but now she was wrapped in darkness. She was screaming, he could feel her terror, feel it so strongly it was as though he was right there with her. There was something else there, too, a huge presence hiding in the darkness. A large dog flew through the air, and a terrifying, booming roar sounded all around them. There was blood and pain and fear. The woman screamed again, and this time it was a name, Alex. She knew him, and he knew her his mother. He remembered her now. He remembered lying on a hillside looking down at her. It was her farm. She lived there with the dog, Jess. Then he saw her as a younger woman, smiling at him, combing his hair. He was a boy. And she was his mother, Kathleen Hunter. And it was his name she was calling now, Alex. He was Alex Hunter. He tried to reach out to her, but was condemned to be a powerless observer. The huge presence loomed over her. He felt a surge of frustration and anger. He knew he could save her if he could just reach her. He struck out, thumping the ground, mentally trying to break through the glass. The pain intensified. Blood surged from his nose. Adira leaped from her horse before it had halted and was beside Alex in an instant. His face was contorted in torment, and he was holding out an arm, 
trying to grasp at something only he could see. Adira called his name, softly at first and then more loudly, but he didn't respond. Alex raised himself to his hands and knees, head down, and pounded his fist hard into the dirt, again and again. Adira could feel the blows through the soles of her feet. He raked up dirt and small rocks in each hand, then crushed his fists hard into the ground, reducing the stones to dust. He rose to his knees and roared in agony. Adira had only heard that sound in battle, from humans suffering mortal wounds. She realized he was shouting a woman's name. Kathleen! His mother, she thought in horror. What is he remembering? Alex struck the ground again, as though trying to break through to somewhere below its surface. Blood ran from his nose, and she saw that his teeth were gritted. His eyes were open but unfocused. He fell forward onto his hands and shook his head as if to clear it. He was breathing hard. When he spoke, the words were so soft she couldn't make them out. What, Alex? What is it? His hand shot out and grabbed the front of her shirt, pulling her to face him. His eyes were focused now and volcanic with fury. He roared in her face and shook her. Why did you lie to me? It was the moment she had been dreading. The return of his memories before she was ready, before either of them was ready, to deal with them. She grabbed his wrist. I never lied. Alex's other hand came up towards her. She doubted he was going to hit her, but her training took over. Almost automatically, she brought her free hand around, flat, to strike him under his chin, with enough force to jam his face upwards. He released her shirt and took a step back, but didn't fall. Instead, he came back at her, fast. She needed to slow him down so she could talk to him. She was aware of what he could do if his rage overtook his logic. She braced herself and struck out twice. The closed fist strikes were part of a Krav Maga combination, designed as a fast takedown against the most formidable opponents. Alex took both blows, then swung an arm down to block her next kick. He moved fluidly and special forces fast. His mother's name isn't the only memory coming back to him, Adira thought with growing trepidation. For the first time in her life, she realized she couldn't win. Stop, Alex! He ignored her and yelled again, Who am I? Not one of her punches or kicks landed now. He was in control. His face was furious. You're no hospital worker. Who are you? She backed up, trying to stay out of his reach. Alex, you're still disorientated. You need to... I need the truth! He moved at a speed that left her flat-footed, and before she realized it, he had hold of her again. He brought her face close to his own. I am Alex Hunter. There is no Horowitz. For the last time, who are you? She went to strike out again, but knew it was futile. The game was up. She dropped her arms to her sides and went still in his hands. Let me go. His jaws worked and his eyes burned into hers, but after a few seconds he pushed her away. She took a few steps back, turning away from him so she could think. The voice of her uncle, the general, came to her mind. Sometimes gamblers win. And now I must gamble, she thought. She spun back to him. It's true. You are Alex Hunter, an American soldier. When you were sick, dying, your country abandoned you and we rescued you. I rescued you. We saved your life when everyone else had given up on you. We were close, you and I. You just don't remember. Alex shook his head, frowning. She could tell he was trying to draw more memories from his fragmented mind, 
to verify what she'd told him or to find fault with it. She waited. I need to go, he said. His eyes had lost their fury now. His gaze was level and emotionless. Back to the hotel? She nodded, feeling that perhaps she'd won this round. He shook his head, and a sudden jolt ran through her. You need to go where, Alex? He seemed to think for a moment, then looked directly into her eyes. Home. With you, or through you, and anyone else who tries to get in my way. She held his gaze, her mind working furiously. This was her ground zero moment. If she lost him, she'd lose everything. You'll never make it without me, she said. Chapter 13 Chief Logan sat at his desk, scrolling through the medical examiner's report on the contents of the lion's digestive tract. He was relieved that he didn't have to make a call to Clark and Helen Wilson to tell them that their little girl had been taken by a lion. A freaking lion in Asheville, for Christ's sakes. But he couldn't shake the morbid feeling that something else was out there. There'd just been too many weird goings-on lately. He really wanted to believe that Emma Wilson was still alive, that she'd wandered off after some late-season deer, maybe, and then got lost in the dark, that she was huddled in a sheltered hollow somewhere below the snow line. The reality was, he'd have been satisfied even if they found her small body curled up and frozen solid, proof that she'd gone to sleep in the cold and never woken up. A horrible thought, given the pain her parents would feel, but still better than the crazy alternative that was floating around in his mind. Logan lifted the cover of a folder on his desk and slid out the photos from Amanda Jordan's camera. The hulking shape in the falling snow caused a knotted feeling of disquiet in his gut. Yep, finding little Emma frozen but untouched would not be the worst thing that could happen, he thought again as he closed the folder. The chief sipped his coffee, barely tasting the bitter liquid as his mind continued to work. He had too many questions, and any answers he received only led to more questions. In a month, the snow would start to fall in earnest, and then the winter folk would arrive for skiing, schnapps, and fistfights with the locals. He'd prefer to keep everyone off the mountain until he knew exactly what was going on, but that wouldn't win him any friends in the local business community. Better not take another call from the mayor just yet, he thought glumly, pushing the folder to the back of his desk. He slumped a little lower in his chair. Truth was, he had no idea what to do next. The phone beeped, and he frowned at it for a few seconds before picking it up. Shelley, I thought I said... He stopped as he processed her reply, an urgent call from the field. Right now, he needed any information he could get. He sat forward. Patch it. Logan listened solemnly, his face seeming to age on the spot. Good God, he whispered. Time of death? His voice rose. Just freaking make a guess, then. He closed his eyes. Uh-huh. That's probably after the lion was already dead. Okay, tell Ted Brandon to get his boys out there. I'll be on my way in another twenty minutes. Logan hung up and sat in silence, wishing he had any other job besides the one he held. The phone beeped again, and he lifted the handset slowly to his ear. Chief Logan? Logan was relieved to hear the young professor's voice. He didn't feel ready for anything else from the field right now. Professor Kearns, what can I do for you? I'm a little busy right now. 
Chief, the Wilson place. We were just out there and... Logan felt like being angry with someone. Kearns would do. He cut the man off. What the fuck were you doing out there? We found something. The angry curl of Logan's lips flattened as he waited for the university professor to continue. Some tracks, Kearns added. We know the lion was there, Professor Kearns. No, I mean, yes, we know the lion was there, but these were a different type of print, something strange. You remember the photographs of the shape in the snow up on Black Mountain? Well, we got a connection. Logan pulled the folder back towards him and flicked it open. He tapped the hulking shape with one large finger, thinking. He felt a leaden ball starting to grow in his gut. You there, chief? Logan grunted, and Matt Kearns continued. The friend I mentioned, Charles Schroeder, he specializes in these types of occurrences. He thinks we might have something up here that we need to be... cautious with? Cautious? What does that mean? It's dangerous? Maybe. Probably. Logan thought furiously, weighing up what he knew against what he didn't. The imbalance was too great not to use everything he had at his disposal. Professor Kearns, there's been an attack and a disappearance out at the Hunter place. Might be something else. Strange. I can pick you up out front in ten minutes if you feel like tagging along. Matt felt a sense of déjà vu as he and Charles watched the police forensics team pick over the Hunter place for clues. Just like Emma Wilson, Kathleen Hunter had disappeared. But unlike the Wilson case, which had offered up very little in the way of evidence for the police, this time there were traces of a struggle. It was unlikely that Kathleen Hunter, a woman in her seventies, could have survived that much blood loss. Matt put a hand over his nose and mouth to try to mask the thick, coppery scent lingering in the air. He'd never been to a crime scene before, and at first he tried not to react to the ghastly tableau, detaching himself from its violence, as if it were simply a scene from one of the hundred horror movies he'd watched. But the more he became immersed in the detail, the more nauseated he felt. Matt couldn't help empathizing with the woman, alone and frightened in the night. He'd known terror himself, had seen people he loved brutally killed by a creature that had come out of the Stygian deep. It tormented his dreams to this day. Charles nudged him to get his attention as two police officers carried a stretcher towards their truck. As they came closer, Matt put his hand up to stop them. He lifted the blanket and saw the battered body of an enormous dog. Its eyes had rolled back into its head, and the neck looked soft and boneless beneath the fur. Matt made a sound of regret. Charles made to lay his hand on the dog's muzzle, but one of the officers yelled a sharp rebuke almost directly into his ear. Matt saw his friend flinch, but to his credit he didn't step back. Matt held up his hand again, this time in a placating gesture. It's okay, officers. We're working with Chief Logan. We're consultants. He yelled over the men's heads. Okay, Chief? Logan looked around and seemed to sum up the situation immediately. Give them what they need, boys, he yelled back, then went back to talking to Ted Brandon. Charles lifted his hand to the dog again, and ran his fingers deftly from its head down its back and along its limbs, feeling the bone breaks and joint separations, and inspecting the lacerations. At the flanks he worked his hand slowly back up the body, returning eventually to the head. He examined the snout, then lifted the dog's lips. He quickly brought his face closer, then fumbled in his pocket and pulled out a sample tube, 
and a set of surgical tweezers. Hold this, he said to Matt, and held out the small container without turning, his eyes riveted on whatever he'd found in the dog's mouth. He pulled back the heavy lip and used the tweezers to tug something from between the teeth. He exhaled slowly and turned to Matt, his eyes round with excitement. Look, and some of the dermis is still attached. The tweezers held a small tuft of reddish-brown hair, coarse and bloody. Matt could see the small plug of glistening flesh that bound it together. He uncapped the vial, and Charles carefully dropped the sample in. He pocketed the tweezers, then took the tube from Matt's hand and capped it. He held it up so they could both examine its contents. The hair was unbelievably thick and oily-looking. Charles shook the vial, uncapped it again, and waved it under his nose. He nodded, then extended it for Matt to smell. Matt recoiled from the rank odor. Phew! What is that? Charles didn't answer as he screwed the plastic cap on tightly. We need a lab, pronto, before this degrades. Finished? one of the officers asked, looking bored. Matt stepped closer to the dog on the stretcher and placed his hand on its huge shoulder, stroking the fur. Must have been some fight. Where are you taking it? The officer covered the dog's head with the blanket again to keep away an inquisitive fly. Chief wants an autopsy. He nodded to his partner, then motioned with his head to the truck. Matt yelled after them, Hey, any chance of a lift to the university? The officers dropped Matt and Charles a good mile from the university. Neither complained, however, as the ride had taken place in an uncomfortable silence, Matt's occasional questions eliciting little more than grunts from the two officers. Matt was also glad of the fresh air, the same revolting smell he'd sniffed in the vial emanated from the dog on the stretcher. The two men walked in silence along the university drive. Matt had given up asking Charles about the sample. The most his friend would give him was, not yet. The late-season sunshine was pleasant on Matt's shoulders and coaxed a low zumming from crickets and cicadas in the long grasses beside the road. Matt let his mind wander across the strange events of the last few days. He was worried that he might have got himself and Charles into something a lot more complex and dangerous than he'd originally expected. His stomach tightened. Charles's quiet voice broke his reverie. Ten o'clock. Huh? Matt saw that although Charles was facing forward, his eyes were focused on the field to their left. Don't look, Charles said softly. But of course Matt did. An old man in an oversized blue chambray shirt stood like a withered fence post amongst the long grass. Even from this distance, Matt could see that his roomy eyes were fixed intently on him and Charles. After they'd passed, Matt could still feel the scrutiny like a laser on the back of his neck. He couldn't resist looking back, but the field was empty. He saw that Charles was looking into the deserted field, too. Wonder what that was about, Charles said. Matt shrugged. Forget about it. Come on. But he couldn't forget about it. He'd felt as if the old man's stare had held recognition and a hint of suspicion. Matt looked around the campus to get his bearings. He felt better being back at the university. I figure we need a high-power microscope, access to a computer and the Internet, and possibly a fully functioning biology lab. Oh, yeah, and an assistant or two. Charles looked surprised. I'm impressed. You must really have some pool here. 
Matt sucked in a cheek and shook his head. Unfortunately not. I said we needed that stuff. I didn't say we'd get it. Still, I expect to be on staff here soon, so that's got to count for something. Let's try the nice approach first, and if that fails, I'll invoke the name of the terrifying Chief Logan. Charles grinned. Sounds like a plan. Matt nodded towards an enormous mustard-yellow building on the other side of the quadrangle that towered four stories above its neighbors either side. Zeiss Hall. Wow, nice facilities. This is no backwoods place of learning, is it? Charles seemed amazed at the amount of infrastructure for a relatively small town. Nice facilities, indeed. These guys were teaching molecular biology and robotics 15 years ago. They'll have what we need. We've just got to get access to it. Come on. They moved quickly down a corridor with so highly a polished floor that they experienced the odd sensation of walking on their own reflections. The rooms on either side held banks of computer monitors, electronics equipment, whiteboards sporting literary quotations. Charles jerked to a stop as if reaching the end of a leash. Wow! I mean, really, wow! What is it? Matt backed up. Charles stepped into the unoccupied room. What it is, Professor Matthew Kearns, is an FLX genome sequencer, top of the line, one billion runs, with a gene read length of 1,000 base pairs per run. Hell, I've been trying to get one of these babies at Harvard for two years. You know, you could decode an entire E. coli bacterium's DNA in a single day with this. Matt pulled a face. Holy shit. E. coli. Did anyone else just get a hot flush? Let's go. He turned to leave. Charles grabbed at his arm. No, really, it's important. We can use it to map our sample's DNA back along its maternal line to analyze its comparative evolution. See what it is and where it came from. Matt looked from the machine to his friend's serious face, then nodded. He turned to check the name on the room's door, Professor S. Sommer. This must be the guy we need to talk to. The next room was a large biology lab, filled with long benches, each with a heating element and waste sink every six feet. Peering through the glass of the door, Matt could see the room was ringed by shelves holding all manner of beakers and tubes, and most importantly, computers that were double-cabled into walls, power and Internet access. A woman was typing at one of the computers, her back to them. At the front of the room, writing on a whiteboard, was a tall man with longish silver hair. With his perfectly trimmed beard, half-glasses, neat jacket and corduroy vest, he looked like a central casting version of a professor. Great, and Dumbledore's home as well, Matt whispered to Charles. He pushed open the door and cleared his throat. Professor Summer, I presume? The man turned and looked at them over the top of his glasses, then without a word let his eyes slide slowly past them to the rear of the room. Matt followed his gaze to where the woman who'd been working on the computer now sat with her arms folded, watching him. For a scientist, you make a lot of assumptions, Matthew Kearns, she said. But then again, you always did. She started to thread her way through the tables towards them, pulling off a pair of small glasses as she came, a half-smile at the corner of her mouth. I heard you were in town, and you might be joining us. Matt blinked and frowned for a moment before recognition broke through his confusion. What? Sarah Peterson? You're Professor Summer? Professor Sarah Summer. Summer's my married name. And yes, I run the biology departments at AU, all three of them. This is my assistant, Roger Burroughs. 
Matt turned back to the man, ready to apologize, but Burroughs gave him an uninterested glance and went back to writing on the board. And you are? Sarah held out her hand to Charles. Charles shot his hand out in response. Excuse him, he's not used to social contact. Professor Charles Schroeder, Anthropology, Harvard. A pleasure to meet you, Professor Sommer. Sarah, please, and likewise. She tilted her head. Tell me, you're not the Professor Charles Schroeder who wrote the paper on comparative analysis of early hominids using DNA markers, are you? Matt snorted. Charles shrugged and stood a little taller. Yes, yes, I am. Sarah smiled at him. That analysis was brilliant work. Charles nodded a little too deeply, turning it into a half bow. Matt groaned. Follow me, Sarah said, motioning to the door. She started towards it, Charles in tow. He looked back over his shoulder at Matt and raised an eyebrow. Matt exhaled slowly and followed. As he left the room, he saw Roger Burroughs looking at him over the top of his glasses. This time, he was smiling. Matt felt nervous. She made him nervous. He hadn't seen her since his university days, and here he was trying to impress her all over again. He cleared his throat. We believe what we have here is unique, a tissue sample of an extremely rare creature. We need to examine it at both cellular and genetic level to determine if we're right. If we are, this could be the biggest news since, I don't know, since Noah's Ark. He groaned inwardly as the words came out of his mouth. They sounded bombastic even to his own ears, and he knew he was recklessly inflating something Charles had only hinted at. Sarah folded her arms, one eyebrow raised slightly. Noah's Ark, you say? Charles cut in before Matt could respond. We know that's a little melodramatic, but we do have some indeterminate biological material which leads us to suspect there may be some form of new or very old anthropoid species on the Black Mountain. We'd like to do some lower-level analysis on the sample just to see if we can identify it according to any of the known taxonomic branches. Matt got the drift. Lower the expectations. Go easy on the details for the moment. He put on his most businesslike expression. Charles is right. It might be nothing more than an escaped chimpanzee or some sort of weird-looking ground squirrel, but we promised the police chief we'd do our best to identify it. Sarah's eyebrow went up another notch. Uh-huh. And is this ground squirrel responsible for the recent thefts of cows and domestic pets, or potentially involved in the attacks on the farms recently? There's also a lion loose from the circus, Matt spluttered. That's probably resp— Sarah leaned forward. Lion's dead. The police shot it. Matt slowly turned to Charles. Charles just shrugged and pointed to him with a flat, open hand. Over to you. You're doing great, was the implication. Matt laughed. He shut his eyes for a moment, rubbed them with the thumb and finger, then leaned towards Sarah. Okay. We don't really believe it's a squirrel or fugitive chimp. We think there may be some form of early hominid running around on the mountain, and we'd like to try to determine if it's one we know of or something completely new. Go on. Matt stared at her for several seconds, torn between telling her everything and wanting to hold back on some of their wilder suspicions until they could prove or disprove them. Sarah stared back levelly and the corner of her mouth turned up slightly. Listen up, the pair of you. I've lived in this town for most of my life. 
I love the place, and anything that threatens it or its folk gets my full attention. And one more thing before you start bullshitting. I'm quite a well-respected professor of biology who's pretty highly regarded in the international arena on matters of cellular biology, environmental gene mutations, and a dozen other organic micromatter subjects. Gentlemen, you have two choices. One, you can try and snow me, and you'll be out that door in seconds. Or two, tell me everything, and I may be able to help. She turned from one to the other, looking them each in the eye. Your call, boys. Matt looked again at Charles, who nodded slowly. We need her, he said, her and her sequencer. Matt compressed his lips, then turned to Sarah. Look, there have been stories about something in these mountains for hundreds if not thousands of years. Not just in these mountains, but all over the world. He sucked in a breath and let it out slowly, preparing for her ridicule. We think we may have a tissue fragment from a mega-hominid, a living mega-hominid. He gritted his teeth, waiting for the mocking laughter. Instead, she slid her chair across the floor to her computer and began to type. When she'd found what she was looking for, she half-turned the screen for Matt and Charles to see. As I said, I've lived here for a long time, and I know every creature in these parts, big and small. But in the last few weeks... Well, I've begun to suspect that there's something else out there. Something that doesn't fit. She started typing again. For several years now, we've had microphones placed around the slopes to collect ornithological data for a number of the local societies. But recently, we've picked up something else. She hit a key and adjusted the volume. The booming whoops and grunts were eerie in the small room. Charles sat forward, his mouth open. When it stopped, he leaped out of his chair. Play it again. She hit the replay and folded her arms. I've never heard anything like it, except it reminds me of something at the same time. I just can't place it. Charles turned the computer around, then paused. May I? He didn't wait for a response, just started typing furiously. Listen. From the computer came a series of hoots, whoops, snorts, and grunts. You see, you need a certain shaped larynx without vocal cords to create those sounds, he said to Sarah. Also a heavy jaw and a deep barrel chest. He played the sounds again and swung the screen around for Matt to see. God bless you, Diane Fossey. On the screen was an image of a black mountain gorilla. Its dark, human-like eyes stared out from under a rubber-thick brow ridge. Sarah's frown deepened. You think it's a gorilla up there? Charles smiled and shook his head slowly. No, and not by a million years of evolution. But if it is what I think it is, an escaped lion would have been a lot simpler to deal with and to explain. Chapter 14 The boat glided in towards the beach, and the fishermen leaped out to walk the bow up onto the sand. Adira and Alex picked up their small bags and jumped out. Then Alex turned to help pull the boat clear of the water. It was quiet, save for the tiny waves shushing onto the fine grains of sand. Adira watched as Alex lifted his chin and inhaled the scents of the ocean before scanning the dark shoreline. The little open boat had brought them from Eilat, the southernmost town in Israel, to Taba at the start of the Gulf of Aqaba in Egypt. It had taken only twenty minutes to cross the six miles of glass-like ocean, but the trip had cost one thousand U.S. dollars, 
and there would be much more expense to come. They needed international travel documents, credit cards, and new identities. Adira had a contact in Egypt who was one of the best in the Middle East. He, like the fishermen, was part of the large black market network that operated under the noses of the Israeli and Egyptian authorities. Terrorists used them to get into Israel, and now she was using them to get out. She turned to the waiting fisherman. Shukran, she said, and held out the wad of American notes. His weathered hand reached for it, but she held on tight, causing the old man to frown and look up into her eyes. He grunted. The car will come. It is my cousin, Benu. I trust him. As arranged, he will take you as far as Sharm al-Sheikh at the Red Sea, and then... He shrugged and tugged again on the notes. Adira still held fast, examining his eyes for any deception. She spoke in a low, even tone. If he does not come, then the next time you see me, it will not only be the money I take from you. She let go and the old man nodded, but Adira could see the hint of a smirk on his face. Alex helped push the boat off the sand for its return trip. They both saw the small illumination across the dark water as the old man flipped open a mobile phone and started to talk. Adira's stomach knotted. She couldn't believe the risks she was taking. She always thought any plan through from both a strategic and tactical perspective. It was one of the reasons she had stayed alive so long in Mossad's elite Metzada unit. But her decision to help Alex leave Israel had been made in a state of panic. She knew that in doing so she was betraying her country, her uncle, and everything she'd believed in her entire life. The truth was, the woman beneath the lethal exterior wanted a life with Alex Hunter, no matter how remote a fantasy that seemed. At the same time, she was continuing to betray him and his fragmented memory. He already knew she'd lied to him. What would happen if she were proved a liar again? What of her fantasy about a future together then? It was impossible to know how this crazy plan would turn out. She had to believe that what she was doing was right. She could justify her actions to her country, to her uncle. After all, if she got the answers they wanted about the Arcadian project, then all would be forgiven. In her world, the end always justified the means. Today's unorthodox actions were tomorrow's textbook lessons, as long as they worked. She reached out and gripped Alex's upper arm and squeezed. Come, she said. She was smart. She would work things out. Alex smiled and put his hand on her shoulder, and she felt its warmth on her skin. What I'm doing is right, she thought. Sometimes logic doesn't matter. General Meir Shavit watched the surveillance film of his niece and Alex Hunter buying tickets for the domestic flight from Tel Aviv to Eilat. They'd paid cash, and the available CCTV footage had lost them the moment they left the airport. Shavit knew that given Adira's abilities, it was sheer luck that they had managed to catch her on film at all. Sheer luck or a deliberate tactic? He tapped his chin with a cigarette lighter. Could she have doubled back into the airport and taken another domestic flight? Or were she and Hunter on an international flight to somewhere else in the Middle East, or even beyond? Or maybe they had sailed across into Egypt or Saudi Arabia. Too many options, he thought. He rubbed a hand over his face and looked at the image of his niece. What are you up to, Addy? You think you are in love? You think that because one young man shakes you up, everything you have stood for is now worth nothing? Prove me wrong, Addy, before the walls close in he thought. 
He shook his head and watched the film loop over again. He stopped it and focused in on the young man with her, then gave a long, morose sigh. Adi, if you were with anyone else, I might turn a blind eye and let you run. There was a soft knock on the door. The general's assistant opened it, allowing a tall, dark-haired man to enter. The man saluted and stood at attention. At ease, Salomon, Shavit said. He waved the man to a pair of heavy leather chairs and retrieved a folder from his desk before taking the chair opposite Salomon's. You are well? he asked, smiling. Salomon's back was straight, and he sat uncomfortably in the general's presence. Yes, sir. Shavit nodded and continued to smile. Your Kidon team is available? Salomon shifted slightly, the bulge of muscles playing beneath his suit. All finished up from previous assignments and ready for duty, sir. Good, good. Shavit lit a cigarette, sucked in a deep lungful of smoke, and blew the plume towards the ceiling. His eyes returned to Salomon. I have a small problem. Maybe only a personal one, but it needs urgent, incisive, and delicate action. Shavit handed across the folder and watched as the other man skimmed its contents quickly and professionally. His hands, although large and with heavily calloused knuckles, were nimble. Captain Senesh might be having a breakdown, Shavit added softly. I need you to retrieve her. Salomon's head jerked up from the file. Adira Senesh? Yes, your colleague in Metzara. Shavit motioned at a photograph of Alex Hunter in the file. This man may have corrupted her. Bring her back. Salomon's eyes narrowed as he examined the man in the photograph. It will not be easy. If she does not want to come with us, she will fight. Shavit blew more smoke into the air. Bring her back alive, Salomon. Salomon nodded and put the picture back into the file. What of him if he tries to interfere? Shavit looked at the young man sitting in front of him. Salomon Aitan, head of the Kidon squad, was his secret weapon, his unit the more brutal side of the secretive Mossad machine. Bring him back intact. Alive if possible, but his life is of secondary importance. Read the file in detail, Salomon. It will not be an easy mission. Take your squad, because he may also resist, and he will be a problem. Not for me, Salomon said, and bent his head to continue reading. Chapter 15 The beast threw the body to the ground, then crouched beside it and sniffed. A thousand rich scents filled its nostrils, almost overpowering its sensory system, which had been dulled by years of living and hunting in the dark. It lifted the small, broken creature, testing its weight and fragility. The limbs flopped and the head rolled back on a now boneless neck. The creature held the head up and peered into the bloody face. The eyes had rolled back, so only the whites showed, and the mouth hung open in a silent scream. It reached out with one large, blunt finger, enormous against the prey's small face, and pulled first one pupil down, then the next. It stared, transfixed, into the eyes of the kind that had supposedly driven its people deep into the mountain and imprisoned them there. It snorted. There was nothing to fear from this pitiful creature. The legends must be untrue. The body was old, and its meat would be stringy, but still ambrosia, 
after countless years of living on blind fish, fat grub-like insects and branching lichens. It would make a fitting contribution to the feast to come. Okay, what have we got? Matt asked. Charles and Sarah were working on devices at opposite ends of the laboratory. Charles turned to give Matt an incredulous look, said, Come back in a week, then immediately returned to keying in parameters for his analysis. Matt raised his eyebrows. An hour okay? Deal. Charles rushed over to a spinning centrifuge, switched it off so he could look at the separating residues, made a note on a pad, restarted it, then sped back to his computer. Matt grinned. He knew his friend was trying to do several weeks' work in a few hours all by himself. He also knew he was loving every minute of it. Charles bounced over to the digital microscope that was feeding magnified images onto his screen, then quickly noted data from another computer screen about a slice of the tissue sample that had been fed into the mass spectrometer. While Charles was a turbulent ocean of activity, Sarah, at the other end of the laboratory, was a pool of calm. She lifted her eyes from her own screen and acknowledged Matt with a slight tilt of her head. Matt put his hands in the back pockets of his jeans and sauntered closer. Can I help? She folded her arms, her eyes narrowing in suspicion. Then a small smile lifted the corners of her mouth. I don't know. Can you help me? Her smile widened. And how come you didn't ask Charles if you could help him? He seems to be doing most of the work, and with a lot of unfamiliar equipment. I'm getting my software to do all mine for me. Matt looked briefly over his shoulder at Charles, then back to Sarah. He gave her a sheepish smile. He's more comfortable working by himself. Besides, by helping you, I'm also helping him. See, we're all happy. She laughed and pulled a disbelieving face. Okay, sure. Come around here and I'll show you what I'm doing. Wouldn't hurt to have someone act as a sounding board. I'm your man. Matt moved behind her chair and looked at the split screen. Dense rows of figures rapidly scrolled up the left side. Surprising him, she nodded. Fair question, Matthew. Bottom line is, if you want staying power, stick with a woman. She kept a straight face for a few seconds, then laughed softly, showing a line of near-perfect teeth. Got you, Kearns. Fact is, the paternal mitochondrial DNA is destroyed at fertilization, so the offspring only inherits the mother's mitochondrial DNA, creating an unbroken maternal link to the near and also long-distant past. We can easily track back hundreds of thousands of years, and now, with the new software and the computing power of my FLX, many more again. We've already found that a common ancestor of both modern man and the Neanderthals existed 500,000 years ago. Matt was impressed and let it show. Then he leaned a little closer to her screen, giving the impression of being more interested in it than her answer to his next question. So, Sarah Marie Summer Nay Peterson, how's married life in particular and Asheville life in general? She snorted. Married life is fantastic, the way it's portrayed in the glossy magazines. In real life, well... Ever heard the saying, marriages are made in heaven? No one ever adds the second part, which goes something like this. Marriages are made in heaven, but suffered on a more temporal plane. Basically, once you come down from the heady heights of the champagne and lovemaking and have to deal with the daily routine, illness, fights, and boredom, well, things aren't quite so rosy. She looked up at him and shrugged. Carl was a fantastic guy, 
But one day we both woke up and looked at each other and realized we didn't want to grow old together. I'm sorry to hear that, Sarah. Matt put his hand on her shoulder and tried hard to look sympathetic. Inside, he felt like giving her a high five. What was he like? Carl, I mean. Is he still around? No, his family are Swiss, known as the Basel Sommers, owners of the company that makes sports or wristwatches. Carl's being groomed to take over one day. I met him at a party in New York. He really stood out. Tall, blonde, broad-shouldered, and rich. You know the type. He had a real magnetism about him. Matt snorted. Sounds like a real loser. He regretted the petulant response the instant it left his lips and hurried to add, I mean, for letting you go? Sarah dismissed the flattery with a slight shake of her head. Yeah, well, turned out we did have one thing in common. We both loved Carl Sommer. She half shrugged in an I don't care gesture. Anyway, I've been single four years now, and I love it. I can do what I want, when I want, date who I want. She lifted both her eyebrows at him and smiled, then glanced at Charles. Matt followed the glance, then leaned in close. I'm pretty sure he's already involved and pretty committed. She gave him a mock look of disappointment, then turned back to her computer as it pinged softly. She sat down, started typing, then pinched her lip and frowned as she read the presented data. Charles joined them, a sheaf of printouts in his hands. Okay, I've gone as far as I can, he said. I'm afraid the results are either conclusive or inconclusive, depending on your perspective. He flipped through the pile. Okay, some background and basics first. In most mammals and every hominid except mankind, the outer layer of every cell carries glycoproteins that contain one specific family of sugar molecules called sialic acid. It's actually one of the first tests we run to determine a human, non-human category. Surprisingly, our sample is totally without sialic acid, indicating it came from a human biology. Charles paused to look up at them briefly. But I think we're pretty sure it's not from a human. He raised his eyebrows, then continued reading from his notes. Also, I detected switched-on markers for keratin-41. That's the primary gene for excessive hair growth. This genotype has been switched off in mankind for a quarter of a million years. So we've got a human, or something like a human, but hairy like an ape. Then there's the muscle striation residue. Six times longer than human muscle fiber, but shorter than a great ape's. So our hairy, human-like creature would be six times stronger than a man, assuming it was the same size as a man. He looked at Matt. But we know from its footprint that it's a lot larger, so we're talking one powerful being. There were extremely high levels of pheomelanin and almost non-existent levels of eumelanin in the sample, which basically means we got a fair-skinned redhead. Charles looked up from his notes with a slightly bemused expression. The data analysis goes on like this, one result suggesting a human-based life form, another suggesting an ape-like morphology and biology. If I were asked to summarize the findings, I'd say we have a giant redhead with a biology similar to humans and also similar to great apes, but not identical to either, something in between. Matt could tell Charles was both puzzled by and excited at his results. Snap, Sarah said, clicking her fingers. I found the same variance similarity conundrum. We've got a 98% genetic match to humans, but a 99.1% match to the great apes. Close, but no cigar. Data on the genetic structures gives me results similar to yours, Charles, it's in the same family, but a different species. In fact, a whole different branch of hominids, I think. If I were asked to summarize, gentlemen, 
I'd say you've got a potential whole new line, or a very old one that we don't have any living evidence of. Sarah walked over to a whiteboard, picked up a marker, and waggled it in her fingers as she considered where to begin. She divided the board into three sections, prosimians, monkeys, apes. Under the apes heading, she divided again, this time into four, orangutans, gorillas, chimpanzees, man. She tapped the word orangutans and turned to Charles. I'm betting that's where your gene for red hair originated, Professor Schroeder. More arrows and names went on the board, forming a detailed family tree divergence model, showing where the different species branched off from one another. Down the side, Sarah drew a timeline. Chimps and mankind separated around seven million years ago. That root species and the gorillas separated about another two to three million years before that. Now, she picked up a different colored marker and drew a line between the gorillas, orangutans, and man. Okay, this is what I believe we have. A whole new species that sits somewhere here on the evolutionary line. Something that probably should have died out hundreds of thousands or millions of years ago. She put down the pen and turned to Matt and Charles. Something that modern man hasn't seen for a very, very long time, if ever. She narrowed her eyes. Come on, guys, you're holding something back. What exactly are we dealing with here? Matt turned to Charles and grinned, then motioned for him to proceed. Charles reached into his pocket and pulled out a small, polished wooden box, which he placed on the table between Matt and Sarah. He didn't open it. Sarah folded her arms. So what is it? My grandfather gave this to me when I was eight years old, Charles said. It was given to him by his brother, the original Charles Schroeder, who went missing in China in the mid-1930s. It was the trigger for my great-uncle's obsession, one that perhaps killed him, and it's been driving my own love affair ever since I received the gift. Charles opened the box, but its contents were obscured by a black cloth. Sarah squinted. What is it? Something almost magical. Such treasures are usually sold by the Chinese farmers who find them on their land to apothecaries in the mainland cities or Hong Kong. Julong de Yachi, translated as dragon's teeth. Most often they're ground up and used as medicine for everything from insomnia to improved sexual performance. My great-uncle came across this in a shop in Kowloon in 1935 and sent it back to my grandfather. Charles unfolded the cloth to reveal a large, off-white tooth. He looked up into Sarah's face. Not a dragon's tooth, but one belonging to Gigantopithecus, the largest hominid ever to have existed on Earth. Growing to nearly ten feet in height, twelve to fifteen hundred pounds, omnivorous. These things were big, smart, and aggressive, and for a time they were probably living side by side with Homo sapiens. He paused. Well, maybe. The sad fact is Homo sapiens probably killed them off. Can you imagine the look on some early Homo sapiens' face when he came across some pissed-off creature nearly twice his height who ate meat? I'm pretty sure I'd want it out of my neighborhood as well. Sarah picked up a pencil and used it to move the tooth around in the box. It's enormous. Did your great uncle find any other evidence? Charles shook his head. We don't know. He disappeared. The last message he sent was from a small town called Daxin in southern China. He was heading out the next morning to see some huge rock tower riddled with limestone caves. One cave in particular, apparently. A climb of about a hundred feet straight up. My grandfather sent a party to look for him, but the villagers wouldn't talk about him or even take the search party up to the caves. They said the place was haunted. 
My grandfather thought dear old Charlie had been robbed and killed and his body hidden. But no one really knows. Matt carefully lifted the almost perfect, tusk-like tooth free of the box and tested its weight in the palm of his hand. He nodded to Charles. I know you're right. This has got to be it. Charles gave a half-smile, took the tooth from Matt and held it up at eye level, then raised it way above his head, indicating the height of its original owner's mouth. He couldn't know that the previous Charles Schroeder had done exactly the same thing around eighty years earlier. Anyway, at the time that these rare and fantastic creatures were supposed to have died out, Charles said, the last of the land bridges across Asia and the far north still existed. What if Gigantopithecus was forced to move somewhere without so many little hostile homo sapiens? What if they learned to stay as far away from us as they could, in remote jungles, high on mountain peaks, in inaccessible valleys? Some humans have seen them, but generally they're dismissed as legends. But what if they're not? What if what we're dealing with here is a living fossil, a living Gigantopithecus? Sarah was shaking her head, but her eyes were shining. But how? I mean, really, how? Even if we suspend our disbelief for a moment and say that maybe these creatures have been secretly living amongst us, no, sorry, not amongst us. I mean living contemporaneously in our most remote and inaccessible places. Wouldn't we have at least seen some sign? A portion of a body that's been discovered? A bone fragment, a rib, or a tooth that's not fossilized? Charles snorted softly and carefully placed the tooth back in the box. He smiled as he looked from Matt to Sarah. As rare as a black swan? There was a saying in 16th century England that a good person was as impossible to find as a black swan. The idea being that swans could only be white. Well, you know what the English found when they traveled to the west coast of Australia. The swans there were all black. He laughed at their bemused expressions. I know, I know. You're right, Sarah, there should be some remnant of these things, and I certainly don't have all the answers. However, I do have a theory. But consider this first. What I'm suggesting is not that fantastic, when you consider the amazing things we've found just in the last few decades. There's even a scientific name for these kinds of discoveries. Lazarus Taxon. Go on, Google it. It covers things that we thought were extinct for millennia. And I'm not talking about insignificant little gastropods or rainforest orchids. These things can be giants. Charles ticked them off on his fingers. In a hidden valley in Australia, they found a tree called the Wallamai Pine. It was supposed to have been extinct for 90 million years. Then there's the coelacanth, the limbed fish. That little baby was meant to have been dead and gone for about 360 million years until scientists found that the Pacific Islanders were eating it all the time. It wasn't rare to them at all. Do you know how many missing prehistoric tribes we find every decade? Dozens. On the Brazil-Peru border, hidden under the dense tree canopy, were the Murunahua. They tried to fight off the helicopters with bows and arrows. And I'm not surprised. Once modern man barged in on them, they were nearly wiped out by colds in the first two years of contact. He clapped his hands. And I can't begin to describe some of the strange things that are turning up now that we're doing more deep-sea drill mining in the abyssal zones of the ocean trenches. Matt was nodding. He didn't need to be convinced about biological anomalies. Beneath the Antarctic ice, he'd seen things that shouldn't have existed anymore but we're very much alive, aggressively so. He looked at Sarah. She was nodding too, but a slight frown still pulled her brows together. Maybe these things just hadn't been formally discovered or identified before, she said to Charles. 
You mentioned you have a theory about why we haven't seen any specimen fragments or more recent term fossils of Gigantopithecus? Charles pursed his lips. Two things. Firstly, it's the rarity, the exclusive rarity. He pinched his bottom lip, as though looking for a place to start his explanation. They remain hidden out in the open for long, so it was the caves that got me thinking. My great-uncle disappeared on a caving expedition, presumably looking for the source of this fossil. He gestured to the tooth. We find new caves all the time, and often we also find weird things living within them. The deep darkness hides a lot of prehistory secrets. Too right, Matt said, then looked embarrassed that he'd spoken the thought aloud. Sorry, carry on. Secondly, intelligence, Charles said. If we combine what we know about the Gigantopithecus fossils being found in caves and what we've recently been discovering about the ways proto-Neanderthals used to bury their dead deep in caves, well, we now believe, in fact, that they used to hide them. So what if these giant hominids had similar ceremonies? They were rare to begin with, but if they also bury their dead deep in the earth, or even, as with certain tribes, eat their dead, then we've been lucky to find any fossil evidence at all. He looked at Matt's and Sarah's expressions and grimaced slightly. Yeah, I know it's a stretch. These things are more likely to be about as smart as gorillas, prehistory's answer to the gentle giant. They were probably wiped out by more modern and aggressive hominids, namely us. Sarah didn't answer. Instead, she stared at the tooth in the box, and a slow smile started to spread across her face. Okay, so we think we know what it could be, but we're a long way from being able to convince anyone else, she said. But there is one way we can be sure. She walked quickly to the rear of the laboratory and searched through a few bench drawers, then returned with something that looked a little like an electric toothbrush without the bristles. She placed it on the table so its shining tip was pointing at the box with the tooth in it. It was a bone drill, and Matt knew exactly what she wanted to do with it, make a hole in the tooth. The rare fossil that Charles had inherited from his grandfather's dead brother and treasured since he was eight, the tooth that had been the trigger for Charles's entire career. Ouch, he mouthed, and looked at his friend. What do you have in mind? asked Charles. He didn't go bananas. Matt thought, that's got to be a good thing. Sarah put her slim fingers on each side of the small box. Teeth don't denature as fast as normal bones do. The enamel and dentin are extremely resilient to penetration of groundwater and therefore mineralization. We've extracted viable DNA from the dried pulp of a 130,000-year-old mastodon tooth, We've got the DNA technology right here to fill in any missing base pair blanks. I can match the tooth and the organic sample's DNA in a few hours. Irrefutable proof. You just say the word. Charles pinched his lower lip again, thinking. Then he smiled. Word. The old man kneeled in a clearing on the outskirts of town. Before him loomed the black mountain, its peak shrouded by freezing cloud. His eyes moved along the horizon, tracing the rise and fall of the other dark peaks, before he bent to light the small fire he'd built from sticks collected nearby. Once the fire had taken, he opened a sack and drew out a handful of feathers, nettles, and powder. He sprinkled them onto the flames, each causing the tongues of fire to burn a different hue. Lastly, he placed a single bone across the burning twigs. He swore softly and quickly changed its position so the broken tip pointed at the mountain peaks. The old man got slowly to his feet and chanted in a strong voice over the flames, pointing with a flat hand to each of the peaks, 
finishing with the tallest, the dome. He threw another handful of powder at its hidden summit, then stood silently for a moment. When he was done, he hoisted the bag onto his shoulder and set off for his next destination. There were more fires to be lit before the spirit barrier might have a chance of holding, and he could feel the town was secure. As he walked, he heard a deep whooping noise far off in the distance. Chapter 16 Alex and Adira had time on their hands while they waited for their documents to be produced. Adira wanted them to stay indoors and undercover, but the sun-filled sky, the ocean, and the golden sands of Hosa Beach across the road were too much for Alex. He needed to be outside. And even though Adira refused to be convinced it was a good idea, she relented. Alex spent hours in the water, diving below the warm surface, opening his eyes as he swam, enjoying the clarity of the Red Sea. Adira never joined him, preferring to remain on the beach as lookout. But was she his guardian or his supervisor, he wondered. He ran a hand through his short hair, shaking out the water, and sat beside her on the towel, exhaling contentedly. Beautiful, he said, gazing along the shoreline. Adira lifted one edge of the towel and dried his back, then leaned forward to kiss his cheek. He smiled, looking into her dark eyes. He wanted to trust her, but wasn't sure he could any more. A prickling sensation at the back of his neck caused him to turn to look at the promenade. The small cafes there did a busy trade, selling sodas, ice creams, and coffee. He frowned as the crowds of men, women, and children seemed to slow, as if time itself was stretching. And then he saw the explosion in his mind, a second before it actually occurred. He threw himself over Adira on the sand, just as one of the busiest cafes was engulfed by an ear-shattering orange ball that opened like a giant boiling flower. Debris and body parts blew outward, and splintered wood shot overhead in a wave of hot air mixed with blood and small gobbets of flesh. Wreckage rained down around them, remnants of people whose laughter and dreams were now shredded and burning. Screams and moans filled the air. Alex stared at a small red-black puddle soaking into the sand beside him, and the ache in his head intensified and turned to a clenched fist of pain. Anger surged inside him as he realized it wasn't over yet. No sooner had the debris settled on the ground before gunfire rang out over the top of the screaming and the wail of the sirens and alarms set off by the explosion. Four men burst from a van at the head of the promenade, huge packs strapped to their backs, their faces concealed by black and white kefias. They dashed along the promenade, yelling and firing their weapons. Any surviving men were shot. The women and children were dragged towards one of the major hotels along the seafront. Alex stood up, incredulous at how the calm and beauty of the beach had turned into a hellish maelstrom in seconds. The aggressors fired in all directions as they pulled their captives up the hotel steps. Two Egyptian policemen opened fire with their pistols, but had little chance against men carrying modern assault rifles, spewing 800 rounds per minute. Hurrah! Adira cursed. Kebar rifles! Must be Hazar Jihadi! Come on! She jumped to her feet, grabbed Alex's arm, and dragged him with her. They sprinted along the sand, Adira intent on getting them out of the danger zone. Panicked tourists ran in all directions, many falling as machine gun fire raked their sun-bronzed bodies. The air was filled with the scent of military-grade explosives and the baked copper scent of burnt blood. An inflatable boat roared into the shore, beaching itself in front of the remaining terrified civilians. More attackers leaped out, 
two of them carrying rocket-propelled grenade launchers on their shoulders. They started up the beach towards the hotel. It was a pincer assault, professional, planned, and coordinated. One of the terrorists came upon a man, obviously wounded, lying next to a woman who was sprawled lifeless on a beach towel. The man was shielding a child. Alex could see her small body huddled beneath him, hands clasped over her ears, her face pressed into a towel. The terrorist screamed something and raised his weapon at the man's chest. At such close range, the bullets would easily travel through the man's frame and into the body of the child he was trying to protect. Alex yelled and pulled free of Adira's grasp. Close by were the broken remains of a beach umbrella, its two-inch thick shaft sawn off by gunfire. Alex drew the spike from the sand and threw it with all his strength. The rigid pole with its steel tip traveled the fifty feet to its target almost faster than the human eye could follow. It struck the terrorist in the neck, continued through flesh, cartilage, and bone, and landed the same distance again down the beach. The terrorist remained upright for a second, daylight visible through the large hole in his neck. Then his arms dropped to his sides, his knees buckled, and his lifeless body fell sideways to the sand. Alex looked from the fallen man to his hand, wonder on his face. More gunfire brought his attention back to the attackers racing up the beach. The two men with the rocket launchers had already made it to the hotel foyer, but a third man had stopped to look back at his dead comrade. His dark eyes, visible between the layers of cloth wrapped around his face, widened first in disbelief, then with a volcanic fury. Alex's fists balled, his own anger building. It surged through him like a wave of energy. Without realizing it, he took a step forward. Not here! Adira screamed into his ear. Her words penetrated the red mist that was starting to cloud his vision and reason, and he saw her logic. An unarmed man in bathers was no match for professionals carrying modern gas-powered automatic assault rifles. Alex grabbed Adira and sprinted to the cover of the promenade and the shelter of the side streets, roughly pushing her in front of him, ignoring her protests. They dodged flying projectiles that sped past like deadly metal wasps, but as they leaped from the sand to the concrete walkway, Alex felt a thud on his shoulder. He staggered and grunted in pain, but kept going until they'd rounded a corner. There he let go of Adira and pressed his body up against the wall. The yelling from the front of the hotel receded as the remaining terrorists disappeared inside the large marble foyer. Adira peered back around the corner, then turned to Alex with anger creasing her face. She wrenched his body away from the wall to look at the hole in his shoulder. A blood smear stained the white stonework. Ah, you're hit. The blood flow slowed but didn't stop. Alex could feel the projectile embedded in the meat of his deltoid muscle. He knew it needed to come out or the wound wouldn't close. A single muffled shot rang out, this time from inside the hotel, higher up. He angled his head to look at the upper balconies. Adira put her hand on his chest and pushed him back against the wall. No, Alex, you must not even think it. We can't afford to get caught up in this. Not here, not now. Our documents must be ready by now. We need to leave. Get out. He shook his head slowly. I can't. You know I can't. I need to help those people. He gently took her wrist and moved her hand away. I think this is who I am, and I know what I have to do. You go back to the room. I'll be there soon. Adira stood close to him, examining his face. He could tell her mind was working furiously, probably thinking of ways to dissuade him from getting involved. She clenched her hands into fists, and muttered something in Hebrew through gritted teeth. After another second, she said with a deadly calm, I'm coming with you. Alex nodded and said, Good. 
then scanned the street. He picked up a glass soda bottle from the ground and, holding it by the neck, shattered it against the wall. He handed the jagged top part to Adira. Get the bullet out. Adira didn't flinch. She took the piece of glass, then pushed him around so he faced the wall. Lift your arm slightly. That's it. Now hold it. She dug the glass into his flesh and twisted hard. After a few seconds of agony for Alex, the large bullet popped free and clattered to the ground. Alex immediately felt a tickling sensation as the skin around the wound knitted together. Amazing, he thought, and rotated his arm. Thanks, he told Adira and grinned. You've got a delicate touch. He walked to the edge of the building and peered into the now deserted street. Bodies and debris lay where they had fallen. A few seagulls had returned to pick through the destruction. Alex hoped they were scavenging food from the destroyed stalls, not feeding on their former customers. Let's go, he said without turning. Staying close to the hotel's facade, Alex and Adira moved quickly towards the magnificent marble foyer. On the way, Adira retrieved the fallen policeman's handguns. She expertly checked the clips and offered one to Alex. Berettas, nine millimeter. Both clips nearly full. Small, but they'll do. Alex shook his head, so she kept both for herself. Alex concentrated on the doorway. The sliding glass doors had been wedged open in the blast. He focused on the darkened opening, blanking out the surrounding sounds of the ocean and occasional shriek from inside the hotel. He sensed a man hidden behind the reception desk, armed and ready, his mind calm and cold. It was probably the terrorist team's lookout and first line of defense. Alex backed away and breathed into Adira's ear. Man behind the desk. Adira made a sound in her throat. As expected, the rest will be rigging explosives to themselves, their hostages, and perhaps their surroundings. You saw their full backpacks? One word from this man and they could detonate everything. She looked around, then shook her head. The Egyptian police will be here soon. Leave it to them. We must not be seen. Muffled gunfire came from the third floor. We can't go in the front without starting a firefight, Alex said. And they're the ones with the big caliber guns and backup. He looked up along the roof line of the three-story building and then towards its rear. They didn't have much time. Adira was right. The Egyptian police would arrive soon, and they'd cordon off the entire block so no one other than their negotiators could go in or out. He turned to look at Adira. He could see she was angry, as much with him as with the terrorists he suspected. But she was armed and ready to do as he asked of her. We have time, he said. It's still early in their operation, and we have one element in our favor. They won't be expecting someone from above, or not yet anyway. It's our and the hostages' only chance. You neutralize the lookout while I... She shook her head furiously. No, where you go, I go. Alex put his hand softly on her shoulder. Her skin was still warm from the sun. You need to neutralize this guy, then meet me on the third floor. We'll come at them from both angles. I'll signal you when I'm in. Adira's eyes burned into him, and he could see her jawline was rigid. She looked ready to swear at him, but instead said, what signal? You'll know it. He bent and kissed her lips. She said something softly in Hebrew, but he didn't understand. He jogged to the rear of the building and turned to see her crouch behind an enormous Mercedes-Benz for cover. He knew that she'd only given in temporarily. Signal or not, he guessed she'd walk in the front door, guns blazing, within the next few minutes. Adira Sinesh made her own rules. 
At the back of the hotel, tables and chairs stood around the sides of an enormous kidney-shaped swimming pool. Scattered towels, sunglasses, and spilled drinks attested to the speed with which the holidaymakers had either scattered or been rounded up following the initial assault on the hotel. Alex picked up a large towel, threw it over his shoulder, and spotted a pair of oversized sunglasses. As he was about to grab them, he noticed a man in wet bathers hiding in a hedge of young ornamental olive trees. Yours? Alex asked. The man nodded jerkily. Can I borrow them? Another nod. Alex tucked the sunglasses into the waistband of his swimming trunks, then examined the building's structure. Drain pipes and window ledges gave plenty of handholds, and within a few minutes he stood on a third-floor balcony, peering into an expensively furnished room through a fine gauze curtain. Alex opened the balcony door and moved quickly across the empty room to the main door, intending to put his ear to it to get a sense of what was happening beyond it. However, as soon as his fingers touched the wood, a series of images unfolded in his mind, like watching a movie, except here his hypersenses were the camera. A corridor led to an enormous room at the front of the hotel with a view of the beach. This was where the terrorists had herded their captives. A single armed man patrolled the corridor, checking rooms and windows. Alex leaned his forehead against the wood of the door and concentrated harder. He could hear faint screams and the thud of bodies falling. The image sharpened, and he realized that the attackers were separating the men from the women and children. If they held them in different rooms, his task would be all the more difficult. There was no more time. Alex needed to be inside that room right now. He lifted the towel to his head, as if drying his hair after a shower, took a deep breath, and pulled open the door. The terrorist on patrol spun towards him, his eyes wide and nervous. Alex could tell he was young, his beard barely a few wisps on his cheeks, perspiration dampening his kefia. Surprise kept him from speaking at first, but then he began to scream at Alex, raising his gun towards him. Alex dropped the towel, raised his hands, and yelled, Francais! Francais! packing as much fear as he could into the word. He saw that the young man's gun was shaking. This was the unknown factor in the plan. If the terrorist pulled the trigger, it was all over. But if he decided Alex was no threat... Alex stooped to make himself smaller and made his raised hands tremble. He kept his eyes wide and fearful. The terrorist moved cautiously towards him, then drove the barrel of his gun into Alex's stomach. Alex doubled over, and the youth grabbed him by the hair and pulled his head back. He was grinning now. Holiday over for you, monsieur, he hissed in Alex's ear. He dragged Alex to his feet and shoved him towards the large doors at the end of the corridor. He turned the door handle and kicked him roughly inside. At first, Alex's arrival was greeted with startled silence, and then the yelling began. The four terrorists in the room pummeled him on the back and shoulders with their guns, kicked his ribs, and screamed at him in a language Alex didn't understand. Their anger had a hard and brutal edge, either because Alex had somehow been missed during their search of the hotel, or simply because their taut nerves needed an outlet. Pain blossomed deep inside Alex's head, not from the blows, but from something within him struggling to break free. He suppressed it and tried to concentrate on gathering information while he could. Down on his hands and knees, he glanced around. The women and children were on one side of the room, sitting cross-legged, hands on heads. The men were on the other side, same position, but their faces showed signs of brutality. A side door was open, and Alex could just make out the pile of bodies inside the room. Perhaps the terrorists had executed a few of their captives as a warning to the others to behave. It had obviously worked, 
as the thirty or so captives sat mute and unmoving, barely even glancing over to where the terrorists were beating Alex. One of the men grabbed him by the hair and dragged his head upwards. Alex went with it, upright onto his knees. He needed to see what he was dealing with. He took it all in within a few seconds. The bad news was that every man was armed with an Iranian K-bar rifle, gas-rotating, automatic, and powerful. No aging AK-47s for this group. They must be well-financed. Two RPG-27 Tavolga grenade launchers, expensive Russian disposables. One was mounted at the window. The other was leaning against the wall. Worse, all the men were wearing bomb belts with enough C4 to blow off the top of the hotel. Near the wall, a table was piled with spare ammunition clips for the machine guns. This was a siege armory. Details about the weaponry flooded Alex's mind. The firing rate per second, projectile velocity, jamming potential. He didn't pause to wonder how he knew. He just processed the information and was glad for it. Three things in particular would inform his action plan. One, the ignition switches for the terrorists' bomb belts were wireless handhelds, which were still on the table beside the ammunition, not yet activated and bound to the men's arms. Two, the C4 packets were stamped with the letter T, meaning they were a tannerite mix and could be high-velocity detonated. And three, he had arrived in time. None of the hostages had yet been strapped with explosives. In his peripheral vision, he saw a gloved fist being raised. There was laughter as the punch came down hard on his cheek. He dropped to the floor again. He heard a whimper and looked across the room to see a small girl surreptitiously watching him, her face streaked with tears of terror. She had obviously seen what had happened to other people the attackers didn't like. He tried to smile at her, wanting her to understand that he'd be okay, that she would be okay. But whatever was building inside him was screaming to be released, and he couldn't make his mouth do what he wanted. Someone grabbed the towel draped around his neck, tightened it, and used it to pull him upright again. Alex had all the information he needed now, and came to his feet, smiling. The man who was obviously the leader of the small group, furious at Alex's indifference to the brutal treatment, screamed at him so loudly that spittle flecked Alex's cheeks. He drew a handgun from his holster and backhanded Alex across the face with it. Alex shut his eyes as the savage blow caught him on the cheekbone. Its force should have been enough to fell the largest of opponents, or at least to shatter his jaw. But Alex opened his eyes and smiled. It was not a smile of mirth or pleasure. It was cold and hinted at vengeance and a promise of retribution. The leader's own satisfied smile became a scowl. Qui êtes-vous? he hissed in thickly accented French. Who are you? Alex responded in English, without thinking, and without knowing where the words came from. I am Alex Hunter, the Arcadian. The beast inside him tore free from its chains at the same moment as the leader lifted the gun to point it at Alex's face. American! he screamed in a hate-filled voice and pulled the trigger. Chapter 17 Alex's body seemed to switch to a different physical plane. His heartbeat sped up, and waves of natural steroids and adrenalines flooded his system, combining with the synthetic chemicals already embedded in the flesh and bones of his body. People screamed and rushed about, but to Alex, it was as if they were moving through an atmosphere as thickly viscous as honey. He sensed the pressure exerted on the trigger of the gun pressed into his forehead, and was out of the way of the muzzle flash before the bullet had even exited the barrel. He grabbed the gunman's wrist, twisting the gun from his grasp, then flung him towards the large window at the front of the apartment. 
As the man smashed through the glass and sailed out into the air, Alex emptied the gun of its bullets into the crowded packets of explosive circling the man's waist. The effect was devastating. Adira could hear sirens in the distance. She couldn't wait any longer. She had to go in now. She drew in a slow breath and spoke a small prayer to calm herself. As she was about to leave cover for the foyer, both handguns up and ready, there was a crash from above. She looked up at the hotel's third floor and saw a body falling from the window. Immediately, two shots rang out and the figure detonated in midair, obliterated by an orange and red bloom. The head sailed through the air towards the beach. Guess that's my signal, Adira thought, and pressed herself back around the corner to avoid the debris of the explosion. She wondered if whoever was up on the third floor had been prepared for the shrapnel that blew back through the balcony windows. She sprinted to the hotel's front doors and didn't pause as she entered the foyer. As she'd hoped, the lookout had ventured out from behind the desk to investigate the explosion. Perhaps it had come earlier than he'd expected, or he hadn't expected it at all. His head jerked around towards Adira, and his eyes widened. She knew her outfit, a bikini and the two handguns, was distracting. By the time he'd pulled his gaze away from her firm breasts and taut belly, the twin muzzles of the small black pistols were pointed at his face. The hostages in the room were already low on the ground and in no danger from the C-4 blast wave. Alex dived to the ground himself as the wave began to move outwards, but only two of the three remaining terrorists had the reflexes to do the same. The standing man only had time to throw up an arm before a dark swarm of hot metal hornets had flung him backwards and shredded his frame. His black and white kefia rapidly turned a dark red, and his body left a wet streak on the wall as he slid down it. Alex looked over at the hostages. Most were frozen in shock, but they would be okay for now. He turned to deal with the remaining terrorists. One had sprinted from the room into the corridor, and Alex heard his footsteps change as he entered the stairwell. The other made a lunge for the upturned weapons table and the bomb detonators strewn on the floor, then lifted his gun to fire indiscriminately into the group of hostages. Alex screamed in rage as he heard bullets hit the soft flesh of the women and children. He launched himself at the man and drove him into the wall with his shoulder and felt his ribs break. When he lifted him, he saw that he'd brought his gun around, but not to shoot at Alex. Instead, he was aiming at the belt of explosives circling his waist. Alex grabbed the man's wrist and twisted it hard. The splintering bone could be heard throughout the room. Alex drew back his fist and delivered a blow to the man's head that shattered his eye socket and depressed his cheekbone. As he drew back for a second punch, he heard a child wailing behind him. He turned briefly to see the little girl who had been so fearful for his own safety, now crying in horror at his ferocious behavior. Alex's eyes locked on the girl's face, and his fingers loosened to let the man drop. A voice stopped him. Its words were indistinct, but he recognized it somehow, even though he didn't know where from. His grip on the man tightened again, and he frowned. The voice came again, this time clearer and more urgent. You'll kill them all if you let him go. As he hesitated, a furious scream sounded in his mind. Kill him! He turned away from the girl and dragged the semi-conscious man out through the door. In the hallway, he held his limp body against the wall, set his teeth, and drew his fist back. This time the final blow landed, causing plaster to rain down on the hostages inside the room. Adira heard an amplified, calm Egyptian voice floating up from the street outside. The police had arrived and had immediately commenced their negotiations. 
Meanwhile, their snipers were undoubtedly in position. She avoided the lift in case it had been booby-trapped and headed for the stairs, now armed with only one gun. It still had a full clip. She went lightly up two floors before freezing. Rushed steps came from above, a single heavy body coming down fast. She tucked the Beretta into her swimsuit and waited. If it was an escaped guest, she'd stay out of their way. If not, she balanced on her toes and waited. The barrel of his gun came first, then the flapping kefia, framing wide, panicked eyes. Hezar Jihadi. Adira flicked out a hand and jerked the barrel of his machine gun upwards, immediately following with the flat-handed strike up under his chin that knocked him backwards. He hit the ground hard, and she moved quickly to stand over him, disgust and loathing written all over her face. So many of her people had been shot in the back, blown up or had their throats slit in the night by these creatures. She pulled her gun free, smiled grimly, and pointed at her chest. Israeli, she told him in Arabic. She knew he saw the small blue star tattooed on the skin between the thumb and forefinger of her gun hand. He quickly pulled free his own handgun, but she was far faster. She fired without even blinking. The bullet shattered both the bones in his forearm, causing him to drop his weapon. She stepped over him, indifferent to his agony, and leaned towards his face. How many are you? He swore at her, calling her a whore, cursing her family, her country, and anything else that came to his pain-filled mind. Her response was another bullet, this one in his left thigh, skillfully avoiding the femoral artery but puncturing the large quadriceps muscle. She asked again and received the same response. She repeated her own response, but in his other thigh. She put her bare foot on the new wound and pressed down. I have plenty more bullets, she said with a deadly smile. This time she aimed at his groin. Alex heard the shots and leaped down the flight of steps, his feet hardly touching the floor. He found Adira standing over the corpse of the last terrorist. The man's body was riddled with bullet wounds, including one in the center of his forehead. He knew now that Adira was a soldier, but her brutality surprised him. Perhaps this was the real Adira Senesh. Find out anything? he asked. She shook her head, and Alex wondered if she'd even tried. He listened for a moment, blocking out the police negotiators and sirens outside. Except for the struggling of the hostages upstairs, the hotel was silent. For Adira to have got this far, the man in the foyer must already be dead. The terrorist at their feet was the last. Time to go, he said. Adira nodded and dropped the Beretta on top of the corpse. The ground floor of the hotel was suddenly boiling with activity as police, forensics, and Egyptian SWAT teams examined every inch of the building. The hostages were brought down from the third floor and escorted out of the hotel with towels draped over their heads to protect them from the media's relentless gaze. This suited Adira and Alex perfectly. Towels over their heads, they mixed in with the crowd of battered and scared people stumbling into the glare of the local television news station's halogen lamps. Adira pulled her towel a little lower over her face. The sunlight coupled with the artificial lighting was almost blinding. She tensed as one of the policemen lifted Alex's towel to look at him briefly. The police were alert to any surviving terrorists attempting to slip out with the freed captives. Alex's face was still bruised and his upper body coated in dried blood, just like many of the male hostages. His gray-green eyes were enough to clear him of suspicion, but Adira cursed inwardly nonetheless. She hoped the momentary exposure of Alex's face 
hadn't been picked up by any of the cameras focused on them. As soon as the policeman waved them on, she grabbed Alex's arm and pulled him past the medical teams, not letting go until they were back at their safe house. They'd waited long enough. They'd go directly to the black market forgers for their documents and be out of Egypt within the next few hours. General Mayor Shavit listened in silence as Salomon called in the incident. A terrorist attack at an Egyptian Red Sea hotel, which had been thwarted by one of the hotel's patrons. Impossible. Unless... Some of the hostages thought the man was a guest, Salomon said. They heard him speak French, but others believed he was American. And there's something you should see. It should be coming through now. Shavit grunted as his computer pinged. The news clip was attached to an email with the subject line, Observe from minute 000235. He opened it, skipped forward to the recommended time, then let it play. He paused the film when a police officer lifted the towel from the face of a man accompanied by a brown-skinned, athletic-looking young woman. It was almost impossible to see the man's face without digital enhancing, but Shavit didn't need to. They are your targets. Where are you now, Salomon? We're already on our way. Good, good. They will need documentation, so talk to the local forgers. Be as insistent as you need to be. I want this resolved quickly. We'll be there within the hour. Shavit hung up and looked at the large map of the Middle East that dominated one wall. His eyes ranged across Egypt's borders, the Mediterranean to the north, Saudi Arabia, Libya, Sudan. The sub-Saharan countries were not safe by any means, but their airlines carried out very little screening of passengers, and their officials were amenable to corruption. Still too many options, he thought. He turned back to his computer and played the clip again from the beginning, this time listening intently to the hostages' descriptions of the carnage the lone man had wrought upon the terrorists. A madman, insanely powerful, he had a monster inside him, said a small girl with a tear-streaked face. Shavit rubbed his forehead. What have you got yourself into, Adi? He sat back and closed his weary eyes. Good luck, Salomon, he thought. News of the thwarted terrorist attack was beamed into millions of living rooms and workplaces around the world. Most viewed the report with mild indifference. Such attacks were so commonplace that only the most savage held the general public's attention for more than a few moments. But there were other eyes that watched, eyes that missed nothing as they scanned thousands of images per second, looking for signs, patterns, faces, anything that might be of interest to their employers. The towel had been lifted from Alex's face for only a second, but it was enough for his features to be digitized, matched, and identified. A notification signature was sent out. The Arcadian had been found. That son of a bitch! I knew it! Captain Robert Graham leaned back from the surveillance loop he was watching in the empty lab office and thought for a minute. He had personally requested that the Arcadian subject be placed on the global watch list. He hadn't known why. It was just a gut feeling. After all, Alex Hunter was dead. Now he remembered the soldier's amazing physiology and recuperative powers, and Jack Hammerson's close bond with the man. There was no way the Hawk commander would have incinerated his best soldier without trying everything in his power to save him. Graham could see now that Hammerson had written Hunter off too easily. He jabbed the intercom button. I need someone tracked. I don't care if it's across the Red Sea, Berlin, or the Moon. Just don't let him out of your sight. 
Colonel Jack Hammerson stood at his office window, looking down at the unarmed combat classes taking place on the field of the U.S. Stratcom compound. Sloppy, he thought, and shook his head. Hammerson had run the Hawks, the elite special forces teams, for five years now. Though he'd succeeded in raising the bar every year when it came to the quality and lethality of his new team members, he couldn't help comparing them to the greatest operative he or his other Hawks had ever seen, even though that man was now gone. He watched the class a little longer and ground his teeth. Sloppy, damned sloppy. He'd send this group home. Better to remain a big fish in their former special ops groups than be an anonymous dead hawk on some shitty battlefield in some remote area somewhere on the planet. Hammerson was a tough commander. He had to be. His force was the hardest in the world to join, and even harder to stay in. Like him, the men and women he trained came from either the SEALs, Rangers, Green Berets, or Alpha Force, and all needed to be the best at what they did before they were even considered as a candidate for the Hawks. They also had to have a specialization that Hammerson deemed useful. After the initial assessment and training, only about half were offered a permanent place. Hammerson's people didn't just have to be good— they had to be outstanding. Their missions were always deadly and often classified as high terminal probability, suicidal to most other groups. The Hawks excelled at missions that others had failed at or couldn't even contemplate attempting. Hammerson's computer pinged softly behind him, immediately followed by a buzzing from his back pocket and then again from his breast pocket, the alert was obviously of high importance. He turned to see his whole screen flaring red with a single code word, Lazarus. His mind didn't comprehend its meaning for a few seconds, even though he had programmed the coded alert himself. Then shock traveled through his entire system. Freaking goddamn hell! Hammerson pulled the phone from its cradle, Get me Sam Reed, Priority One. He wouldn't have to wait long. Priority One was reserved for the most critical of events. Commander-in-Chief on deck, base infiltration, or at its worst, the breakout of war. With a P-1, Hammerson's assistant had the authority to break in on any communication system, anytime, anywhere in the world, to find the personnel he needed. First Lieutenant Sam Reed was on leave, but that didn't matter. After a few seconds, Sam Reed's laid-back voice came on the line. Reed, go ahead, boss. Report in, ordered Hammerson, not bothering with courtesies. I have a proximity alert for the Arcadian. There was the sound of glass breaking at Sam Reed's end of the line. Chapter 18 Matt swiveled in the driver's seat so he could see both Sarah and Charles. Okay, he said. We tell them that we're working for Chief Logan and that it's absolutely vital we psychologically assess the Jordan woman. Charles didn't look convinced. What happens if they want to check us out and they call Logan direct? Come on, with my honest face, trust me, it won't happen. Matt reached into the back seat to punch his friend in the arm. Stop worrying, buddy. Just leave it to me. Charles batted Matt's hand away. Sarah, what do you think? Sarah shrugged. Might work. Besides, I can't wait to see the magnificent Matthew Kearns in action. She did her best hillbilly impression. After all, we small-town folk get the wool pulled over our eyes on a daily basis by you big city folk. She winked at Charles and motioned with her head towards Matt. Prince Charming here shouldn't have any trouble at all. Matt climbed out of the car and took several deep breaths. Let me do the talking. The hospital's enormous front desk looked to him like the Great Wall of China.
imposing and intimidating. Behind it sat several women, talking to visitors or patients, taking calls or doing paperwork. They looked very professional and very busy. One woman glanced up and caught Matt's eye. She was a small mountain of flesh with a face hard enough to drill teeth. She wasn't smiling and probably hadn't for decades. Matt looked around for someone else to talk to, anyone but this woman. She saw straight through him, he could tell. He stopped and half turned to Sarah and Charles behind him. We're dead. Sarah pushed past him. Hi, Martha. How are the boys? To Matt's amazement, Martha the ogress immediately transformed into Martha the friendly mommy. Sarah Summer, I didn't see you there. The boys are both fine. Josh is thinking of staying on at school, maybe even going to college. And Lewis is still happy fixing cars. But what are you doing here? Nothing wrong, I hope. Sarah smiled and leaned on the desktop. I'm fine. Just come to visit a friend, Amanda Jordan. Can I see her today? Martha typed something on her keyboard, then pulled a face and looked back up at Sarah. Well, I suppose you can visit, but I doubt you'll be chatting much as the poor thing's still unresponsive. No sign of her husband yet either. Such a shame. She leaned forward slightly and lowered her voice. Run off after a fight is what I heard. She nodded sagely, then looked past Sarah to Charles and Matt. Are you all together? Sorry, Martha, yes, Sarah said. These are friends of mine from the City University. Meet Charlie Schroeder and Matt Kearns. Matt here is actually a UNC Asheville alumnus. Really? Martha reached out a large hand. She held onto Matt's a bit longer than he'd expected and looked deep into his face, the ogress returning for a second. Matt smiled at her, but it felt like a chimpanzee grin, showing every tooth in his head. Room 205, Martha told Sarah, left out of the lifts. Just pick up any hallway phone and ask for me if you have any trouble, dear. I will, and I'll keep a lookout for Josh if he makes it onto campus, Sarah called back as she headed for the lifts. Matt and Charles following like docile children. In the lift, both men relaxed. Sarah gave them a look that was a mixture of satisfaction and amusement. Charles folded his arms and gave Matt a mock stare of deep skepticism. Matt laughed and leaned back against the elevator wall. Come on, Charlie Brown, did you see the size of that woman? She was terrifying. The lift doors slid back, and they walked quickly down the pristine white corridor, stopping at a door with a small glass and mesh window. Sarah briefly peered inside. Okay, come on, she said, and pushed the door open. Amanda Jordan lay on a cot with two pillows behind her head. Feeding tubes trailed from her arm, and a bag of yellow fluid lay under her bed. She was tiny and bird-like, her face drawn, her blue eyes staring glassily at the ceiling. Sarah picked up the chart clipped to the railing at the base of the bed and picked out details. Age 26, physically and psychologically catatonic, mild muscle rigidity, no facial twitching, no involuntary or dyskinetic movement. She ran her finger down the page. Dry eye treatment, Apply saline drops every 20 minutes. Fluid induction. Basically, guys, the poor girl is a zombie. Why are we here again? Matt walked quickly to the door and opened it, looked up and down the corridor. He let it swing shut, then nodded to Charles. Charles stepped closer to the bed and pulled something from his pocket. One of the strange things about human beings is that scent perception is directly linked to the part of our brain associated with memory and feelings. It's been proven that smells can trigger memories almost instantaneously. He looked at Sarah. Like when you smell chlorine and immediately remember summer days spent at the swimming pool, 
or baking bread reminds you of your grandmother's house. Well, those links remain embedded within your brain's limbic system, ready and waiting to call up a memory or a mood. Charles opened his hand to reveal the small sample bottle with the ragged piece of hairy flesh inside. He uncapped the bottle and waved it under the young woman's nose. Nothing. He moved the bottle closer, almost covering one of her nostrils. The effect was both startling and terrifying. Amanda Jordan sat up, her eyes bulging. Her mouth opened wider than seemed humanly possible, and she screamed, a wail of sheer terror that bounced around the walls of the small room. Sarah put her hands over her ears and gritted her teeth. Matt clamped a hand over Amanda's mouth and shouted to Charles, Put it away! He grabbed her shoulders and tried to push her down onto the bed, but it was as if her body was electrified. The intravenous needle in her arm began to lift, threatening to tear through her skin. Matt threw his body across hers, trying to use his weight to force her back. Charles, who had recapped the bottle, lunged at her flailing legs. But once the odor was gone, it was as if a fire alarm had just been switched off. Calm returned, and Amanda Jordan sank back into her zombified state. Matt and Charles stood up slowly, both breathing like they'd just completed a marathon. Charles started to laugh nervously. Matt put his hands on his hips, still gasping, his face clouded. Are you insane? Sarah said furiously. Her face was bright red and her hands were shaking. That poor woman looked like she was going to have a heart attack. And if you two idiots expected that stunt was going to bring her out of the catatonia, you failed miserably. Charles held out his hands, palms up. But don't you see? We couldn't have got a more positive response to the sample. We can conclusively say that whatever happened to Amanda Jordan on that mountain, it involved the creature this piece of flesh came from. Sarah wasn't mollified. Charles took her hand. Look, I'm sorry if that was a little more extreme than we expected. But she's the only person who's seen this thing and is still alive. We just needed to make sure. But why? Matt looked down at Amanda. Her terror mirrored his own. He knew he'd been letting his fear rule his life. He'd been running from it, but now here was an opportunity to face it. He couldn't let the horror continue. It had to stop. He drew in a shaky breath. Because, Matt said slowly, we need to... I... Sarah withdrew her hand from Charles's. The dome? Charles nodded. Yeah, the dome. We need to go up there. Markinson exploded with laughter. A fucking big gorilla? He clapped his hands together and leaned forward, almost directly into Matt Kearns's face. That's what you eggheads think is responsible for the missing people? He frowned with clownish puzzlement. Where's the ship? Kearns looked confused. What ship? The space fucking ship, Daffy. Maybe it's really an alien from outer space. Logan banged a large hand on his desk. That's enough, Markinson. But, Chief, this is a serious investigation, Markinson said. And these experts of yours spend days working on it, only to tell us we got some sort of big monkey loose in the mountains. I could have got that sort of advice from one of the drunks down at the Thirsty Bar any Friday night. He leaned over Logan's desk. For the record, I checked with Kringle Brothers a week ago, and guess what? No missing ape. Besides, we were just up there in the mountains ourselves, and we sure didn't see no fucking big monkey. Kearns looked at his two colleagues and motioned with his head towards Markinson. Any guesses why at his age he's still only a junior officer? You smart-ass prick! Markinson leaped at Kearns. 
Schroeder stepped between them and cupped a finger in the eye. Logan got to his feet, felt his chair tip backwards. That's enough, he roared. Markinson, you ever go to assault a citizen in front of me again and you'll be pulling graveyard shifts until you're fifty. Understand? Go and find something to do, now. Markinson glared at his commanding officer, then pushed open the door. Logan could hear him swearing as he threaded his way through the desks in the outer office. I'm assuming he's not allowed to assault me when he's not in front of you either, right? Kearns said. Logan rested his hands on his desk and hung his head for a moment, exhaling wearily. He looked up at the three scientists. You know who runs this office? Schroeder jumped in. We're sorry, Chief, you do. No, son, not even close. The mayor does. Logan picked up the notes on the DNA matching that Sarah Summer had handed him. I got a lot of technical information here I can't understand, and a tooth that even I can see is older than Moses. I take this to the mayor to get the money for a full-scale search, and by next year I'll be working security out at the mall. Logan righted his chair and flopped into it. A gigantosaurus! Jesus Christ, couldn't you have at least said it was another lion or a psycho running around in an ape suit? A psycho we can understand, but a giant ape thing? That's Gigantopithecus, Chief, Schroeder said, and the evidence is almost irrefutable. Oh, come on, Logan said, flicking the papers. This is bullshit. Anyone else had brought me this theory and I'd be kicking their ass six ways to Sunday. He looked at Sarah. You go along with this? You've seen this irrefutable proof? Schroeder reached into his pocket. Actually, Chief, we were just in it. Sarah cut him off with a glare before turning back to Logan. No, Bill, I haven't seen all the proof yet, but I trust the biology. Logan sat back and exhaled. I'm sorry, Sarah, gentlemen, but it's not enough. No one but Kearns and Schroeder have seen the footprint. My own M.E. says the forensics are inconclusive, and all you've given me is a stack of pages with about a million numbers on them that add up to what you yourself say is fragmented and requires computer-assisted gene speculation. I need more proof. I need, I don't know, a witness or something. Chief, there are no real witnesses, because they're either dead or missing or catatonic. Kearns said, sounding exasperated. Look, if we're right, you'll wish it was a lion loose out there. The print we saw out at the Wilson farm puts this thing at around ten feet tall and about twelve hundred pounds. It's big and aggressive and... Logan cut in. And freaking extinct, according to you. So what's it doing here now? Where's it been for the last, what, million years? Shit, son. Where do you hide if you're ten feet tall? Kearns put a hand to his temple, as if he was in pain. I don't know, Chief, but the answers are probably up on that mountain. I bet this thing has been here before, or something like it. We know the Indians dealt with something similar thousands of years ago. They left us that message written into the stones. You saw it in Amanda Jordan's photographs. Logan shook his head. Professor Kearns, it's getting colder than a witch's tit up there. If there is something wandering around on the dome, the cold is going to kill it. It'll drop to twenty below come winter. Kearns sorted through the papers on Logan's desk and pulled out a map with small circles drawn on it. I doubt the cold's going to kill it. Look at this. He pointed to the spot where Amanda Jordan was found, where the cows had gone missing, where the Wilson girl and then Kathleen Hunter had disappeared, then grabbed a pen and drew a connecting line between all of them. Three things leap out at me here, Chief. One, the creature's making its way down the mountain towards the town. Two, the attacks or abductions are occurring with greater frequency. 
And three, he put his finger on the last circle. It's almost here. Logan held Kearns' eyes for a moment before looking down at the zigzag line that ran from the Black Mountain down onto the plains and up to the outskirts of his town. It scared the shit out of him. For the first time in his life, he had no idea what he should do next. Logan could hear Ollie Markinson, who trailed behind him, still grumbling at being chosen as accompanying officer at this time of day, or night, depending on your perspective. Share the pain, he thought. Being woken at four in the morning wasn't anyone's idea of a good time, and usually meant urgent news, bad news, or both. Martha Oatson came around the reception desk, her face full of concern. She's awake, Chief, and semi-lucid, still in shock and needs a lot of rest, but you did say to call immediately if there was any change. Logan nodded but didn't slow. You did the right thing, Martha. She's the only witness we've got. He looked back over his shoulder as he headed for the elevators. She okay to talk? We got a lot of questions for her. Martha clasped her chubby fingers together as she hurried to keep up with him. Yes, but keep it simple. She's suffering from severe distress. I don't think she knows what happened to her husband. She's asking for him. Also, I'm supposed to contact her next of kin to tell them she's awake, but I can't get onto anyone. Leave that to us, Martha, Logan said, standing close to the elevator door to stop the nurse entering with them. She probably knows more than she thinks. When the doors slid closed, Logan turned to Markinson. Get on to the Jordan brothers, Markinson, and inform... Uh... Markinson cut in, pulling a pained face. I was meaning to tell you, Chief. The Jordan brothers were in town just a few days back. Logan frowned. What, all of them? Big Will, too? Are they still here? Markinson shrugged. Maybe... I mean, yeah. They were all kitted out, heading up the Black Mountain's hiking track, I reckon. Jesus Christ, Ollie, and you let them go up there? How long ago? Frustration flashed in Markinson's face. I don't know, three days, maybe. Look, Chief, you know the Jordan brothers. They're around 230 pounds each. You want to stop those guys doing something... You need a freaking riot gun and twenty square feet of cargo netting. Logan exhaled with exasperation. Shit. We'll worry about them later. Let's see what Mrs. Jordan recollects first. Logan was shocked by the change in Amanda Jordan. The woman looked like a small, stringy bird. The skin of her face was chalky, her hair lank and greasy. Her eyes, red-rimmed, stared down at her hands, which lay palms up on the bed. The room smelled of antiseptic and an animal ammonia odor that suggested fear and distress. Amanda Jordan looked up when she became aware of the two officers. Have you found him? Logan pulled a plastic chair to the bed so he could talk to her eye to eye. Take it slow, keep it non-threatening, he told himself. He didn't want to increase her stress levels. On the other side of the bed, Markinson stood with his arms folded, looming over the tiny woman. Obviously, he wasn't reading from the same rule sheet as his boss. We're still looking for your husband, Mrs. Jordan, Logan said. But we need your help. Anything you remember... About the place, what happened, anything at all. Even if you think it's silly or insignificant, we'd like to hear about it. Her mouth turned down like a carnival clown's. He's still up there, then. With it. It? Markinson had dropped his folded arms. He saved me. He let it get him instead. She began to sob loudly. Markinson leaned forward. Was it a lion? She shook her head and squeezed her eyes shut. 
Logan took one of her pale hands in his large paw. Tell us what you saw, Amanda. What's the it you're talking about? She opened her red-rimmed eyes, and he saw the horror in her stare. The monster! In the elevator, Logan looked at his watch. Nearly 5 a.m. It would still be dark for a while yet. He contemplated going home and trying to get another hour's sleep, but knew that he'd never switch off enough to really rest. The monster got him. Oh, good Christ. This was turning out to be a nightmare, and he was right at the center of it. Logan's mind turned over. He needed to get a team up there, but still didn't have anything sane enough to take to the mayor. Perhaps he should listen one more time to those crazy theories Sarah Summer, Kearns, and Schroeder had put forward. Then there was the problem of the Jordan brothers out on the peak. He felt a deep fatigue at the thought of trekking up the dome to find them. Besides, Markinson was right. Each of those boys was big enough and bad enough to hold a bull out to piss. They were probably armed to the teeth, too. If anyone was going to be all right up there, it was them. Still, should probably close the hiking track for a while, he thought, satisfied there was one activity he could implement right away. As the elevator doors slid open in the hospital foyer, he saw Martha standing there waiting for him. She handed him a sign-out sheet. So, next of kin... Be kind of nice for that girl to have some company right now, Chief. Yeah, Markinson's on it, Logan replied. He started for the door, his mind already onto another problem. Maybe Sarah Summer could come back and visit with her in the meantime, Martha said. Logan froze, then turned. Come back? Yes, Chief. She and a couple of friends from the city came to see Mrs. Jordan earlier. Logan groaned. He'd bet good money on what those three amigos were planning to do, or maybe already doing. Jesus Christ in heaven, it'd be like Grand Central Station up on that mountain in another day or two. Leave them to me, Martha. Maybe you could ask Mrs. Jordan herself if there's anyone she'd like to see, other than her husband. He headed to the door fast. Markinson had to break into a jog to keep pace. What now, Chief? Well, I'm going to grab a coffee, have a think, and wait for the sun to come up. You, on the other hand, are going to break out some cold terrain equipment for, say, half a dozen officers. Looks like we might have another lion to hunt. Chapter 19 Benito Juarez Airport Mexico. Alex and Adira kept pace with the other disembarking passengers as they headed through the hot and crowded arrivals hall towards the immigration desk. They'd had an exhausting journey via Sudan, Ethiopia, then down the coast of Africa to Johannesburg, South Africa, from where they'd flown to Mexico. Adira's plan was to get through immigration here at the main airport then take an internal flight to Nuevo Laredo, which was separated from the American city of Laredo by a stretch of just 100 feet of the Rio Bravo. Then it would be a matter of driving to the small speck on the map that represented the town of Asheville, the name Alex had kept repeating to her. Since the introduction of the biometric eye scanners, it had become difficult to infiltrate the U.S. via any of its own ports, which was why she'd chosen Mexico as their entry point. New software made it possible to identify unique corneal reflections, which meant even prosthetics could be detected. Adira guessed both her and Alex's eye prints would be flagged as soon as they looked into the tiny camera lens. But Benito Juarez was one of the busiest airports in the world, with nearly 30 million passengers annually so getting lost in the crowd should be relatively easy. Adira linked arms with Alex as they joined the line for the immigration desk. Outwardly, they looked like a holidaying couple, intent on fun and relaxation. 
but inside she felt the rising tension. This was a huge risk. Adira knew how intensive the American surveillance was. Coming in via Mexico might buy them some time, but she didn't doubt for a moment that if the U.S. intelligence services wanted to look into a window anywhere in the world, they could. She also knew that other eyes would be searching for them. By now, her uncle would have discovered she had disappeared with Alex. Sorry, she whispered silently. Pasaportes, demanded the woman at the desk, her eyes flicking from Adira to Alex. Her gaze was unemotional and slightly bored, but Adira knew she'd miss very little. Like most immigration officials, she'd have been trained to assess facial features, eye color, and purported ethnicity before checking what her eyes told her against the information in their passports. Those passports were gold embossed with the South African coat of arms, and the stamps from numerous countries dating back several years showed a young married couple who liked to travel. The passports had all the necessary watermarks, chips, and sophisticated dyes required to pass the forensic testing that may be done by immigration in any country. They were authentic, just not really theirs. The woman looked at Alex's personal details, then said in heavily accented Afrikaans, Varam kom ye an Mexico? She watched him closely as he replied, Om Julan de Kenit, Alex said, smiling broadly at her. He turned to Adira to include her in the conversation. She can Afrikan prat. It's the kind, Adira said, stepping forward and beaming at the woman. Dit salen wunderliche vacanzi liefling. The official's gaze remained flat and bored. English? Yes, a little, Alex said sounding disappointed that the conversation in Afrikaans was over. The woman grunted and stamped both little green books. Enjoy your holiday, Mr. and Mrs. Jashub. Next. She waved them out of the way, already focused on the next person in line. Adira linked her arm through Alex's again and smiled up at him, her eyebrows arched. You see, Benjamin... A little practice did come in handy, yes? Alex smiled back at her. Clever girl. You'll make a good spy one day. In another hour, they were on their way. Solomon and his three agents watched the young couple walk from the international terminal towards the smaller domestic terminal. He had guessed correctly. He would have made the same choice for a covert entry into America. The convoluted path Captain Senesh and the American had taken had given Solomon and his team plenty of time to arrive to intercept them. In the back seat of their vehicle, one of his men held what looked like a folded towel at his shoulder. A black tube poked out from it, pointing at the couple. They could take both down in an instant. They're about to go undercover, the man with the gun said. We'll lose them. Solomon spoke without turning. Hold. For now, General Shavit had ordered they just be observed. Captain Senesh's intentions were still unclear. The man in the back seat shifted slightly, his face creasing in concentration. A thin cord ran from the black tube to a small plug in his ear. He pulled the plug free and leaned forward to speak to Solomon. Nuevo Laredo. We'll need to move it to catch them if they're flying, the driver said. Solomon shook his head. No, they're going to cross there. We'll meet them on the other side. Jack Hammerson and Sam Reed sat in the dark, watching the recessed screen that covered half the back wall of Hammerson's office. It was split into several frames, all showing two figures walking quickly towards Benito Juarez's domestic terminal. Both men wore headset comms linked directly to Major Jerry Harris, who was located in an electronic surveillance factory beneath the Offutt Air Force Base in Nebraska. 
Paris manned the constellation of orbiting birds that fed a lot of the high-altitude intelligence over the United States mainland and also much of the globe. Screw down another 50, Hammerson said, squinting at the images. The result made him smile. The man's baseball cap was pulled down, obscuring most of his face from the steep vertical angle. But Jack Hammerson knew that man, knew his walk, his mannerisms, as if he were his own flesh and blood. Welcome back, son, he thought. The woman with him turned her face for just a second, and Vila grabbed it. A blurred image appeared in one of the smaller screens to the side. Dot points manifested on the facial matrix, joined together, were mapped and enhanced, and a name appeared underneath the photograph in flashing red. Captain Adira Senesh. Next to it, priority alert. Trouble, Sam grunted. He toggled a small stick on his armrest, and an electric whine filled the darkened room as his wheelchair moved closer to the screen. The last mission he and Alex Hunter had worked on together, Sam had suffered a massive trauma to his spine. The creature they had been fighting had broken Sam's back as easily as snapping a twig, severing his spinal cord and shattering his L1 and L2 spinal plates. Sam would never walk again, or not unless there were significant advancements in stem cell technology, Hammerson thought, or they managed to convince Alex Hunter to return. The Arcadian's amazing regenerative abilities held so many secrets, so many possible answers. Hammerson exhaled long and slow. First things first, we got to see if we can make contact with him before we start trying to explain to the top brass how a dead soldier suddenly come back to life. There would be way too many complications trying to get that one past Graham in medical. Sam studied the woman's face up close for a few seconds, then rolled back to Hammerson's side. Like a bad penny, huh? Hammerson nodded. Big time. And if Alex hasn't contacted us, we have to assume he doesn't know us or doesn't want to. Worst case, she's turned him. Either way, approaching them will be difficult. He rose from the chair, pushed the mic wire down from his mouth, and went over to his desk. Staying standing, he pulled a keypad forward to start typing, then pressed his palm to the screen. A red line circled his hand, reading the peaks and valleys of his palm and fingerprints. He was accessing Muse, the military universal search engine. The sophisticated U.S. STRATCOM intelligence system would allow him to enter nearly any website on the planet. There were only a few installations with the technical and intellectual firepower to resist Muse's invisible intrusions, and one by one they were slowly being broken down. Hammerson copied a photo of Adira Sanesh, then accessed the Mexican immigration arrivals files. Within a few minutes, he'd found what he was looking for. Rebecca and Benjamin Jashub, entering from South Africa on a holiday visa. Sam, take a look. Hammerson swiveled the screen. Sam snorted. Looks pretty good for someone who was in a steel coffin last time we saw him. He leaned closer to the passenger information and laughed. You've got to be kidding me. What is it? Hammerson frowned and looked back at the screen. Looks like he hasn't lost his sense of humor. Jashub comes from the old Hebrew name, Yashub, meaning he will return. Expecting us to be watching, maybe? Or perhaps a little warning from Sinesh. Hammerson tapped his chin with one knuckle as he thought. Can't afford to go near them, and we certainly can't let the local authorities in on the surveillance. We need to see where they're going, then move to... He paused. He wasn't sure yet what he wanted to do with Alex Hunter, or even what he could do given Alex's capabilities and unpredictability. Move to talk to him, I guess, he finished. Sam nodded slowly, 
obviously guessing his hawk leader's dilemma. I'm ready to go whenever you say, boss. He trusts me, or used to. Hammerson nodded. He'd known that, crippled or not, Sam Reed would want the chance to try to bring Alex Hunter back in. Sam knew Alex better than anyone, and had been the closest thing Alex had to a friend. But Hammerson also knew that if Captain Adira Senesh was in any way controlling the Arcadian, Sam Reed would be committing suicide by going after them. And that was if he was fully fit. Stuck in a wheelchair, well... For now we just watch, he said, and pushed the mic wire up to his mouth again. Captain Harris, I want 24-7 surveillance. Capture every nanosecond of CCTV feed, traffic control footage, and satellite stream we can get, and patch it through to me and only me. Understood? You got it, Colonel. Recordings? Negative. I'll do that from here. You just follow him. And remember, these guys are the best. They know we're probably watching, so they'll be smart. Yes, sir, Harris responded. We'll be smarter. No one can hide from Vila. Hammerson was about to sign off when he heard Harris give a grunt of annoyance. Got a problem, Colonel. There's a dual feed loop. I think someone else is watching. Ah, shit. Can you find out who? No problem. There was silence for a moment, then... Yup, got it. Feed is being routed to medical division. Hammerson exhaled a low growl. Graham, probably, he thought. He leaned forward to rest his knuckles on the edge of his desk. Okay, Jerry, just make sure you cover your tracks and don't lose our man. He removed his headset and said softly to the screen, The game's afoot. Your move, Arcadian. They're different, Lieutenant Marshall told his superior officer. Captain Robert Graham snorted as he straightened his tie in the mirror. Of course they're different, Marshall. We wanted them to be different. We built them that way, remember? Marshall stepped a little closer. No, I mean that the latest test subject's personalities have altered. Their strength, reaction times, and resistance to pain have increased fivefold. But they haven't benefited from the same boost to their cognitive and strategic thinking as the original Arcadian did. In fact, there's something missing. They're kind of mechanical somehow. Like they're just, I don't know, like they're just acting human. His voice went down in volume. It seems like there's no soul in them anymore. Graham managed to snort and sneer at the same time. So we've created a soldier with increased physical capabilities and no conscience. And that's bad because... Personally, I think they're magnificent, and so will General Moneybags. He motioned to the door with his head. Speaking of which, time to invite the general in. General Wozniak had three stars and a hell of a lot of pull in the U.S. Armed Forces. It was he who had wanted the original subject, Alex Hunter, reproduced, and had given Graham and Marshall the job of delivering. Money was no object, but time was. Finally, Graham thought, they had something to show him. Captain Graham saluted, then offered his hand. The general ignored the hand and made a half-salute motion towards his head. Show me what you got, Captain. During the next thirty minutes, Graham had their three latest subjects perform individual tasks that showed their strength, speed, and resistance to pain and trauma. General Wozniak nodded at key moments, and at one point Graham was sure he saw a brief smile flick across the man's permanently compressed lips. The final task was a simple hand-to-hand -hand combat maneuver that pitted three regular soldiers against one of the ARC-044 batch subjects. The three opponents were large, highly trained and fit, formidable by themselves, as a trio, they should easily overcome a single combatant. Graham turned to the general. 
Our three attackers have been told they simply need to hold the ARC-044 subject on the floor for five seconds, by any means. They can use full contact, no restrictions, no pulling of punches. The general just grunted. Graham pressed a comm stud on the desk in front of the large window. Commence. The three men circled the barefoot, unarmed subject. The first attacker came in low from the side, scissoring his legs, expecting to sidesweep the subject off his feet. The subject leapt out of the way of the sweeping leg, then came down hard just as the leg was passing underneath him. Both heels targeted the large bone of the femur. The sickening snap caused the scientists behind the thick glass to grimace. The remaining two men ignored their fallen comrade, instead taking advantage of his demise to attack at once. One came in fast, head on, the other came from the rear. To the men watching, it was almost as though the ARC-044 subject was waiting for the attack, welcomed it. The volunteer at the ARC-044 subject's rear wrapped one brawny arm around his throat and the other up beside his head and applied pressure. His teeth were gritted as he strained and seemed to be attempting to separate the small bones in the neck or shut off the air. It was as if the ARC-044 didn't even notice. He continued to face the attacker who came in from the front, who hit out with his large fists in a series of strikes that, had they landed, would have broken jaws or shattered eye sockets. He was quick, and his punches were delivered with a professional rolling of the arm and shoulder that told of unarmed combat training. But none of his blows hit their target. All were parried, swiped away, or merely swung across empty air where the ARC-044 subject had moved out of the way with an ease that bordered on tormenting. Finally, Graham's enhanced warrior caught both his combatants' fists, held his attacker for a second, and looked into his eyes before drawing him in close. He shifted his grip to the man's head and twisted violently while still staring into his face. A snapping sound came over the microphone, and the soldier's body fell to the floor like an empty sack. Graham noticed Marshall look sharply at him, but he ignored his subordinate. Wozniak could have been watching a chess game, but his eyes were unwavering, and the hint of a smile had appeared again. Marshall turned away from the window, but Graham felt his own excitement building as the ARC-044 subject pulled the final man over his shoulder and threw him heavily to the ground. He held him there and pummeled his face over and over. When the crunches became wetter and softer, Graham switched the window to frost. Was he supposed to kill them? the general asked. His tone was indifferent, but his eyes were interested. Graham shrugged. He was supposed to defend himself. He was told his attackers would be ordered to try to kill him, so he obviously reacted with what he believed was commensurate force. All the men were special ops volunteers and aware of the risks. The general nodded. Okay, what now? Graham smiled. Access to the armory, and then test out in the field. I've got something in mind, if you would just sign off on the order. Chapter 20 Alex and Adira had been in Laredo Nuevo for just two hours, and had made their way to the outskirts of the city. Alex searched the darkness, listening for the sound of rushing water. This way, he said. They had waited for nightfall in a near-empty diner, chewing indifferently on stale sandwiches and sipping bitter coffee. Their only other purchase in town had been a pack of black garbage bags. The luggage they'd brought on the flight was padded to avoid suspicion as they came through customs. They had extracted what they needed and left the rest in an alley. By now it had no doubt been picked over by a dozen different people, and its contents dispersed across the border city. Amongst the clothing, cameras, and travel booklets in Adira's bag had been a leather roll containing sculptor's tools. 
Camouflaged among the small chisels, files, and spatulas were two slim iron spikes. Only another assassin would have recognized them as perfectly balanced throwing knives. These, and cash, and credit cards with an unlimited spend, were all they needed. Everything else they required they would buy or steal. There would be no trail. Alex moved quickly through the darkness to the bank of the Rio Grande. He raised his head and inhaled the desert air, closed his eyes, and allowed the rushing images to flood his senses. The link that had exploded into his mind only a few days ago, pulling him towards the small town in North Carolina, was growing weaker. If it was his mother, something was bleeding her of her vitality. He turned to Adira. We need to hurry. He tore open the pack of garbage bags and began to remove his clothing. About a hundred yards, he said, nodding towards the opposite bank. Pretty good current, so I expect we'll come out maybe half a mile further down. Adira nodded as she too stripped down. Three fifty miles to Houston. That's five hours driving at seventy miles per hour. Then another eight fifty or so to Asheville. Probably another twelve hours. Maybe on the way you'll tell me a little more about what you are planning? Alex looked at her. My mother's there. She's in trouble and she needs me, and I need her. She might be the only person who can tell me truthfully who I am. I can, Adira began, but stopped when he glared at her. He guessed she could tell his opinion of her truthfulness. After a moment, his anger cooled, and he gave her a half-smile. It's okay. And by the way, in America, seventy miles per hour is the speed your grandmother would drive. She laughed nervously and slipped off her underwear. As she stood up straight, she noticed Alex watching her, and a small smile curled the corner of her mouth. Let's go, then, she said. Contact. Salomon swore softly. He'd bet wrong and was now miles away from the action. There were several spots between Nuevo Laredo and Laredo, where a strong swimmer could cross the Rio Grande, but only two that he would choose if he were Sinesh. Unfortunately, they were miles apart. He had separated his team accordingly, taking the southern crossing himself, being the highest skilled operative, and in his opinion three times as good as his colleagues, and sending his three men to the northern one. I'm on my way. Do not engage unless absolutely unavoidable. Understood? Understood. Salomon had simplified the objectives for his team. General Chavit wanted his niece alive, but had not been as concerned about the fate of the American. For Salomon, that was as good as a death sentence. He jogged back to his car. He hoped the Laredo police uniforms his men had stolen would be enough of a distraction to hold Hunter and Sinesh until he got there. Alex and Adira pulled themselves from the water and carried their knotted plastic bags some distance away from the bank, where they both dressed quickly. There was no moon, but the stars gave Alex more than enough illumination to see by. He paused for a few seconds and raised his head, sensing they were being watched. He turned slowly, looking into the brush and beyond, straining to hear the slightest sound. A breath a wheeze. Adira noticed his searching and froze. What is it? He stayed where he was, his head tilted for a few more seconds, until the distant call pulled at him again, urging him on. Maybe nothing. Let's move. He pulled the dark sweater over his head and slipped on the leather jacket. He couldn't waste any more time trying to analyze his suspicions. They needed transport and weapons. He had no idea what they would be walking into, but he knew he didn't want to go unarmed. They made their way through the brush beside the road for ten minutes, not yet trusting the open gravel surface. There may be border patrols nearby, 
and there was no good reason for anyone other than police, drug runners, or illegal immigrants to be wandering around in the dark this close to the extremely porous border. A small knot of pain flared in Alex's head, making him frown and crush his eyes shut for a moment. The pain rippled down his neck, and the sensation of being watched grew stronger. He was becoming distracted. He needed to concentrate, pay more attention, needed to... Hold it right there! Harsh flashlights shone in their faces, and two men came out of the underbrush. Their light blue uniforms looked like those of ice cream vendors, but signified Laredo City Police. Alex considered dealing with them while he and Adira were still just anonymous bodies in the dark, but held back when a set of car headlights came on across the other side of the wide road. The lights were higher than normal. SUV or truck, Alex thought. Another man got out, also uniformed. Could I see some ID, please, sir? The man who spoke had a deep scar on his chin, and his jaw was large and firm, indicating a lot of bunched muscle at the neck and shoulders. He was big and in condition. They all were. Despite the Laredo PD caps pulled down over their eyes, Alex could tell that their gazes never left him for a second. He noticed that the speaker's hand, which held the flashlight at shoulder level, was hard and calloused. LPD must have upgraded their recruiting process. The sense of danger bloomed in Alex's head as he reached into his pocket for his wallet. We're tourists, he said, holding it out slowly to the talker. The man shook his head, his eyes never wavering from Alex's. Drop it and kick it over. Careful, there's all my holiday money in there, Alex said as he obeyed. He tensed, waiting for the scarred officer to look down at the full wallet, but the man ignored it and reached down to his holster to unclip his gun. He lifted it free in a smooth movement, the weapon comfortable in his hand. It was a big Sig Sauer, a P-228, much larger than normal U.S. law enforcement issue. Something wasn't right. Small-town cops were never this sharp and professional. The man's companions had drawn their weapons, too, but their guns were different. There was something about the way they looked that wasn't quite right either, but he couldn't determine what it was with the flashlights in his face. The men fanned out a little more. They took up equal positions around him and Adira, but all remained facing him, ready and on edge. The scarred officer crouched for the wallet, but still his eyes remained on Alex. Cover him while I call this in, he told his men. He removed the driver's license, letting the wallet fall to the ground. He walked a few paces back towards his SUV, pulled a slim phone from his pocket, and talked softly into it. Alex let his eyes slide to Adira. She returned his gaze with a flat stare. Alex guessed what she was thinking. If the cops called in their names, they'd start a trail a mile wide that could be followed. They'd need to trash their clean-skin IDs and start again. He gave her an almost imperceptible shake of his head. He wanted to let it play out a little longer and see what happened. As he watched her, the air around her seemed to blur, like a cloud of oily smoke was settling over the road, and the burning knot of pain in his skull ramped up its nagging intensity. Fifty feet away, the officer with the scar spoke softly into the phone, out of earshot of everyone except Alex. It's them, all right. He paused, then spoke again. Yes, but I don't like the look of him. He might be a problem. His head came up and he turned. His eyes were emotionless as he stared back at Alex. Roger that. We've got a plastic sheet to wrap him. He came slowly back to the group, his face a mask of indifference. Put your hands on your head, turn around, and kneel. I'm just going to put some cuffs on you. The pain began to flower inside Alex's skull. 
What's the problem, officer? No problem, sir. Just do as you're told. Alex grimaced from the explosion of pain behind his eyes as he raised his hands. He turned his back on the officer and saw that Adira's face had changed to a mask of anger and her fists were bold. He let his eyes travel to the two officers behind her. It dawned on him what he'd thought was out of place. Their uniforms were perfect, except for one thing. The belts were just plain black leather. No baton, spray, tasers, or cuffs. From out of nowhere, a soft, insistent voice sounded in his head. Was it Adira? It spoke urgently. No cuffs. This is an execution. Yours. Kill him. Alex slowly lowered his hands. You're not really police, are you? The answer was the almost inaudible sound of pressure on a trigger. The pain in his head disappeared. Kill them all. Alex exploded into action. He spun and yanked the gun from the man's hand and flung it into the darkness. His hand came away warm and wet, and he noticed that one of the man's fingers was missing. He had ripped the gun free with such force that he'd taken the digit with it. The man, instead of grabbing his wrist and howling, went into a fighter's stance. He lashed out with a hammer blow that caught Alex on the chin and kicked his head back. He immediately followed with a front snap kick, aimed at Alex's groin. Alex was quick, but not enough. He caught part of the boot in his testicles, and the burst of pain and nausea made his head swim. Who are these guys? Alex lunged forward, taking another blow to his cheek, which he ignored. He grabbed the scarred officer and spun him round, so his body shielded Alex's in the same moment as the officer yelled, Shoot him! Alex heard the men curse as they saw he'd deprived them of an easy kill shot. Alex had planned to simply subdue the scarred officer, but the voice came again in his head. No survivors! And it was as if something took over his body. He gripped the man's shoulders harder and pulled him forward, smashing his own forehead into the bridge of his nose with a sickening crunch. Blood ran into Alex's eyes, but it wasn't his own. The scarred man fell like a boneless sack at his feet. Intuition made Alex leap to the side as bullets came out of the darkness. He was an easy target now, and as he rolled he knew these men, whoever they were, would give him no quarter. These were assassins, and if it was death they sought, he'd give it to them. He saw Adira struggling on the ground with one of the officers. The other stood with legs spread in a marksman's stance, trying to track Alex with his weapon. One shaved second was all the man would need, but Alex was moving far too fast for him to get off an accurate shot. He was a blur as he rose up in front of the shooter and in a single motion brought his hand up into the man's neck. His thumb and fingers spread either side of his larynx. The blow crushed the man's throat flat, and he fell, making small barking coughs as he tried to pull in air. Alex turned quickly, but saw that Adira was kneeling beside the man she had fought with, drawing one of her lethal spikes out of his ear. The man's legs kicked in a final dance, and his eyes registered nothing but surprise. With all the men down, it was as if a switch had been thrown. His boiling anger began to subside. He crossed back to the officer with the scar on his chin and kneeled to check his status. He was dead. The crushing blow had driven his septum up into his brain. Alex spoke over his shoulder. Get their weapons, and I'll see what else they've got in their cars. And by the way, I didn't need your advice back there. He glared at her. Adira looked confused. Then she shrugged and moved to the man who was still gasping for breath on the ground. She picked up his gun and looked down at him, her face an unemotional mask. She aimed between his eyes. Wait, Alex said. She ignored him and pulled the trigger then smiled at him apologetically. I'm sorry, Alex, we're not taking hostages. He was as good as dead anyway. You made sure of that. 
Alex held her eyes a moment, then grunted and went over to the SUV. He watched her through the windscreen. She was examining the gun in her hand, turning it over. She ejected the magazine to look at the bullets, then frowned. Shista! She spun and moved quickly from body to body, rapidly turning out their pockets and patting down their torsos and limbs. Alex shook his head and went back to his search of the vehicle's interior. Adira was a strange woman. Sometimes he felt he knew her, even had strong feelings for her. But at other times she was a complete mystery. He'd thought it was her voice that had whispered to him, Kill them all. But now he wasn't sure. In the SUV's glove compartment, he found two hand grenades. Nice, he thought, and stuffed them into his pockets. As he worked, the scarred officer's phone vibrated. Adira rushed to snatch it before Alex. She jammed it to her ear and waited. Alex could hear the silence as someone else did the same on the other end of the line. After another moment, Adira threw the phone over the tree line, and they heard it splash into the river. Expecting someone, he said, not thinking she'd answer him. She stood there quietly, her face dark and unreadable. Come on, he said, nodding towards the bodies. It took them another ten minutes to fill the dead men's shirts and trousers with stones and drag them towards the river. The rushing water snatched the bodies away, and they quickly disappeared in the torrent. It would be weeks before they were found, and by then they would probably have washed down to Brownsville. Alex looked at Adira as he dusted off his hands. Welcome to America. Salomon pressed his foot down on the accelerator. From the response to his call, he knew the mission had suffered a serious setback. By the time he arrived at the interception point, there was little to see. A quick circling of the area showed blood underneath a shallow layer of sand beside the road. In the bushes nearby, he found a Sig Sauer with a human finger jammed in the trigger guard. Salomon growled deep in his chest as he remembered the general's words, The American will be a problem. He flipped open his phone, typed in a long string of numbers, then waited a second or two for the distant connection. I need more agents, he told Shavit. Adira sat in the passenger seat of the SUV they'd salvaged from the attack, while Alex took the first leg of the long drive to Asheville. She felt like she'd been punched in the stomach. The weapon she held on her lap had no part number, but that didn't matter. She'd recognized it instantly. A full-size Jericho 941 pistol, also called an Israeli Uzi Eagle, and weapon of choice of the Mossad Kidon. Now she knew exactly how her uncle had reacted to her running away with Alex. He had sent torpedoes after her. They were marked for termination. Or was it just Alex who was to be executed? She couldn't tell anymore. Nothing was staying together for her. There was no logical plan to follow. She felt anger burning inside. How had the agents found them so quickly? Her mind ran through their convoluted route, and every time she came back to the Egyptian incident, they must have picked up their trail there. Perhaps they'd been behind them all the way, or ahead of them. And now? She swore again. That phone call had been local. The walls were closing in. The rules had changed again. It was now kill or be killed. Hammerson swore at the empty room. The image from the satellite had been light-enhanced and showed what looked to be three local police officers surrounding Alex Hunter and Adira Sanesh. There was nothing the Hulk commander could do but watch and hope things didn't turn bad. What the fuck? Hammerson leaned forward, his face contorting into a frown as inexplicably the officer behind Alex lifted a gun to the back of his neck. No, no, no! 
Blurringly fast, Alex spun and ripped the gun out of the officer's hand. From there, things went as bad as they could get, real fast. Alex took down the first officer, then a second one. Hammerson was surprised by the amount of resistance they put up, more than he would have expected for local police. Adira lashed out at the third man, striking him in the ear. By the way he dropped and then convulsed on the ground, he guessed she had punctured his brain with one of her deadly spikes. Three dead cops and they've only been on American soil for an hour. Fucking hell. Hammerson watched Adira search the bodies while Alex went over to the vehicle parked nearby. She paused to examine something in her hand. Okay, what have you found? he said aloud and zoomed in to see the gun. He took a still of the weapon and of the bodies, then watched in silence as the pair dumped the corpses in the river before driving off in the SUV. He walked slowly to his computer, tapping his chin with one large blunt finger, and pulled up the recording loop, represented as a line on the screen. He tracked back to when the police had first intercepted Alex, then deleted the entire recording up until their departure. Hammerson blew out a breath through compressed lips and dropped back into his chair. He brought up the image of the gun Adira had been examining. He didn't recognize the make and was certain it hadn't come from any U.S. law enforcement armory he knew of. He lifted the phone and tapped a few numbers before saying softly, I need a cleanup crew ASAP. Several bodies in the Rio Grande, outside of Laredo. Find them, ID them, and then incinerate. He sat back and let his mind work, trying to piece together the strange events surrounding Alex's sudden reappearance and return to America. Why now, son? What's triggered this? He drummed his large, blunt fingers on the desk. Are you looking for something? He pulled up a map of Texas and printed it out, then drew a circle around it. Dropping the pen, he placed his fingers on his forehead and leaned in close, willing the map to tell him something. Nothing jumped out. He sighed and sat back for a few seconds, then picked up his pen again and wrote a list of names. Adira Sanesh, Jack Hammerson, Sam Reed, Amy Weir. He thought for a while, then added two more. Casey Franks, Kathleen Hunter. There were very few people Alex knew well or had remained in contact with from his past. His job as a hawk hadn't allowed it. He typed each name into the search engine. The usual scientific information about Amy Weir came up. She was going well in her career as a petrobiologist. As expected, he got nothing on Reed, Franks, or himself. But when he typed in Kathleen Hunter's name, his mouth dropped open. Oh, good Christ! It was a small piece in the Asheville Times. There'd been an attack on the Hunter property, and its owner, Kathleen Joy Hunter, was now a missing person. Asheville! Hammerson got to his feet so quickly his chair fell over behind him. He pressed a button on his intercom. Get Sam Reed in here. Chapter 21 Rattlesnake? Perfect, Matt said, feeling his stomach turn over. He was hardly in the mood for any kind of food, but especially not the exotic variety, which seemed to be all Spirit's Native American diner had on offer. The attractive, olive-skinned waitress smiled broadly and passed around menus and glasses of water, telling them she'd be back in a minute to see if they were ready to order. Nice place, Charles said, watching her go. And the food's good, too, Sarah added. My version of comfort food. She leaned across to Matt and gripped his forearm. 
Come on, cheer up. Matt shrugged. I'm okay. I just expected more support from Chief Logan. Means we're on our own for now. Charles waved a hand in the air. Don't worry about it. We've got everything we need. The cops would just get in the way. Matt gave him a half-smile. Charles would say that. Matt reckoned he wanted any discovery to be made by him first. His great-uncle's blood obviously still flowed strongly through his veins. He leaned back and looked around the wooden, ranch-style interior of the restaurant, stopping with a jolt at a nearby table. Hey, you're not going to believe this, he hissed, hunching forward. Eleven o'clock, check it out. Charles turned slowly and then snapped back. You are shitting me. That's the guy again. What is it? What guy? Sarah swiveled in her seat. Don't look, Matt said, hunching down further and lifting his menu to obscure his face. Sarah swung back. What, you mean old Thomas? The old man got to his feet and walked towards them. When he reached the table, he didn't say a word. He just stood there, looking down at Matt. Matt kept his eyes on the menu, frowning at it with the concentration of someone studying the Magna Carta in its original Latin. He kept it up for as long as he could, but eventually the force of the man's gaze dragged Matt's head up to meet a pair of eyes so intense they would have been more at home on a bald eagle. Matt swallowed audibly. Hi, Thomas. How are you doing today? Sarah said and smiled up at him. The old man nodded in acknowledgement. Miss Sarah, but kept his eyes on Matt. Hello there, sir. Matt knew his voice sounded feeble. Up close, the man looked even more antique than he had from a distance, with leathery skin that had been creased a thousand times by sun, sand, and dry winds. Sarah frowned at the strange interaction. Thomas, this is Matt Kearns and Charles Schroeder, friends of mine from the city. And this here is Mr. Thomas Red Cloud, closest thing we've got to a tribal elder in these parts. She continued frowning as she looked from Thomas to Matt. Uh, have you two met before? No one spoke. Thomas reached into his jeans pocket and pulled out a small crumpled piece of soft paper. He unfolded it and laid it on the table in front of Matt, then tapped it with one brown, liver-spotted finger. Chiatanka. Matt looked down. It was the napkin he had drawn on in the diner with Charles when his friend had first arrived. He nodded and met the old man's eyes. The Great Ones. The old man sat down next to Matt, pushing him along the bench seat, then tapped the napkin again. What do you know about them, Mr. Matt Kearns? What do I know? Matt shrugged. I can tell you what I think, that there's something big moving around on the Black Mountain, and we suspect it might be responsible for the recent disappearances. It's certainly coming closer to town. We also think a lot of people are in danger unless we can convince the authorities to take us, to take it, seriously. The old man sat like a stone for a few seconds, looking into Matt's eyes. Eventually he nodded and spoke slowly. Yes, it is true. I believe the Great Ones have returned. My people have been the guardians of their prison for an eternity, a duty that was passed to us by our ancestors, the first people. They enjoyed a land of abundance with animals of great size and number. But they were not alone. The Great Ones lived high in the mountains. At first, mankind and the giants shared the land, but as the First People's numbers grew, the Great Ones became angry. Without the people even knowing it, a war was declared. Warriors, women, and children started to disappear, and the people became angry and fearful. 
But when the chief's daughter was stolen, then the war was joined. Thomas lifted Matt's glass of water to his lips and drank half of it down before continuing with his story. The chief chose his greatest warrior, Tuantu, to gather a hundred strong war party. He also summoned his most powerful sorcerers to force the Great Ones back into the caves and then to seal them away from the light with a wall of stones, each carved with a sacred story and symbols to hold them forever. Many warriors were lost in the battle, and Tuantu himself never returned. It was a great cost to the tribe, but mankind was saved that day. He paused, shut his eyes briefly, then chuckled. It'd make a great comic book, huh? He finished Matt's water. Matt noticed Thomas wore a small leather bag tied around his neck. It looked soft and slightly oiled, as though it had been rubbed between finger and thumb a thousand times. Thomas became serious again. Whether the story is believed or not, every four generations the wall must be maintained. I am the last of those who know the symbols, but I was not able to repair the wall when I was supposed to, and the Great Ones broke free. And now... He trailed off. Matt leaned forward. I knew it. Something happened, didn't it? Something that broke down the wall. Have you seen this great one? I mean, do you know where it is? Thomas waved a hand at Matt, as though batting away his questions. The coyote and beaver told me. The eagle spirit screamed it down from heaven. The great-grandfather buzzard came to me in a dream. They said that the earth moved and the wall came down. Matt's mouth fell open. Wow! No way! Is that true? Thomas shook his head. Shit, no. I read about the earth tremor in the papers like everyone else. But, Mr. Kearns, despite the fact that I might not be a full believer in Native American lore, I have still been lighting sacred fires around the town lately. Anything's worth a try, right? He shrugged. Problem is, I don't really believe in what I'm doing. And perhaps that's why it's not working. Hell, I'm not even sure I'm doing it right. There's not a lot of people left for me to ask. He reached out and placed his hands over the top of Matt's. But I do believe in the Great Ones. At least, now I do. Matt nodded. I believe in them too, Thomas. Tell me more about the magic symbols and how we can help. Charles pulled a disbelieving face. Hang on, Matt. Spells? He doesn't even believe in them himself. We aren't going to convince Chief Logan of anything if we start down the mystical path. We need scientific proof now, not magic fires, symbols, and dreams. A freaking elephant gun would be of more use to us than all that. Thomas looked at Charles and shook his head slowly. You think you see, but you are blind. You think you know all, but you are like a child. Mr. Schroeder, how do you stop a force of nature? Can you trap the wind, stop the winter blizzard or the summer heat? You are nothing but dust before such things. He pinned Charles with his unblinking stare. I said that I had trouble believing, not that it was all make-believe. Sometimes it takes something from ancient times to restore our faith, and not always in a good way. Thomas turned to Matt. The answers are written on the Aoutsi stones. He looked back at Charles. That means prison stones, asshole. Charles stared at Thomas Redcloud, his eyes wide. Okay. He looked at Sarah and shrugged. Well, I'm more than satisfied. Matt reached across the table and grabbed his friend's wrist. 
Charles, just hang on a minute and listen. These guys managed to trap it once before, using little more than arrows, spears, and spells. I think we should at least hear how they did it. Come on, Matt. You said yourself that was probably over 10,000 years ago. Just give me a hundred milligrams of azaperone, or better yet, detomidine in a hypodermic dart, and I'll put the big guy to sleep for hours. Thomas grunted. Science does not have all the answers, Mr. Schroeder, and this is no game park rhino you seek. The legend tells us that the Great Ones were not merely beasts, they were smart. It would be best if we used our intelligence, too, and employed everything we have at our disposal. Charles groaned, held his head in both hands, and shook it slowly. Thomas looked back at Matt. The legend says that Tuantur's spirit watches over us still, and guards us from the Great Ones, and more importantly, that he will return if he is needed. We must be ready to help him if he comes once again to battle the Great One. He gripped Matt's hand harder. I need to get up there to the wall to see if I can still repair it. Sarah? Charles asked with a grimace. Matt knew he was hoping she'd come down on his side and stop Matt being sidetracked by the old Indian. Sarah tightened her lips and tilted her head slightly. It all fits. The stone barrier, the paleo-Indians sealing the creatures away, their reappearance after an earth tremor. Remember the results of the DNA analysis. The red hair, fair skin, near non-existent levels of eumelanin. They all indicate a creature that would be intolerant of sunlight. She knitted her brows, then pointed at Matt's chest. When did the attacks occur? What time of day? Matt thought hard for a moment. The Jordan woman's believed to have been attacked in the late afternoon on an overcast day. The Wilson girl disappeared at dusk. Kathleen Hunter was taken at night. That's it. It's a night hunter, which makes sense if its normal habitat is a cave or underground. Charles exhaled loudly, but this time he was nodding. You know, my great-uncle Charles disappeared while investigating deep limestone caves in southern China. I don't know. Maybe. Matt clicked his fingers. That's how it came to turn up all of a sudden. The stone wall must have been repaired and kept secure by Thomas's ancestors, stretching back to when the first humans came to this area in about 8,000 BCE. The recent earth tremor destroyed some of the wall, which opened up the cave and let the Gigantopithecus back into our environment, Matt said. This is astonishing. Thomas's face was a mask. I can show you where the cave opening is. We should leave first thing in the morning. Done, Matt said. Hey, wait a minute. Charles looked from Matt to Sarah clearly skeptical about the idea of inviting someone who looked to be at least a hundred years old on an arduous mountain trek. I vote we bring Thomas with us, Matt said. Anyone prepared to second me? Sarah raised her hand. I. Charles sat back, a look of resignation on his face. Okay, but on one condition. Matt raised his eyebrows. For scientific purposes, we don't immediately seal the cave opening until we have a significant sample that proves the creature's existence. You know very well, Matt, that this could be the most important scientific find of the century. Charles folded his arms in a this-is-not-negotiable gesture. Matt looked at Sarah, who nodded. He turned back to Thomas, whose face was unreadable. I'm afraid I agree with him, Thomas. We will help you, in return for you being our guide. But we must obtain proof of the creature's existence first. Deal? Thomas stared at Matt for nearly a minute, before his leathery face broke into a wide but humorless grin. 
showing teeth that were far too strong and white to be his own. I agree to allow you to come with me, and I'm sure you will all find what you seek there. I will be ready in the morning. He patted Matt's forearm, as though he were an elderly relative catching up with a favorite nephew. Matt cleared his throat. Uh, Thomas, one more thing. How will you know when the Tuante arrives, or if he arrives? Thomas, still holding Matt's arm, stared deep into his eyes. Can't you feel it, Mr. Kearns? He is already on his way. Chapter 22 Hammerson watched the SUV burn up Highway 20 towards Atlanta, doing 120 miles per hour. The screen faded to a snowy white as the satellite went over the horizon, and he sat back, running one hand across his cropped hair. So somehow he's heard about whatever's happened to Kathleen Hunter, Sam Reed said. Or perhaps he sensed it. Arcadian was able to do some pretty weird things. When he had his demons under control, Hammerson added. Sam nodded. He's heading for Asheville. He wheeled himself around the desk. Head, heart, and hands. I've still got them all, boss. Let me go. He'll trust me. I just need to get close to him. Hammerson shook his head. Sorry, Sam, not this time. I'm going to need you looking over my shoulder. He headed for the door, but Sam cut in front of him. Boss, I can do this. Jack Hammerson leaned forward to grip the armrests of Sam's chair and look into his broad and battle-scarred face. I know you can, soldier, but not this time. If things go bad for me, I've already recommended you take over the Hawk Command. Your field skills, strategic thinking, and Hawk experience are assets we need, and they're exactly what I'll need in my ear when I'm standing in front of the Arcadian trying to bring him in. Sam exhaled and started to look away, then quickly turned back to his colonel. What about Sinesh? If she sees you first, you'll end up in a shitstorm. Hammerson paused and thought for a second. He nodded. You're right. Get me Casey Franks. Tell her she's got thirty minutes to meet me on the chopper pad. Fight fire with fire, one badass woman against another. He smiled grimly as he went out the door. Who said this job can't be fun? On his way to the chopper pad, Hammerson took a call from the field. Only two bodies had been pulled from the Rio Grande, and there was a problem. They weren't Laredo PD. In fact, they showed no DNA, facial, dental, or fingerprint matches to anyone in North America. A sense of foreboding grew inside Hammerson as he listened. What else? he asked. Analysis of the corpses showed numerous old scars from gunshot and stabbing trauma. In addition, both guys were built like tanks. My bet? Special forces. Just not ours. Hammerson groaned. Global search? Yes, got something, but not a formal ID. A hit from a Tel Aviv dental laboratory for a crown in a second rear molar. Shit. Hammerson crushed the phone hard to his ear and thought through the implications. Tel Aviv could only mean one thing, Mossad. They wanted Alex or Sanesh back, and they were prepared to take control of them on U.S. soil. Or at least fucking try. No wonder they gave Arcadian some trouble, he thought. Hammerson ground his teeth. Anything else? Nothing else, sir. Orders? Burn them. He hung up and immediately called Sam. Lieutenant, we got a complication. Mossad are here and tracking Hunter and Sinesh. 
Monitor the Tel Aviv communications traffic and keep the bird watching for anyone following that SUV. On it. Good luck, boss. Wreck it all needed now, Hammerson thought as he signed off. The helicopter came in low and hovered over a clearing in the Pisgah National Forest, about five miles northeast of Asheville. The machine was small, painted in a black, non-reflective coating, and surprisingly silent, making more of a whooshing sound than the usual rotational whine. When it was within six feet of the ground, a door slid back, and two figures jumped lightly from its rear. They jogged away to allow it to lift off, and watched it disappear quietly over the treetops. Second Lieutenant Casey Franks jogged a few paces into the dense forest circling them, examined the ground for a moment, then removed a small shovel from her pack and started digging. After ten minutes, she had excavated a hole roughly three feet deep and the same wide. She and Hammerson dropped their packs and locator beacon into it, and then she covered it over. Once she'd scattered leaves, twigs, and other debris over the area, all signs of the surface disturbance had been erased. Dressed in lumber jackets, jeans, and boots, with hunting knives on their belts, she and Hammerson looked like any other weekend campers. The only light arms they allowed themselves were a single Heckler & Koch USP 45 CT pistol each, strapped in a holster at their back. Jack Hammerson was checking the tracker when Franks joined him, his face illuminated by its screen's soft glow. He motioned towards the west with one flat hand. Kathleen Hunter's place is a few miles out of town, at the foot of the mountains, but satellite surveillance confirms the Arcadian is still en route for the town center, so that's where we'll go to wait for him, them. And if Captain Sinesh interferes, what's the engagement level authorization? Hammerson slid the tracker back into his pocket. Authorization to make life fucking difficult for her. Only. Bottom line is, until we know more about the characteristics of her relationship with the Arcadian, we can't afford to do anything that may force him into taking sides especially as we're not certain yet which side he's going to take. Franks nodded slowly, but Hammerson knew she'd heard of Adira Sinesh and could tell she was excited about the prospect of going head-to-head -head with her. Franks was good, probably the best female operative they now had in the Hawks, but Hammerson knew that might not be enough against Israel's top Metsada operative. Unfortunately, Sanesh had also been trained in hawk attack and defensive techniques. He'd overseen the training himself. There was probably only one hawk Hammerson would have confidently bet against the Sanesh woman. And unfortunately, that hawk was now running with her. Double time, he ordered, and they began a jog towards the town center, five miles away. Hammerson wanted to be there and ready when the Arcadian arrived. Several hundred miles to the north, a dark, nondescript Infinity G-35 with slightly tinted windows sped down Highway 81 in Virginia. It had just entered the outskirts of Marion, but it wouldn't stop there, nor at Abingdon, Bristol, or even Johnston City. The driver could have been part of the machinery of the vehicle. Like his two passengers, he sat mute. All three wore their hats pulled down low and wraparound sunglasses of the kind favored by seniors, which covered most of the nose and forehead as well as the eyes. The lenses were almost as dark as welding goggles. The accessories weren't so much for concealment as for protection against direct sunlight. To Captain Graham's frustration, the subject's superheated metabolisms were weakened by UV radiation. Yet another puzzling flaw to be solved, and even more reason to find the original Arcadian. One of the men in the back seat lifted his hand to scratch a sore that had opened up on his cheek. 
The movement of his finger lifted more skin away from his face, but he ignored the fluid that ran down from the open wound. The men had one order, one objective, and they wouldn't stop, sleep, or eat until they reached Asheville, until they found the Arcadian. Hammerson slowed them to a trot as they reached the outskirts of Asheville, and they entered the town center at a brisk walk. It was late, cold, and a weeknight, so the streets were empty. They needed a quiet place to wait. Hammerson knew they stood out, even though they'd dressed like regular hikers or hunters. They were too big, too wide, and too battle-scarred to blend in with civilians. This'll do. Hammerson said, nodding towards the sign for Old Ron's Bar and Grill. They pushed the door open and Hammerson inhaled the atmosphere. Stale beer, body odor, old grease and bleach. The latter probably used to clean blood from the floor, given the look of some of the patrons lounging at the bar and playing pool further back in the gloom. A weary-looking woman behind the bar with a low-cut top that showed her pendulous breasts, raised her eyebrows at Hammerson. Two men who'd obviously been trying their luck with her turned to see what had caught her eye. Hammerson nodded to the woman, then headed to a booth, keeping his cap on to hide his iron-gray buzz cut. Frank slid in next to him. Hammerson waited a while, until the locals had tired of staring at the newcomers, then pulled the tracker from his pocket and used his finger to scroll down the screen to the information feed he wanted. He's about fifty miles out, still headed into town. Should be here within the hour. What do you think? Franks asked, leaning forward, her angular, powerful body made even more solid by the padded lumber jacket. Hammerson pushed the box back into his pocket. Hunter's got to be leading them here. Too much of a coincidence, this being his mother's hometown and her just disappearing. Or dead. But how would he know about it? He frowned, pulled the box from his pocket again, and searched for the Asheville coroner's report on Kathleen Hunter's disappearance. Nothing. He tapped the box on the tabletop for a second or two. Coroner's office hasn't released the information about his mother's death, which smells like an ongoing police investigation. He tapped some more. What if Kathleen Hunter was murdered? He stopped tapping. There'd be a shitload of retribution about to ride into town. Franks laughed softly. Escorted by a Mossad cleanup crew. Oh, yeah, this is getting real interesting. She slid out of the booth. Drink? Hammerson replied without looking at her. Coffee. Got it. Franks took off her heavy jacket, threw it on the seat, and headed to the bar. Two coffees and a bud, Franks told the woman behind the bar pulling off one of her gloves and sliding her sleeves up on her brawny forearms. She could feel the two men nearby staring at her white buzz cut, ice-blue eyes, and snub nose. In her teens, Casey Franks had been called attractive once or twice, but the compliment stopped after she got in a fight and picked up a deep facial wound that was never properly repaired. There was no spare cash in her Midwest family for cosmetic surgery. The cleft scar ran from just below her left eye down to her chin and pulled her left cheek up slightly, giving her a permanent sneer. She had multiple tattoos on her forearms, daggers, dragons, names of high-power motorbikes, and one solitary feminine adornment, a rose with the name Linda in delicate curling calligraphy underneath it. The man closest to her, wearing a greasy-looking cap, nudged his companion and motioned with his head at the rose tattoo. He leaned in close to Frank's. Hey, this ain't a gay bar, mister. He sniggered 
and his companion guffawed and leaned around him to have his own say. Maybe the young fellows had one of them sex change thingies. They both laughed again at their own wit. The weary barmaid set down the coffees and beer. Ignore them, sweetheart, they're drunk. They'll be shown the door soon enough if they don't start behaving. She scowled at them before walking away. Franks removed her other glove, exposing raised and calloused knuckles. She made no move to take the drinks, instead sending a quick glance to the booth to see if Hammerson was watching. He wasn't, so she smiled and leaned on the bar, turning slightly towards the men towering over her stocky form. You know what? Damn shame this ain't a gay bar, cause I was feeling a real attraction for both of you ladies. Greasy Cap snorted. Oh, we're men, all right, Butch, but you might not recognize us. Tell me, sweetheart, you ever been with a man before? I bet not as many times as you have. She thrust her chin out and looked him up and down. Hey, I reckon you're about six feet two. I'm impressed. I didn't know they could stack shit that high. She leaned around him to his friend. And you there. Where I come from, you need a license to be as dumb as you are. She leaned back, put both elbows on the bar, and waited. Greasy Cap had stopped smiling. You should run back to your grandpa now before you get hurt, you weird little fucker. He lifted his jacket front and pulled a twelve-inch bowie knife from a worn leather scabbard attached to his belt. He placed it on the bar, his hand close to it, then turned red, drunk, angry eyes on Frank's and leaned in close. Frank smiled and said calmly, That's it? That's all you got? You more used to picking fights down at the local senior citizen's home? She shook her head, still smiling. Listen up, asshole. If I turn around and that blade's still on the bar, I'm going to take it and castrate you, stick your balls down your boyfriend's throat, and make him swallow them. I'm not here to make friends tonight, fucker. The silence stretched for many seconds. Then Greasy Cap made a movement. Whether he was going for the knife or to retreat didn't matter. Franks turned, grabbed the knife, spun expertly, and buried the blade an inch into the wooden bar top between two of Greasy Cap's fingers. She leaned back on the bar again, still smiling. Now fuck off and play some pool or something. Greasy Cap pulled his hand away and looked at it. There was a small split in the skin between his fingers. The seconds stretched as the booze-oiled gears worked in his head. He shot his hand out, grabbed the knife, and wrenched it from the bar top. Dyke, he said, and walked off towards the pool table. His friend, following, looked back briefly to flip Franks the bird. Casey Franks picked up the beer and downed it in a long gulp, then carefully carried the two steaming coffees back to the booth. Hammerson still had his eyes on the tracker, but looked up briefly to scowl at her. Making friends there, Franks. Just making some space, boss. Hammerson grunted. We came in here to keep a low profile, not to wipe the floor with the locals. Got that, soldier? Got it, boss. She lifted her cup and sipped the dark brew, then turned briefly to see the barmaid smile and nod to her. She winked in return. He's reached the outskirts of Asheville. He's coming right to us, Hammerson said, glancing at her as he spoke. It was the first time in her life Franks had seen the hammer look uncertain. It didn't make her feel good.